Indeed, a special day for us. 17 years ago, on this Pesakhi day, our telemedicine center was formally started by the then Prime Minister of India in presence of the then Health Minister. The center had been running as a project since 1998. The center became a department in 2015 and was cleared by the governing body of the institute as National Institute of Telemedicine. Our department is a regional resource center since 2013 as a part of National Medical Colleges Network. We had tele-evidence and tele-psychiatry starting in the center over the last seven years. We made great strides during the COVID period and are currently acting as a hub for teleconsultations via eSanjeevni for various health and wellness centers uh, across the states. To commemorate the start of the center, we hold a Foundation Day oration every year. And this year, we are also organizing a CME, the theme of which is artificial intelligence in the digital health ecosystem. We have none other than Professor Yogesh Chavla, former director of PTI, Padma Shri recipient, and an internationally renowned hepatologist to inaugurate this CME today. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Amit Azarwal felicitate uh, Professor Chavla with a bouquet of flowers. Uh, I'll now request uh, Dr. Minakshi to introduce the chief guest for me. Good morning, everybody. It's my privilege to welcome Dr. Vaike Chavla, former director of our institute. He has contributed immensely in the field of medicine and is the re recipient of the very prestigious Padma Shri Award. He has also received the B.C. Roy um, uh, Medical Council of India Silver Jubilee Research Award and many other I awards from ICMR as well. He is on the editorial board of many reputed journals and is the member of many national and international societies. We are delighted to have you here today, sir, on the foundation, uh, foundation day of our department. And I request you to please introduce the first speaker of the morning session. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, getting involved with this uh... Uh, foundation day of uh, telemedicine and an excellent uh, theme on artificial intelligence machine learning in healthcare uh, the department of the department of telemedicine uh, has uh, been very uh, popular and has done very good work uh, not only during covid as has been mentioned by dr minu singh but being a hepatologist, we were also involved in the eco project of hepatitis C for the state of Punjab. And this is the place from where we used to give uh, recommendations on patients who had hepatitis C therapies, the difficulties being faced by the doctors in the periphery and with the result that we could manage about 60 to 70,000 patients of hepatitis C, one of the biggest achievements in the world. So all credit goes to the telemedicine department of PGI. Uh, as, as we know that artificial intelligence is uh, coming up now in a big way, and it's very important for all the doctors, residents to understand what artificial intelligence is. It's been well known in the field of business and finance for a long time, but as far as medicine is concerned, it is still very new and uh, one should not be illiterate as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. Over the last few years, it has made significant strides in uh, especially radiology where it can pick up very early lesions and not that is it's a replacement for doctors, but it certainly helps because it uh, identifies the subtle changes that happen in the different parts of the body and so that early cancerous lesions can be picked up. Moreover, therapeutic results, the genetic uh, makeup of lesions, everything can be very helpful with artificial intelligence, especially 
uh, in the field of precision medicine or personalized medicine so that the treatment uh, becomes more targeted and the response is much better in these patients. So today, uh, it's, it's an excellent team that has been chosen by the uh, team in PGI. And to start the ball rolling with an oration, we have Major General Rashmi Datta, a Vishish Seva Medal retired. She's, been, she's the professor and head of the department of emergency medicine at the Hamdard Medical Institute in Delhi. Just a brief background about her. her. She's uh, done her MD anesthesiology and is also a DNB in general medicine and aviation medicine. This is a rare combination. If one goes into MD anesthesiology or any of these, then uh, he, the person branches into the fields of anesthesia. But it's excellent that she's also done general medicine and aviation medicine so that she understands uh, uh, the management of patients in a better way. Uh, area of interest has been critical care, pain management and obstetrics. She's been the recipient of a lot of awards and the significant one being Vishish Seva Medal, which she got in 2016. She's been the chief of army staff commendation in 2002 and 2012 and uh, in 2011 and uh, uh, GOCNC Western Command commendation. She's been the president of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists Appreciation Award. She's received twice in 2019 and 2021. She's contributed to the framing of national guidelines on organ donor management under the Director General of Health Services, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. This is something which is absolutely essential. The country lacks the organ donation, especially in the North and in the East. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to uh, see, her, uh, see her contribute to the national guidelines on organ donor management. She's the Managing Council of the Indian Resuscitation Council affiliated with the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation that has formulated Indian guidelines on CPR and is on the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists Advisory Committee. She's authored two books, several chapters, published more than 50 papers in various national and international journals of repute in the field of anesthesiology and critical care. And she's a dedicated teacher and examiner for several universities and postgraduate medical institutions in India. So it's an honor for all of us to listen to her, to give the oration for this uh, Foundation Day program. Uh, welcome, ma'am, to the uh, Foundation Day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, I have already sent my... Uh... Uh, PowerPoint presentation. Will that be presented or should I share? You can share if you want, uh, but we have your presentation. If you're more comfortable with that way, we can. Share. can uh, uh, it would be better. I think live would be better. Please share your presentation and then see. I just. Uh, Uh, I think you logged in with two devices, so there is an echo, so you could uh, put off one of them. Either put off or just make the volume very, very, uh, you just mute that device. There seems to be some uh, delay in opening. Uh, Doesn't system. matter, it's okay.
presentation is open. I think you can start with the recorded one. It will be okay. taking okay. too long. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. Oh, video started. Can you just speak uh, live? Okay, I'll uh, speak uh, speak live then. We, if you can start okay. from uh, the beginning, then I'll just uh, let's start from the beginning, from the first slide. Yeah, please, I'll be grateful. Up slides, you should open up. Okay, I'll start from first. Yeah. Okay. Okay, they shared. Sure. Sure. I think you've shared the presentation now. Okay. Yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah. You have to click on your PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm just doing that. If she can meet from one device. You have to leave from one device. Uh, I've, I've... Yeah, this... I'll just, uh, just re re rejoin, rejoin the items and do that. Yeah, okay.
Dr. Rashmi, are you able to join? giving these. I'll be talking about machine learning in and conventional statistics in healthcare. I'll be discussing the topic in these three different headings that is healthcare and statistics, machine learning and artificial intelligence and health learning in uh, machine learning in healthcare. Now healthcare is an industry. It provides goods and services in various domains 
And the key factors or the key sectors of the healthcare industry are not only the healthcare services and facilities, but also things like medical devices, hospital supplies, their manufacturers, the medical insurance, uh, pharmaceuticals and related segments. Uh, like every industry, the healthcare industry has its own peculiarities. There is heterogeneity, gross heterogeneity in the form of size. It ranges from small town private practices to busy in inner city hospitals. The healthcare staff, the patients may be seen by a single physician or they may have rounds with the entire team which range right from the physiotherapist up to the uh, super specialist. A wide range of diseases are there. There are multiple organs uh, involvement of the same disease and each disease may have varying type of involvement in the, say, uh, in the different patients. Also, this healthcare industry is result oriented and very time dependent. The components which we talk about are therefore high reliability, safety, reproducibility. There is also analysis and innovations which carry on with the uh, for the for the healthcare uh, qualities to be uh, uh, to improve. I'll be talking basically of these evidence-based practices, the competence, and the person-centered care. Now, evidence-based practices. Algorithm is a word which we are very uh, familiar with, but apart from algorithms, they are three other words. One is protocols, guidelines, and checklists. Now, protocols are very precise, detailed plans for not only the medical disease management in total, but also the regime of therapy. Guidelines are statement of, uh, you know, uh, of policy rules, but definite plan for making a choice do not exist in the guidelines. And checklists are list of things which have to be accomplished, accomplished or checked in a particular point of time. Now, this is the classical pyramid for the evidence-based medicine. And as you can see, it starts from the background information, ideas, editorials, expert opinion, and comes up right up to systemic reviews and meta-analysis. These, right from RCT upwards, are known as filtered information and rest below of them are known as non-filtered or unfiltered information. So when protocols are formed, they are normally based on the filtered information and these are broad guidelines which are given international guidelines for specific disease conditions. Now clinical expertise is required to decide with which evidence, which particular thing will apply to the individual patient. Logical modifications of the protocols have to be there to cater to the patient and if applied, how will we integrate it into the clinical decision making process. The difficulties in implementation of protocols are many. Healthcare is a complex adaptive system where the results are non-predictable and non-linear. We have no idea which patient will respond how. The team-based care, like which I mentioned before, where the direct involvement of professionals at all levels is there, is definitely more efficient, more costly, less complex, but is not available to all. Also, there is a very high dependency on technology in healthcare systems. It is therefore, it is impossible to monitor const, con, continuously every patient. And the advanced medical equipment, when and if they are attached to a patient, they only record a discrete part of the vital parameters. And they do not capture or analyze the data rich streams which are recorded by the monitors. And analysis of the available data by humans is cumbersome, next to impossible. Also, we don't have to uh, forget this particular part, uh, point that there is a risk of bias in the formation of protocols from the dominating role of industry in clinical research. There is also the protocol studies which are done. There is gold standard is uh, these are not there. This time is definitely usually it is insufficient. The optimal outcome in healthcare is not completely agreed upon. So usually people take variation in mortality of a 28 day mortality or uh, you know three months mortality figures are usually taken as primary and points which may not be very adequate all the time. Also, there is a heterogeneous and inadequate population sizes. 
randomization into the control and the intervention group is usually not very adequate because there may be a mixture of good and poor responders in both the groups and the confounding comorbidities may not be the same in the, all the participants. Then the collection of data coding and analysis may be incomplete or uh, uh, incorrect. There is a tendency to use surrogate markers at times which do not correlate well with the outcome of interest and this leads to incorrect conclusions and interpretations. The treatment, the intervention groups usually have some type of treatment and this treatment may interact uh, different types of treatments may interact. There is mitigation of the average therapeutic response and this may also cause missing of the direct measurements of endpoints. The statistical tools which are used also do not provide the range of plausible values for the uh, confounding difference between groups to call it statistically significant difference. Things like uh, MCIDs, uh, OGDs, the confidence intervals are usually not used in all the studies which are used to find out your meta-analysis. Comparisons therefore become difficult because of the level of evidence and the treatment effects. So in general, if I would like to just tell, the raw data has to be collected. It has to be simultaneously and rapid, rapidly processed any complex interrelationships between the various type of data and the comorbidities have to be assessed, they have to be analyzed and prediction of the outcome of interest has to uh, be there. This prediction, this outcome of interest is then subjected to quality control uh, 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 points such as root cause analysis, Six Sigma, lean management, all these. And then we'll be able to, once that is done, we will be able to individualize the health intervention for the patient, which is our ultimate goal. Now, to do this, you require artificial intelligence. Now, what is artificial intelligence? Vladimir Putin uh, in 2017 said that whoever becomes a leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. And uh, Elon Musk in his own style, agreed to that and said that competition for AI superiority will be the most likely cause of World War III. McCarthy, who is the father of the word uh, artificial intelligence, said that the moment it is used and it starts working, nobody will call it artificial anymore. So what exactly is artificial intelligence? When we do rules of thought, we have an idea we reason it out, we acquire information, we apply all the known factors to it and we present a protocol. It is designed from top down. If there is simulation of human intelligence by the computer systems, there is acquisition of data, learning is done, the data is analyzed, self-correction is there and then an idea is generated which is designed therefore from a bottom up manner. This is the basic difference between humans and in, uh, machines. Now, artificial intelligence is built on machine learning and one of the components of machine learning is something called deep learning. <clears throat> it was in 1943 that it was discovered that the binary neurons are the ones which form the complete network and the whole entire human emotions cognition works through this network. It took almost 30 years later for an imitation of the human brain to be developed in the form of silicon and wires uh, and the printed circuit board, the PCBs came into existence. This has got two components. You have electronic component in designated areas, which are these uh, round uh, areas and the electrical connections between them. This from single layer became multi-layered and they had wires in between that is the interactions between the layers either through holes uh, which are plated, not plated, they are blind uh, which do not reach the other end, they are buried which are only inside, they are tented, capped, they are plugged and so on and so forth. 
This is in the hardware. Now the same thing, if this type of PCB is made in a software, that is known as dimension lifting or floats or what is the technical term is known as tensors. The origin of tensors came from vector computing. That is one vector was computed uh, just one vector was computed. Then there was matrix computing when multiple factors were uh, vectors were computed, and now we have these tensors where many factors in a 3D process can be computed. Now these networks are composed of multiple nodes like the PCB. They are connected by links again like the PCB, which interact with each other. Simple operations are performed on the input data of the nodes, and then. Uh, from here, they are given inside these nodes to the hidden layers where each hidden layer has got a output and they are all collated into the output which forms finally in the end. How do they work actually? Just giving you an example, you want like movies and you want to go to the movie. So what are the chances that you'll go there today? So what is the input? Is the weather good? Does your spouse want to accompany you? The hidden layers say have yes and no, good weather again, one and two, one and zero. Is the theater near the metro because you don't own a car? Again, yes and no. Now, as per this calculation, the output will be you will go if it is three, you may go if it is one to two, and you will definitely not go if it is zero. However, this particular aspect, just taking one aspect, but the other two really cannot uh, change much. Uh, so, good weather, bad weather, suppose instead of 1 to 2, we give it 0 to 6, uh, multiple uh, numbers to this. Then this factor will change, you will go from 2 to 6, you will go 1 and you will not go definitely to 0. So, depending on this, whether they are single or multiple hidden layers. There are also two types over there, like feed forward and feed back. Now, feed forward are just again a diagrammatic uh, sketch of this. From the input layer, it goes to the hidden layers, maybe one or maybe many, and they go to the output layer, but there are no feedback loops. The information flows only in one direction. Now, feed backward uh, artificial neural networks have got either a single layer with receptors, and if there are multiple hidden layers, it is known as deep learning neuronal network. So this is an example of that. Perceptrons with one single layer and multiple layers, that is the deep learning neuronal network. And multiple back propagation, mainly of errors. This allows the, uh, the uh, neurons, the network, to um, uh, adjust their hidden layers when the outcome does not match what the creator is hoping for. Like uh, let's say for an example a network designed to recognize dogs but sees a four-legged animal and misidentifies a cat so this will allow it to back propagate and recognize its errors so each step each um, uh, layer will recognitions and they are retractions over time this tensors grow to recognize more features therefore becoming more accurate in their uh, understanding of the situation they also shrink to remain tractable so generally just uh, again briefly just mentioning it you have acquisition of information how do you require it you do it by rules which are used for using the information Give to the neuron work where conclusions are drawn. From there, there is problem solving, some self correction, and sound reasoning, both inductive and deductive, is applied to it. This is the part which is the machine learning. Now, this type of algorithm helps me two types either they're supervised or they're unsupervised. Supervisors by a data analyst. Now, therefore, this person has to spell out inputs. Which variables have to be analyzed? You can't have all of them. So he will tell this is the variable which has to be analyzed to predict, uh, to define your pred uh, predictions. This is the output which is desired. And then the feedbacks are worked out. Then is the unsupervised, which is an iterative based algorithms, which who do not require any human intervention. They require massive amount of training data. And then the data bank is used to interpret new data 
and to identify any subtle changes which are there. So discovery, creation, tracking, everything is made by the machine or the networks themselves. So types of AIs, there are five types. One and two are known as weak or narrow AI, but narrow substance can accomplish their tasks well within the domain. Three, four, and maybe the fifth one is the stronger, strong AI or the general AI. They find a solution without human intervention. Now, first one, the reactive machines. They're designed for a very narrow purpose. They have no memory. They One in 1997, which was, uh, I still remember that quite a shock that a computer bet uh, Gary uh, uh, Kasparov, and, but it was structured data. Then came uh, Deep Blue, which was used in a program uh, uh, and uh, in a, uh, the two reigning champions. This is an unsolved data which was used. Another very interesting was AlphaGo. Now, this was written by Google Brain almost about seven years ago. The software behind this is the machine learning program, which plays the Chinese game called Go. Now, in this Go, there are 270 Go, uh, Go board positions. Now, just in comparison, there are about 10 raised to 82 atoms in the observable universe. So, just see the comparison which is there. After a few months of being, AlphaGo defeated the human Go champions who were trained for a lifetime. They were able to do that. Then the second one is limited memory. These are pre-programmed and uh, things are already put into it, like lane markings, traffic lights, whatever it be. They use the past experience to form future decisions. If the car lets I switch line to avoid uh, being hit by a nearby car, whatever it is. But these observations story <clears throat> among these self-driven cars chat box uh, chatbots deep face is there that is the uh, uh, ml uh, technology for identifying faces it has got a very pretty good accuracy and the google's multi
Now, one very important thing we know about drugs, we know a lot. Doubling the dose, double the concentration. The concentration after the second dose is a sum of the contributions of each. intervention. Now, first one, the reactive machines, they're designed for a very narrow purpose. They have no memory, therefore they cannot use the past experience to form future ones. Example is Deep Blue and Watson, they were two computer-based um, uh, chess programs. One in 1997, which was, uh, I still remember that quite a shock that a computer bet uh, Gary uh, uh, Kasparov, and, but it was structured data. Then came uh, Deep Blue, which was used in a program uh, uh, and uh, uh, in a uh, uh, show, talk sh uh, uh, program, TV program, and bet the two reigning champions. This is an unstructured data which was used. Another very interesting was Alpha Google. Now, this was written by Google Brain almost about seven years ago. The software behind this is the machine learning program, which plays the ancient Chinese board game called Go. Now in this Go, there are 10 raised to 170 Go, uh, Go board positions. Now, just in comparison, there are about 10 raised to 82 atoms in the observable universe. So just see the comparison which is there. After a few months of training, AlphaGo defeated the human Go champions who had trained for a lifetime. They were able to do that. Then the second one is limited memory. These are pre-programmed and uh, things are already put into it, like lane markings, traffic lights, whatever it be. They use the past experience to form future decisions. If the a car like decides to change lines to avoid uh, being hit by a nearby car, whatever it is. But these observations have a limited period of storage. <clears throat> Among these self-driven cars, chat box, uh, chatbots, DeepFace is there, that is the uh, uh, ML technology for identifying faces. It has got a very, pretty good accuracy and the Google's multilingual neuronal machine translation system. <coughs> then comes theories, theory of mind, that is type 3. This has got thoughts, emotions, and motives that affect their own. The first time which was there was uh, in Star Wars, which they uh, uh, bought it out. They this, These machines have an understanding that their own beliefs, their desires and int intentions, which will impact the de decisions that they'll make. There was Sophie, uh, the robot which just laughs, smiles, and frowns like us. Then there is self-aware. Machines with self-awareness can use the information to infer what others are feeling and have cautiousness. Two serials, movies and serials were there. And I would like you to meet Komis, which was, uh, who has recently been uh, uh, in Japan. It has been uh, uh, just shown in the, uh, you know, the uh, tech, uh, so here now then the type 5 when we talk about what we have seen in Iron Man 1, 2 and 3, Tony Stark, he has got a very um, a good machine there, a computer uh, the thing who automates his Malibu estate. He's a good information source, a diagnostic consultant and is uh, Now coming on to machine learning in uh, conventional um, and conventional statistics in healthcare. Now we already have available uh, machine learning tools. One of them is he they are helping for decision support system. They are robots which are there. Now coming to each of these clinical decision support systems, they assimilate uh, assimilate 
multiple patient data to generate case specific advice on a human intervention for a human in intervention they are knowledge based and non knowledge based knowledge based is they use clinical knowledge as conditional logic to infer for the clinical events and non knowledge are the ones which use machine learning to derive patterns from a clinical data set already given now this is in comparison to the closed loop systems where no human intervention is there like in artificial pancreas they see the uh, sugars and they release the insulin so these clinical support systems are either passive or active active can be non real time or ad hoc post hoc and uh, real life time when the procedure is going on passive uh, decisions are triggered only when the provider initiates a predefined action and it is useful where these do not uh, have there, there is no life threatening situation where an immediate action is required if the failure uh, user fails to launch this the user may be unaware of the event also that has taken place and missed opportunities are there to act in real time to correct but they are not life threatening the hot stop feature in most of these autonomic uh, automatic um, uh, uh, management systems which flag incomplete data that we have not entered this please uh, enter this particular data or these are not uh, are still missing classical example is the anesthesia treatment medication chart in which rapid medication especially your narcotic uh, drugs are taken from the virtual pocket which is displayed on scene it provides quick um and easy access the customer uh, customizable chart configurations are there and the color printout is there uh, automatically which comes along with the regulatory compliance for patient safety then non real time is post hoc no uh, notification is ge generated after the event is over one can just sit over there and analyze what has gone this helps to correct the policies to reduce say patient uh, uh, problems and improve the patient uh, safety these are aimed for those active ones are when a procedure is going on real time remedial actions are taken they address patient safety and quality of care needs they have got alarms and but it requires considerable technical skills and investment in securing the real time data and in processing that too there is also the danger of transmission classical example is the touch iq which has been add on module to the anesthesia touch it is an automated medical record system right from pre op to the post op evaluation with an administrative web interface so that you know exactly what the uh, how much is the medicines you have asked for uh, giving uh, say uh, tramadol and how much of the tramadol is available in the pharmacy even that administrative web interface and this tramadol if given to the patient it has to be billed to the patient that also goes in so the whole complete system is over there touch iq when you adding to anesthesia touch enables better patient outcome and reduce cost by replacing the paper based pre op assessment uh, triaging patients faster helps in decision support provides a tool for workshop uh, for uh, uh, and the workflow for assessing all patients and it is generally helps to improve the safety of the patient there are various um, uh, companies which are going on which are developing softwares to help in supporting the electronic uh, medical record system um, there are various companies which are uh, in the market now which have come in for that similarly for medical uh, imaging and diagnostics there are various companies which are helping to uh, give better diagnosis for uh, tumors for um, uh, pathology testing and for say breast cancer in the mri microprocessor closed loop systems one very important thing we know about drugs we know a lot doubling the dose double the concentration the concentration after the second dose is a sum of the contributions of each dose which is given they dr the drug concentration peaks after a drug is uh, given and gradually decreases because there are various compartments in the body drug effects increase with increasing amount of drugs 
they are synergy with the uh, between the drugs and clearance ultimately is the one which permanently emulates uh, eliminates the drug from the body target controlled infusions tcis this term was uh, coined in uh, 1997 it incorporates tissue drug concentration into the calculation of the infusion rate and because the tissue drug concentration cannot be measured in real time it uses a, a pharmacodynamic and kinetic model to establish or estimate the concentration the response models are already there for uh, propofol and remifentanil this is sin uh, sidasin uh, it is a pharmacological uh, robot by jnj it was designed for non ot sedation especially propofol later on added to remifentanil the control of hypnosis was by, with various feedback uh, loops it was fda approved and used the lee model of the of uh, target controlled infusion it used a top down approach calculated the amount of in this case propofol which was needed and depending upon the PK model and the PD model with the various covariate, covariates, it used the central volume of uh, uh, distribution and the elimination to see the effect. This model, however, did not take into consideration, need not, could, did not need to take into consideration clearance, the volume of distribution and the drug potency. But there was a discrepancy between the uh, excretion and the BIS value, BIS was, which was taken at the end point in this. And they found that the three compartment model, which is generally used rapid, uh, the periphery is di divided, compartment is divided into rapid and slow, and the central compartment. This three compartment model was insufficient to account for the drug effect. And the synergistic effect of remifentanil on hypnosis was not considered, especially when the end point was BIS. And the traditional built, uh, the models which were built, the PKPD model which was built using a small number of studies. The initial point which I said about our studies, the fallacies in our studies from on which protocols are based had a very limited experimental setting. It could not differentiate or predict any parameter that if the ratio of propofol and remifentanil were changed it could not apply that and if extra boluses of propofol were given when the patient moves during surgery they also could not take that into account it was how it was therefore for these reasons pulled out uh, of the market in 2016 in spite of fda approval because it was unable to adjust the level of sedation and if the patient gets over sedated it was, it required a human hand there and there was no reversal agent for uh, propofol. So this was the problem with this and it was taken out of the market. ANN. Now they have started continuous learning with this and a deep understanding was taken, deeper understanding was taken with your deep learning uh, uh, artificial neurons between propofol, remifentanil and BIS as was done in this model but it went a step forward. It used something called the long short term memory and the feed forward neuronal network with the covariates which were only over there, it was not over here and then the effect was seen. In 2018 an article was published in which these two were used to simulate the uh, pharmacokinetic and dynamic parts of an empirical model and the final output was this and this was what they used, 180 outputs, inputs eight memory cells in the in the short uh, uh, long short term memory and the feedback uh, feed forward uh, neuronal network had 16 nodes and the various covariates which are added here and this gave it to the one output that was the bispectral index they found this was the output of long uh, short term memory and tci used to pump for uh, 1800 uh, seconds at 10 seconds interval they found that the performance of BIS prediction was better and uh, it appeared promising. So coming on to also the drug development, Watson AI is still being used not for only chess but is also being used for immuno-oncology uh, uh, research. It is also being used by in situ for various uh, for drug delivery and others. Then coming on to dexterity robots 
the Kepler incubation system is a video laryngoscope using a joystick from a remote uh, area and it, they have found that it does use less force, high precision and safety is there. And it has got various, it has been validated. Then there is one first robotic ultrasound guided nerve block using the Magellan system. Now this again is using the robotic arm with the safety input, the client and the server system. And again, it has been found to be quite good, uh, more safer as compared to uh, the others, a uh, human intervention. Now coming on to artificial intelligence in healthcare. We all know that repetitive tasks quickly lead to boredom, fatigue, there's a drop in vigilance and because of, um, uh, you know, constantly just sitting down there, there is low morale. What we were told in anesthesiology was that it is about 99% sheer boredom and 1% sheer terror. That is how anesthesia is. And um, uh, other uh, health uh, care subjects, domains are equally, they have a similar type of ratio. Now, healthcare, if it starts using artificial intelligence, it will be significantly safer and there will be improved care. By not only increasing the precision and the reliability and the vigilance, it will help us to focus on the higher level tasks and procedures. It will allow the healthcare worker to focus on the patient rather than seeing the uh, inputs which are coming in and or the paperwork. Which is there. What we require, we require in healthcare to predict the health risks, treatment, illnesses of the various population of patients so that we can educate them on the various treatments available. We need artificial intelligence for assisting in healthcare records and workflow. We need to identify opportunity. Healthcare. We need to aid in drug development and lowering of the cost of drugs. And uh, during telemedicines, which, which uh, telemedicine sessions, which is now here to stay, we need to organize and provide doctors with the patient information, which should be available to the patient when the uh, to the doctor when the patient comes, and also to capture any information during the virtual visit, which can help the doctor assist the doctor to have a better efficiency and workflow later on. However. There is a flip side to the whole thing. There may be loss of clinical skills among the younger practitioners who will, who have already, we have seen it now, started relying more on tests and monitors rather than, rather than examining the patient. And if there is over-reliance on the technology, there may be a paradoxical drop in the vigilance. But if we know the problems which can come to it, with it, we can address this. In the future, what we require uh, artificial intelligence so that it can be incorporated into our healthcare system is it should be approved by regulators. We have various technical regulators all over, FD, um, uh, uh, FDA and others. It should be integrated into the electronic health record system. It should be standardized to a sufficient degree so that similar products work in a similar fashion. We cannot have each company coming up with its own uh, uh, prototype. It has to be taught to clinicians and we have to teach them. It has to be paid for by public and by hospital or healthcare systems to pay for it may not really help it to continue. And this needs to be updated over time in the field. Yes, there are certain legal issues also. These algorithms are virtually impossible to interpret or explain. So how do we explain to the patient that a machine has said that you have got cancer? It is difficult to establish accountability for mistakes. Is this a mistake? Because it, this is based on the... Uh, information which has been fed into the machine, it will be difficult to account for that. Uh, the reporting is going to be non-empathic, which many patients do uh, resent even now, so that the doctor did not speak to them or did not break the news properly. And if there is algorithmic bias, it will be very prominent with machine learning because things like it may 
uh, predict there is a likelihood, uh, you know, uh, greater likelihood of disease on the basis of a particular gender or a race. These type of things may come out. Then we require transparency. Permission has to be taken that this is the your information which will be shared in a back propagation type of manner so that we can improve the system. Not many patients would like to do that. And privacy. This is the ultimate as far as surgery is concerned. All robotic prostatectomy under artificial intelligence, Da Vinci and Max Sleepy, which is the anesthesia machine, which is completely uh, driven by machine learning. From, 19, uh, from 1760 to approximately 1840, there was the Industrial Revolution, which brought us from here. Uh, uh, the iron production was there. There was increase in steam power. There was water power, machine tools, and the rise of the mechanized factory system. However, even at that time, there were few lutelites who went over there. This was a secret oath-based organization who went over there to destroy the factories as a form of protest. We don't need to become lutelites because we are not going to go out of jobs. Healthcare requires a good mixture of cognitive labor, dexterity-based labor, and human skills which are unique, like empathy, persuasion, and big picture integration. That is still not available in, the, uh, in artificial intelligence. The robotic devices which are currently there still do not have the dexterity required for all the tasks. And these algorithms require labeled data, that is millions and millions of images from patients who have either received, say, a definitive diagnosis of cancer, broken bones, some pathology, some radiology, and no such aggregated repository exists at present. So, but in spite of all this, perhaps the only ones who will be out of a job, the ones who refuse to work along with artificial intelligence. At present, I feel that it may be our hands which prevent the full automation of our speciality. Incidentally, uh, coming back to Jarvis, Jarvis is real. It is no longer in the realms of imagination. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, has spent in uh, the entire 2016, building an Iron Man style artificial intelligence that controls his life. And this incidentally was made by, designed by two uh, Indian uh, people, Bandi and Jaipur Himashu Vaishnav. Now, this Jarvis, which is present in uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's house, not only has the Messenger bot and iOS voice application, it switches on right from the toaster, the T-shirt cannon, Sonos, doors, thermostats, language processing, speech recognition, face recognition. Everything is possible in his house based on Jarvis. So maybe this will come soon, this time is kind of it. I thank you all for a patient listening. Jahid. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashmi, for such a brilliant talk. Uh, we were just discussing how come you have, you know, delved into all this engineering stuff, which uh, is almost great to us. And uh, it really motivates us to learn more about artificial intelligence. And as you said, it would be no more artificial once it becomes real. I would now uh, request Dr. Chabla to give his concluding remarks. And traditionally, there are no questions in orations. So, but we would just uh, request you subsequently to no, make any, a uh, any questions. I'll be uh, happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rashmi, uh, for a wonderful talk, making us understand a little bit about artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, it's, it's been a great overview for all of us. Uh, it's a learning exercise. And I feel that uh, artificial intelligence should come up in the undergraduate courses. They should be made to understand what it is. And uh, every institute should try to have some orientation courses or certificate courses on, tele on um, artificial intelligence to make us more updated uh, as to what is happening in the world. 
So, extremely grateful to you for uh, the talk. It's been a learning exercise for me. I'm sure it must be for a lot of others. And thank you very much. Uh, maybe you, we could have a few yeah. questions or comments. Dr. Rashmi, would yeah. you like to say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. You asked me how I went into it. Uh, it was one step uh, ahead from uh, 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 the simulation uh, because simulation is here to stay. It is the need of the hour. And one step ahead of that was artificial intelligence. And yes, very rightly so. I think our undergrads should be taught this. They should have an orientation towards this as well as telemedicine. Both of them are here to stay. Any questions, if there is, I'm uh, willing to answer. Any doubts, anything? No, there don't seem to be any questions. We'd like to thank okay. you. Thank you so much thank for you being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you sharing your presentation and your brilliant talk with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Nusrat Shafi to uh, give our vote of thanks. Dr. Nusrat is a, a professor of clinical pharmacology, and I think some of the stuff which you were talking about would be very, very interesting to her. Dr. Nusrat, please. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I, before I start my formal vote of thanks, I would like to uh, just make a small comment uh, about such a brilliant talk, ma'am, uh, that you, you in fact, it was such an eye opener. And I realized that. Uh, artificial intelligence is so, so important for clinical pharmacology and we, I'm going to get in touch with you to see guidance for several things. Thank you. Anytime, sir. anytime. Thank you. Having said that, I would uh, uh, like to start my vote of thanks. Uh, um, uh, foremost, I would like to thank all the visionaries, both inside and outside the Institute, who at different levels have strived hard for generations and generations to bring us to an ecosystem which enables us to think about such novel ideas and not only think about such ideas, but also enables us to pursue such ideas. Um, I'd like to borrow from an article which was published by one of our ex-directors in today's Tribune, wherein he mentioned he borrows from, uh, he quotes uh, William Osler into saying that uh, Medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probabilities. And this was the idea, I think, which Dr. Rashmi also espoused when she mentioned adaptive complex systems. Uh, uh, so having said that, I would like to say that uh, uh, Dr. Rashmi has already set the tone for the quality of the workshop. Uh, and uh, um, we have a, a team of uh, faculty members who will enlighten us with their uh, thoughts on artificial intelligence and their experience with the same. And I would like to thank all of them because it is the time that they have taken to make presentations, be here with us for carrying out different discussion sessions. This It means a lot to us. Um, uh, the work, the telemedicine team uh, here would deserve my uh, heartfelt gratitude and all this would have not been possible had uh, our leadership not been so dynamic. Uh, Dr. Meenu Singh has been guiding us through and through. I've seen her guiding us through decades, coming up with new ideas and bringing it to not just this institute, but using telemedicine as a very important tool for disseminating all the learnings to different regions of the country and even the neighboring countries. Um, so, um, and uh, I would like to now end up my vote of thanks by thanking all the participants for showing an interest in this workshop because it is the feedback and interaction and your interest which drives us to go ahead. Having said that, thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question in the chat box. Uh, we just uh, missed it. I think Dr. Pushkar Khed has asked whether there's any role for virtual reality in simulation. 
Uh, yes, uh, very true. There is a, a big role, uh, especially when you've got to teach complex anatomy. One thing which I know is about the various recesses of the abdomen, uh, the, the lesser sac, the greater sac, or, and all that. If suppose I had seen that with the virtual reality, I think all my problems would have been sorted out. Uh, definitely, there is a role. Simulation is a very big uh, uh, thing which is coming up for teaching purposes because we cannot afford to take uh, chances and make errors in our uh, healthcare industry. So, simulation and VR is very important. Yes. No more questions? No. So, there are no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. Thank you very Thank much you. for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay. So we'll have two minutes break now, and after that we'll have the next session. Welcome. Uh, welcome back again. Uh, we uh, will be starting with our further sessions. 
for the next session, we have Dr. Nikun Verma to chair this session. He is an associate professor of hepatology in PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Nikun, please introduce the next speaker. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, taking the gears forward, we have Dr. Mamta Bhatt who is a staff hepatologist and clinical scientist at Ajmera Transplant Center, University Health Network. She is an assistant professor of Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, University of Toronto. Her research program employs bench to bedside program using machine learning tools and bioinformatics and analysis of omic data sets. Her research is supported by Canadian Institute of Health Research. She has published over 100 research papers. She has several recognitions from international societies and her goals is to enable precision medicine approach through better understanding of their mechanistic basis. Over to you, Professor Bhatt. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much, Nikun, uh, Dr. Verma, and uh, uh, the organizers for the opportunity to present to all of you today. I'll just share my screen here. Great. Are you able to see that well? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present at uh, uh, PGI Chandigarh's uh, um, uh, virtual event on uh, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and healthcare. And uh, so my topic is the application of AI in medicine, a clinician's perspective. And uh, so really what I'd like to offer uh, in this presentation is uh, some practical applications uh, from my experiences uh, over the last few years in working with, uh, uh, working closely with collaborators in artificial intelligence uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll start off by um, uh, going over why AI and machine learning are uh, interesting in the um, in their applications to clinical medicine. I know Dr. Datta has gone over this and inspired her with her discussions. Um, I'll briefly uh, cover this point and then get into experiences in the study uh, of clinical questions using uh, machine learning tools, then uh, cover ML, applied to liver disease and transplant, which has uh, been my specific interest uh, in terms of my research program. And uh, so it'll offer you say, a more focused insight into applications of AI in uh, a particular uh, area of medicine. And uh, finally, I'll conclude by talking a bit about the applications of machine learning to omics data. I know that this is a topic that won't be covered during today's symposium, so I thought it would offer an interesting uh, different angle uh, to uh, today's symposium. So I'll start off with um, really the application of uh, AI uh, in uh, clinical medicine and why this is interesting. So uh, if you look at the spectrum of clinical med medicine, as uh, Dr. Datta was saying earlier, you know, AI uh, has many branches and applications, and you can see those in different realms of medicine. Uh, so including, say, AI-assisted surgery, uh, planning of shifts uh, in, in the hospital, cardiac arrest prediction, natural language processing, so actually digitizing a doctor's notes, uh, perception, uh, medical diagnosis. Uh, and so you have so many different applications across the spectrum of medicine. And so even looking at, say, uh, uh, you know, texts or uh, other types of data, uh, say social media, et cetera, there's so many different types of data as well generally um, across uh, society as uh, as was mentioned earlier. So there's so many different applications, but if you look at within medicine, uh, really uh, we're looking at a variety of uh, branches and applications. And so what is really machine learning? Well, that is a, really a subset of artificial intelligence. So it's a field of applied AI that allows software applications to become more accurate at generating predictive models without being explicitly 
program. So you can see here, this is represented uh, in this figure. And so uh, machine learning is really a subset of AI and deep machine learning is a further subset of AI. Sorry, for further subset of um, machine learning. So uh, machine learning is able to detect hidden patterns and interrelationships within large data sets and deep learning is really, um, say, a subset, as I mentioned, uh, with neural networks, which are a type of deep machine learning algorithm. And this, again, allows for uh, leveraging the uh, potential of historical longitudinal data. So in terms of a clinician and uh, application of ML, I would say, you know, the advantage of machine learning as opposed to traditional biostatistics is that the prediction of a given outcome is often difficult. So several variables affect clinical outcomes and standard biostatistics really uh, leverages uh, linear relationships, but say something that is nonlinear cannot be as easily uh, elicited. So standard clinical risk assessment models will assume that a risk factor is related in a linear fashion to clinical outcomes. Whereas, on the other hand, ML can better incorporate multiple risk factors and identify more nuanced relationships between risk factors and outcomes. So ML algorithms learn from existing data to find novel patterns. And uh, so this is another figure basically just representing how uh, ML uh, is able to provide advantages as opposed to traditional biostatistics. So again, the linear relationships, uh, simpler models, computationally cheaper. So certainly from that aspect, there is some advantage that way. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, ML is more of a black box. There's complex um, uh, networks uh, that are being evaluated, nonlinear relationships between predictors and outcomes make the interpretation extremely difficult. And finally, uh, computationally expensive may require days of processor time to build models. And so what are the factors that have led to uh, really the increased adoption of machine learning in uh, healthcare and uh, this in interest in ML among clinicians? So one, one very important one uh, is the increasing adoption of electronic health records. And so this was, this is from a few years ago, but basically what you see is that there's been this increasing adoption of electronic health records uh, in, uh, in different countries. This is from the US. Um, another one is the advent of large data sets. So people have really um, improved and enhanced multi-center collaborations, allowing us to better uh, understand uh, and uh, bring together data from different centers that uh, provides really uh, large value. So, um, for example, the Precision Medicine Initiative in the U.S., uh, the Mimic Critical Care Database, so de-identified health data from critical care patients. This comes out of Boston. And um, the UK Biobank, the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. So this is in the transplant uh, field. So there are various large databases, data sets uh, that have been set up and really allows us to um, you know, create interest uh, among clinicians that one can uh, leverage the power of these large data sets. Additionally, there's so much data that is being generated out there um, in various fields of medicine. So lab tests, say vital signs, devices, uh, imaging, and then omics data, so genomics, uh, proteomics, uh, epigenomics, etc. So, so many different types of data, social media data. So lots of different types of health data that might be generated that really um, are increasing the interest of um, uh, applying such tools to um, better, um, say, um, draw out certain in important uh, interrelationships. Additionally, standardization. So um, th this is uh, true in the US, uh, for example, uh, and in Canada. So other uh, certain diagnosis codes uh, that uh, are, say, very important in terms of uh, delineating or identifying patients with certain conditions. 
so that allows us to uh, say more easily identify from larger data sets uh, people, uh, sorry, indiv uh, individual patients uh, who have particular conditions and their risk factors and uh, say lots of follow-up data associated with that, including laboratory tests and medications. So uh, there's so much uh, data that is uh, say now standardized. Uh, additionally, there's been an increased appreciation for precision medicine in recent years. And so um, what we want to do, what say physicians want to work towards is really um, using data, uh, large data sets, but then ultimately identifying how um, say subpopulations within that data set concord with an individual patient. So really to um, better understand for a given individual patient, what is the best treatment prognosis and diagnosis? So one can look at a large precision cohort, but then there are going to be, say, clusters of patients with different characteristics and ultimately have a more ideal uh, treatment for a given individual patient. And so there's been more and more interest in uh, that sort of approach, which um, I believe, say, with uh, standard one size fits all approach, uh, one really doesn't serve the individual patient in front of you. So really we need to be working towards that uh, in medicine. Um, additionally, there's been a huge amount of progress in machine learning tools. So advances in deep learning techniques, learning with high dimensional features. There's uh, this democratization of machine learning with open source software and uh, great industry interest from Microsoft, Google, IBM, so various companies that really uh, want to build uh, on these tools and then ultimately implement in healthcare. So uh, there's really uh, this, this surging interest in recent years uh, in bringing whatever, say, uh, lessons have been learned in other fields uh, in software, uh, et cetera, and bringing that into uh, healthcare. So next I'll move on to uh, the experience of ML in the study of clinical questions. So this is just a general overview of what has been accomplished uh, in recent years and, and gives you a sense as to say, what are the types of questions that have been uh, addressed or uh, studied? Um, so say, for example, staging diseases is uh, one a type of problem. So uh, using machine learning to uncover stages of disease progression. And so uh, looking at say the progression of chronic kidney disease, liver disease, uh, pulmonary disease, you can say um, uh, derive uh, say prognostic, uh, diagnostic biomarkers using ML to uh, look at patients who are at risk of uh, disease progression. There's also been applications, extensive applications in uh, oncology. So precision oncology using machine learning to guide treatment decisions for cancer therapy. Uh, so for example, uh, this is a, a diagram of treatment in multiple myeloma. And so uh, one looks at this patient and sees, well, um, you know, this patient with this particular risk profile uh, would be best served by this treatment as opposed to this treatment. And um, this is by virtue of, uh, say, um, lots of data that's been generated in the past. Um, so an algorithm based on all of that data generated that then allows you to say, well, for this particular patient, they'd be more likely to progress uh, versus respond on this particular therapy over time. Um, Additionally, say predicting sepsis in patients admitted to hospitals. So this is uh, a project uh, that was uh, performed at Duke Hospital. So uh, they looked at over 42,000 inpatient encounters, 32 plus million data points incorporated. So vital sign measurements, uh, labs, et cetera, medication administration, physiological variables. So there's so much data that is generated during um, such a large number of encounters and um, say baseline covariates and then changes longitudinally over time. All of these can be used to inform the prediction of sepsis in an inpatient. And so what they did was they were able to develop algorithms that, uh, an algorithm, a deep learning model 
that uh, leveraged data from uh, EPIC, which is uh, a patient uh, database management system uh, that then uh, provides the uh, healthcare provider with a percentage risk of a patient uh, developing sepsis. So there are many more applications. I'm sure all of you have heard of, say, the diabetic retinopathy uh, publication in the past, skin cancer screening. These were all published in JAMA a few years ago. Uh, so really, these are more image-based. Uh, so I think that's one very interesting um, thing that you might notice. So that, uh, say, um, like AI um, applied to uh, images is going to be much more, uh, say, um, informative in certain fields as opposed to, say, uh, clinical and laboratory-based uh, algorithms. So uh, there is probably a bit more, say, difficulty in terms of uh, developing highly accurate algorithms depending on the type of data you're using as well. Um, additional applications of ML have been drug discovery for faster, cheaper drug development pipelines, uh, automating polyp detection in gastrointestinal diseases, uh, additionally, the microbiome, liquid biopsies for cancer detection and tracking. So there's so many different applications, and it's really hard to keep track of the literature because there's so much happening. Um, so what are the challenges for the application of machine learning in healthcare? So although there's a lot of promise and there's a lot of, um, say, a growing interest in terms of the practical application of machine learning in healthcare, uh, the reality is that, um, you know, if we look at implementation, really, that's going to take uh, time to really uh, integrate and implement these algorithms into practice, I would say. So uh, I think it's important to say, recognize that there's a lot of promise and potential, but then the next step is really bringing it to uh, the clinical setting and uh, really developing algorithms that are accurate and uh, helpful. Um, uh, and that is going to require time. But additionally, one very important point that I should bring up here is that cleaning and labeling data is what actually takes the most of the time um, in, uh, say, a study, uh, an ML study. So I would say, you know, uh, and this is from The Economist, uh, you can appreciate that, say, cleansing, labeling uh, data takes a, a very heavy proportion of the time uh, in terms of, of a machine learning project. And so it's quite critical to have a very, um, say, you know, well um, documented data set that is clean, that is accurate, um, and is very much amenable to uh, the application of machine learning tools. Additionally, um, there's a challenging risk to reward ratio. So in healthcare, uh, clinicians make life or death decisions. And so um, it's, you know, it's not uh, trivial to bring a machine learning algorithm to the clinical setting. And so algorithm development should proceed with caution and care. We need robust algorithms with checks and balances. Additionally, patient populations are different. So each individual is unique. So people from Mumbai will dif uh, display different clinical phenotypes than those in Toronto. And so what do we need? We need new methods for transfer learning so that models are able to generalize well across different hospitals. So I can give you one example. For example, the um, skin cancer screening algorithms. Um, you know, it, it has been um, uh, found that those algorithms will work well, uh, say, in the Caucasian population, but with darker skinned individuals, they may actually uh, compromise the detection of skin cancer. So one should be, be very, very careful ultimately in the application of algorithms and uh, transfer learning algorithms are, are going to be very important. So like new methods for transfer learning are going to be important so that models developed in one setting are able to then be generalized um, across other settings. Missing this as well. So, uh, you know, patients, individuals will only go uh, to seek medical care when uh, they're sick. And so uh, it may be possible uh, that certain data uh, is not available, that, um, you know, these are not documented in between visits, etc. So, 
uh, what do we need? Well, we need machine learning models that can make robust predict predictions when data is missing. Additionally, data silos, so countries do have regulations that require patient data to be kept private, uh, which is uh, you know, obviously appropriate. Um, so what do we need? Well, we need uh, new ideas in federated learning um, for institutions not comfortable with data sharing, automated methods for de-identification. Uh, so uh, certainly uh, this would be helpful in terms of ultimately then leveraging the power of this data. And then ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, deploying ML software in the clinic uh, is, uh, say, another level uh, progress that is going to be needed. And so uh, machine learning models can stop working after a period of time. And so we need new techniques for lifelong learning of these models and uh, ways to handle different types of shifts in terms of um, the accuracy of those models. So now I'll get into machine learning applied to liver disease and uh, transplant specifically because um, this is my uh, real area of research. And I hope that by uh, giving you some insights into uh, the types of problems I've addressed within my research program, uh, you can then uh, say seek some inspiration uh, to then apply into your own areas. Uh, and this gives you, say, an appreciation of how um, a clinician might uh, develop uh, such tools. And then ultimately, um, you know, inform uh, patient, patient care. So why machine learning in liver disease? Well, liver diseases are complex and have a dynamic trajectory. Uh, there are ver various factors that affect susceptibility to disease, including sex, ethnicity, genetics, environmental exposures, lifestyle, body mass index, diabetes, medication, so so many different, and, and the list goes on and on. And so there are different factors that are going to affect the susceptibility to disease and the prognosis. And so uh, additionally, uh, as a hepatologist, as a liver specialist, uh, I'm always looking at these, say, different uh, liver enzyme elevations, patterns in these liver enzymes, uh, so there are these complex nonlinear patterns. Uh, additionally, liver function tests separately, such as the INR bilirubin, uh, so uh, albumin, etc. So there, there's uh, you know so many different patterns uh, of such tests, among others, including the platelets, white count, etc., uh, that are so important to then say informing uh, diagnosis and prognosis. Additionally. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and this is true across medicine, there are so many other types of data that we're collecting that really uh, can further fine tune and improve, uh, potentially improve uh, algorithmic predictions. And so interrelationships abound among all of these parameters. And so in hepatology, uh, this is a publication uh, of ours from two years ago. We uh, looked at, um, th this is a review article published in the journal uh, hepatology. And so uh, we looked at the literature, the landscape of machine learning in hepatology and liver transplantation, and uh, really appreciated that there had been a dramatic increase in the number of publications uh, in recent years. Uh, and so uh, ML tools uh, can be used to address different uh, questions in hepatology, uh, including, uh, say, um, in, in viral hepatitis, the risk of cirrhosis, um, radiant boosting machines to predict PSC survival, uh, survival of patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, for example, looking at uh, more radiomic data, so shear wave elastography images, uh, applying support vector machine um, uh, algorithms. So uh, this is traditionally what is used uh, along with uh, convolutional neural uh, networks to study um, images. Uh, so there, there's such a different range of applications uh, across uh, liver disease um, that that really in recent years uh, have been generated and uh, really um, portend a promising uh, implementation uh, in the clinical setting. Uh, in terms of liver transplantation, additionally, uh, so this is uh, another review that we published recently uh, looking at uh, application in the uh, field of liver transplantation. And so, again, support vector machines 
to assess hepatosteatosis in donor grafts. So mainly the, the literature has been centered around the pre-transplant uh, realm. Uh, so looking at, say, a donor recipient uh, matching, so uh, liver graft acceptance and outcomes, uh, say, predicting risk of relapse uh, in uh, patients with uh, alcoholic liver disease, and then uh, in living donor segmentation uh, analysis. So, um, so the different applications that have been uh, seen in the field of liver transplantation. So now what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, provide you some, say, case studies uh, of work that we've done in my research program and really gives you some insight into uh, how uh, we've applied um, say uh, machine learning algorithms, deep machine learning algorithms in um, informing improved uh, personalized care of, uh, of patients. So this is a paper that we published last year in Lancet Digital Health. And uh, this was a, a close collaboration with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Bo Wong at the University of Toronto and uh, spearheaded by uh, two students. Actually, one was a computer science student and the other was a clinical research fellow uh, and a clinical fellow. So we had a, a range of expertise. And um, really, this was a wonderful collaboration in that we uh, had an ongoing dialogue. So we met regularly. And of course, uh, us clinicians learned a lot from that ongoing dialogue. And uh, they also learned a lot about what, um, you know, how the algorithms had to be developed in order to really address uh, a specific clinical question. And so I think, uh, you know, in terms of if, if really one is uh, interested in applying uh, such tools uh, to, to the study of specific clinical questions, this really requires, say, first of all, from the clinician side, uh, an appreciation and understanding of the language and uh, ongoing dialogue uh, with uh, the computer scientists, because uh, without that, without that crosstalk, it's really not feasible to move ahead. And so in this, uh, con you know, so uh, basically this is, uh, um, he is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Toronto. So we've had uh, ongoing, uh, say, crosstalk uh, resulting in this uh, publication. So uh, what was the rationale behind this study? So. If you look at uh, the long-term survival rates of uh, patients who have undergone liver transplantation, certainly uh, there have been dramatic improvements in terms of short-term survival. So one-year survival has dramatically improved from 65% to over even 95% one-year survival. But if one looks at the long-term survival rates beyond a year, they have remained somewhat stagnant in the last 30 years. And this is because the lifespan of recipients is compromised by a heightened incidence of cancer, cardiometabolic disease, and infection. And uh, the key, uh, a critical risk factor is the lifelong immunosuppression required to mitigate against graft rejection. And the cure of liver transplant recipients is based on limited uh, evidence, particularly retrospective studies. Uh, there is very limited uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, a lot of it is also the experience uh, over time. And we also take certain lessons from, say, the non-transplant wor world and import them into transplant medicine. And so in transplantation, um, one always has to uh, think about uh, the balance between uh, rejection and this risk of cancer infection and cardiovascular disease when optimizing uh, the degree of immunosuppression in a given patient. So for example, someone who's transplanted for autoimmune liver disease and is younger uh, and is of certain ethnic background may have a higher risk of rejection, will have a higher risk of rejection uh, as compared to say an older individual transplanted for uh, fatty liver disease, uh, you know, will have a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So uh, the, basically what we wanted to do here was to develop a personalized risk calculator for managing long-term transplant care that could be used at each follow-up visit. And so we incorporated longitudinal data. So we used historical data up until a particular time point. Then from that time point, we were able to say, well, this person's uh, one year and five year risk of heart disease associated mortality is this percent. 
And then, uh, so we evaluated different deep learning algorithms to predict mortality and were able to classify patients into major risk categories. And so this figure on the right basically illustrates, um, say, how a neural network is uh, structured. So there's various layers of, uh, say, uh, hidden layers underneath uh, the clinical variables uh, that allow for these interrelationships. And these are, say, leverage to generate these algorithms. And so what we did was uh, we used the U.S. Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients as our uh, training set. So this uh, represented over 42,000 uh, blood transplant recipients. We looked at annual follow-ups. Uh, we really we stopped at 2014 uh, because we then wanted to generate five-year outlooks. Um, and uh, we looked at annual follow-up data. Uh, so the nice thing about this uh, registry is that there's follow-up data from the time of transplant. Uh, this, uh, th this was the number of variables, so 267 clinical variables, and we looked at five outcomes, so overall survival, death by graft failure, infection, cardiac event, and cancer, and uh, as I mentioned, one and five-year outlooks were predicted. Uh, we uh, curated uh, the SRTR data set, the US data set, and then uh, basically um, evaluated different deep learning algorithms and uh, then performed uh, fine tuning and external validation with our data set in Toronto. And uh, we discovered that the best performing model was the transformer model, which is uh, a type of deep learning model, and uh, it achieved an overall survival area under the curve uh, of 0.774, but then for specific uh, subtypes of mortality, uh, there was higher performance, so cardiac, cancer, and graft failure infection. And then for five year, uh, we were also able to uh, have a, a reasonable prediction of uh, outcome. Uh, and this was in comparison to logistic regression, uh, which was best uh, performing at 0.714 and 0.648 at five years. Again, this is the UHN cross-validation at one year and five year, and uh, it was similarly performing uh, for both of those outputs. So uh, just to clarify, actually, so the nice thing is, say, for example, if you have a liver transplant recipients at, uh, recipient at four years post-transplant, you can then generate an outlook for one year and then five years post-transplant from that time point. So similarly, as uh, one looks over time. And um, the interesting thing here is that we were also able to derive a list of ranked features. So uh, the ranking, this is the ranking for the most salient input features for prediction of all the outcomes. Uh, and this is for the overall population. But you could envision actually doing the same for the individual patient. So what we're doing currently is creating a dashboard now um, that uses this algorithm. And basically the plan is to allow clinicians to get an updated one and five year probability of each outcome at every follow-up visit, uh, derive ranked features for each outcome, and uh, basically uh, have this individualized to a given patient. And so for example, the patient with uh, poor control of their diabetes, uh, hypertension, maybe higher than necessary immunosuppression, would have a higher risk of cardiac failure, uh, which could serve as a red flag suggesting specialist referral. So um, this is, say, the beauty of uh, having more of a personalized risk assessment. And this uh, also would allow for, say, the fine tuning of immunosuppression ultimately in our practice. This is the second case study. So here we, we uh, developed a deep learning framework for the dynamic diagnosis of graft fibrosis after liver transplantation using longitudinal data. And so, as you may be aware, as you will be aware, uh, there are different diagnostic options for uh, fibrosis uh, diagnosis, so liver biopsy. There are advantages. Uh, obviously, uh, one can tell what uh, the exact, um, say, reason for graft for liver damage is uh, using a liver biopsy, 
Uh, however, there are limitations, including, say, the risk of bleeding, infection by leak, and very rarely risk of death. Uh, and this is very expensive. So, and there's also uh, a significant uh, possibility of sampling error. Given that it represents, say, one uh, out of 50,000 of the liver. So, uh, then say this brings up the uh, opportunity of developing non invasive methods to uh, prevent such, uh, say, complications and also limit costs to the healthcare system. So, uh, developing serum biomarkers, uh, APRI, FIB4, these have been used in practice. However, there are many indeterminate scores and uh, these have limited, uh, say, sensitivity, um, and uh, this is patient population dependent as well. Then, if you look at imaging methods, transient elastography can be used for, say, um, identification of stage of fibrosis, and uh, additionally, MR elastography, shear wave elastography. These are all imaging methods that can be used for non-invasive uh, diagnosis. Uh, so, what I'd like to share here is actually a recent paper that we published, and this is from the non-transplant patient population, but it gives you a sense as to uh, what we uh, were able to achieve with that, and then what we're doing now as a next step to study this in the liver transplant patient population. So, here what we did was we looked at uh, a large number of um, patients with liver disease uh, at the Toronto Centre for Liver Disease, and uh, we were able to um, evaluate different machine learning algorithms, including support uh, vector machine, random forest, gradient boosting, logistic regression, and uh, an artificial neural network, and uh, trained this on a variety of parameters, including uh, these uh, listed on the left. And uh, we were able to, um, say, detect uh, the presence of advanced fibrosis, advanced um, scarring of the liver, so stage two and above, as well as compensated cirrhosis. And uh, when we looked at the performance of different algorithms, in fact, we realized that bringing together, uh, say, the uh, uh, benefits of each of those all together into an ensemble algorithm actually resulted in even more optimal performance. And so, uh, you can see here that we were able to achieve 82.7% uh, sensitivity uh, and 73.9% uh, um, specificity. So there was a bit of a compromise with the specificity. Um, and uh, this uh, resulted in an area under the curve of 848 uh, and um, AUPRC of 86.7. So precision. Uh, curve of uh, 86.7. So, um, this was quite a bit better than, uh, say, the standard biomarkers APRI and FIB4. And uh, these also compared favorably with, say, expert uh, hepatologists who had reviewed these data and uh, generated their own predictions. So, this was published recently um, in Lancet Digital Health. Now, we have leveraged this uh, sort of experience to now look into graft fibrosis, so uh, fibrosis of the liver transplant, uh, the transplanted liver. And so um, we know that this is accelerated in patients uh, who have been transplanted. Uh, so say in the non-transplant setting, this takes 25 years or so to develop, but in the transplant recipient, uh, this can be, this is accelerated and may even arise in a five to 10 year horizon. So um, uh, this is why it's quite important for us to better understand who is developing that fibrosis and what we can do to prevent it. And so here, what we, are, what we have done is developed a deep learning model using longitudinal variables, so demographic, clinical, and laboratory test variables to uh, detect significant fibrosis stage two or greater and use the liver biopsy as a reference method. And uh, we used all uh, possibly available data to then inform predictions uh, of the presence of fibrosis. And uh, these were uh, a total, represented a total of 29 variables 
uh, among uh, the, uh, the patients. Uh, and uh, we, we used, um, at the outset, uh, we started off with 7,380 liver biopsies, although many had to be excluded due to multiple samples. Uh, we then uh, brought it down to 1,893 biopsies, uh, which were then divided into uh, training and validation sets. And uh, we looked at, uh, as I mentioned, all, all uh, possible available variables in these patients uh, longitudinally over time. And so re really uh, to inform predictions using all of that historical data. And uh, we trained conventional ML algorithms, including uh, all of those listed here, as well as deep learning algorithms, uh, particularly uh, long short-term memory networks, and uh, one particular uh, type of LSTM called weighted LSTM. And so the advantages of this particular algorithm is that it can better handle missing data and uh, it improves LSTM through the weight loss function to minimize bias. And so uh, results, these are our results. Uh, we found that um, our algorithm was able to uh, perform quite well uh, overall, so with an AUC of 0.798 in terms of the detection of uh, advanced fibrosis of the graft. And uh, this performed favorably, so uh, in comparison to FIB4 and APRI, which are the standard uh, liver fibrosis test measurements. And these were the top ranked features in terms of the prediction of advanced fibrosis for the overall population. But then again, this can be individualized, as I mentioned, for a given patient. So what would a clinician see? Well, basically, uh, this is one sample patient that uh, uh, I'm, I'm showing. Uh, so uh, at 279 days post-transplant, and basically uh, you can then say, well, this is their risk of having stage two fibrosis, which is 68.1%, and so uh, would benefit from more strict uh, follow-up and uh, management. Additionally, there is the potential to um, use this kind of data to predict what kind of um, injury is happening to the transplanted liver. And so uh, you may be aware that, say, uh, patients can develop rejection. They can develop, say, recurrent hepatitis C, although these days, uh, obviously, uh, hepatitis C is almost universally curable. Additionally, fatty liver disease. And so um, what we are also able to do uh, now, more recently, we've developed uh, an algorithm to predict what is the type of pathology that, that is present on the liver biopsy. So now, finally, I'll conclude uh, by talking a bit about uh, ML applications to omics data. I know that this is a topic not being covered today, so I thought um, I could uh, give you some insight into what kind of applications are feasible and uh, uh, interesting. So, uh, for example, for, for the liver, um, you know, so diseases uh, in general will arise due to alteration of different biological entities, and you can appreciate that there are uh, such a vast number of protein coding genes, mRNAs, microRNAs, proteins, metabolites, as listed here. In terms of the liver specifically, uh, it's our metabolic factory, different levels of regulation. There have been significant advances in biotechnology in recent years. Uh, resulting in the generation of complex omics data, and these are making precision medicine uh, more possible. And so genomics, uh, as you will be aware, refers to sequencing and analysis of an organism's genome, and these are the types of data that can be generated. Uh, transcriptomics, uh, so one can obtain gene expression arrays, which is a bit older technology now. Uh, RNA sequencing data, single cell sequencing data, uh, spatial transcriptomics, so there, uh, there's that kind of data uh, representing the RNA. Then epigenetics, so these are heritable alterations not due to changes in DNA sequence, and these are the types of epigenetic modifications due to environmental exposures, etc., that can occur and uh, also have an impact on disease and disease progression. Non-coding RNAs, so these are RNA molecules not translated into protein. Proteomics, uh, this is um, really the, the, the range of proteins produced. 
uh, and uh, this is uh, detected using mass spectrometry. Uh, metabolomics, uh, so quantitative measurements related to the phys physiological state of an organism, and there are uh, different types of, uh, say, metabolomics uh, subsets uh, that can be studied, so lipidomics, glycomics, and amino acids, and the microbiome uh, has garnered a lot of interest as well, so these are the different types of data that one could derive using uh, microbiome samples from different sites, um, and then, uh, so, you, there, there is such a range of omics data that now can be generated. Now, however, one needs to keep in mind again that analysis of any single omics data is limited to identifying a variation, and so at most a correlation between one or two types of bioentities. And so an upregulated mRNA may not increase its target protein expression. And so therefore, different omics data are truly interrelated. And so you know, this figure, I think, nicely represents uh, that, uh, say, when one um, examines the elephant, uh, you know, different uh, people will have different perspectives. And so uh, they may feel that, uh, say, uh, this elephant is a snake by, uh, you know, touching its trunk, uh, or that it's a wall touching its uh, uh, abdomen, but then in the end, really, one really needs to uh, look at the overall picture. And so this is what ultimately multi-omics uh, can enable us to do. And so the integration of multi-omics data uh, is, uh, um, you know, recently, in recent years, really been brought uh, to the forefront. So uh, not just limiting uh, ourselves to the analysis of single uh, omics data sets, and these are just different types of specialized tools that one can use to integrate uh, omics data. So this is not machine learning, basically it's just integration. And uh, now for, for omics data integration, uh, there are different ways of, say, using um, these different layers of data to then look at different networks and relationships. Uh, so between these different um, say genes, transcription factors, microRNAs, metabolites. So this allows for the intuitive exploration of molecular interactions and regulatory relationships. Um, here, this is uh, again some some uh, clustering approach uh, to uh, look at multilayer omics data. Um, so I won't get into too much details here. But then uh, moving on to applications of uh, AI to such data sets, so one could use uh, two different approaches, so supervised learning for prognostic prediction and unsupervised for clustering patients into different patient subgroups. So one could envision, for example, uh, applying um, AI algorithms to omics data to determine, uh, say, uh, for cancer patients, well, this is, um, these, these are the different types, subtypes of, uh, um, cancer patients, uh, their associated survival probability, and then these are potential therapeutic targets. Um, additionally, one very interesting thing is uh, to be able to integrate omics data with clinical data. So there are different tools uh, that have been developed uh, to allow for this. Uh, one step in this direction was the similarity network fusion a uh, tool that really uh, was able to look at different layers of uh, omics data to then uh, develop, uh, predict labels for new samples based on a constructed network. And then uh, this is really um, allowing this, this additional tool that has been developed uh, so and published last year uh, is able to leverage uh, clinical data alongside all omics data to then integrate multimodal patient data and build a patient classifier, address risk stratification. So uh, I, I invite you to look at this particular paper to better understand uh, that sort of uh, omics integration with clinical data uh, that can be done uh, using this particular uh, ML method. Uh, now, this is one uh, particular, uh, say, particularly powerful cancer example published in Nature last year, uh, so wherein they used uh, data 
uh, various types of omics data on a very well characterized patient cohort of um, uh, 121 discovery set patients and then 80 validation set patients. And they used, um, say, this different types of omics data to then uh, cluster patients into different categories or different, uh, say, levels of severity of the cancer uh, that were associated with different rates of recurrence free survival. Um, here, I'll offer you some uh, examples in hepatology specifically. So, this is uh, a paper that was published in 2020 looking at the prediction and elucidation of the etiology of uh, fatty liver disease. And they used uh, machine learning modeling, uh, so conventional, on conventional clinical variables to predict uh, NAFLD. And uh, they developed uh, different prediction models. Uh, just using clinical data, but then the additional detailed omics data, genetic, transcriptomic, proteomic, and metabolomic significantly improved the predictive utility of these models. Um, one important, uh, say, effort that has resulted in uh, multiple publications is the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which you may be familiar with. So, uh, this is an example of a paper that used the HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma data from that particular uh, database. And so uh, they applied and constructed a, a multi-omics map of hepatocellular carcinoma using all of the different layers of omics data. And there are various other studies of omics data using the uh, TCGA data set. So really this gives you the, um, say, insight into how multi-omics uh, data is out there and can actually be leveraged alongside, uh, say, clinical data points. And sometimes it may involve, say, uh, you know, even contacting the original group to see if uh, they're interested in collaboration to bring together different data sets. What are the challenges, however, of applying AI to multi-omics data? So uh, there's, there can be heterogeneity of data from multi, multiple omics sources. Data may not be processed in a unified way. Uh, there can be technical artifacts uh, such as batch effects. So uh, there is a need for larger multi-omics data sets. High computational power is required. Uh, there is uh, a risk of overfitting ML models due to limited sample size. And so uh, I would say at least in the liver field, uh, there's been limited work beyond the cancer space. And this can be said for say across medicine really uh, you know, cancer has been leading the field in terms of applying AI to multi-omics data. So, uh, finally, what I'd like to do is uh, conclude with a vision for the future of AI and medicine overall. So, I think, uh, you know, AI holds great promise to personalize the care of patients. It's based on interrelationships and hidden patterns in complex data. Uh, really, there's so much different types of data that are being generated out there. And uh, one um, can just look into one's own clinical practice and see that there is so much data that is being generated. And I think as a clinician, you realize that there are a lot of, uh, say, subconscious algorithms working in our brain itself, you know, so uh, that we are using to uh, take care of our patients. Uh, and so um, ultimately what we're doing is uh, trying to, say, develop models that can reproduce uh, some of that and even uh, enhance uh, on those predictions. Uh, given that, you know, say, the AI algorithm can learn from a much larger data set than, say, you know, a single physician's experience. Um, and I think, you know, deep learning algorithms are most helpful in using historical longitudinal data and in informing prediction of the future. So I'd like to conclude by acknowledging my research team. Uh, I have a wonderful dedicated research team uh, representing a range of expertise and uh, different levels of training. And really they've been um, very hardworking and dedicated, uh, very fortunate to have such a great team. Uh, I've also had the privilege of working with uh, key collaborators in artificial intelligence at the University of Toronto. Uh, they've, they've all been wonderful in terms of 
the crosstalk uh, between the clinician and the computer scientists. And I'd also like to acknowledge my funding sources. Um, so including the uh, Canadian Institutes for Health Research. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to take any, uh, any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Mamta. It was really an amazing presentation and, uh, you know, Thank bringing you so forth the whole potential of uh, artificial intelligence from a clinician's perspective and looking at your journey and your progress. I think uh, many new physicians and uh, residents who are watching this uh, seminar, they must be motivated by uh, looking at such a progress from a clinician. So, uh, so Dr. Mamta, uh, this was a clinician's perspective. So, one basic question arises from a resident's mind is that who should be doing machine learning, whether it is a clinician or a physician, or a, you know who would who would be the main key stakeholder who would be doing, or or is it a team which is required for such a? Doing? Yeah. So the, thank you for that question, uh, um, uh, Dr. Varma. So uh, and you know it's uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to present to all of you today. So thank you for for uh, the opportunity today. Um, so, I think really it's a team effort, uh, I would say, you know, so, uh, you know, we're not the only stakeholders. I think uh, it, it's uh, everything is interrelated. So, I would say that um, in the last years, I've learned a lot, you know, just by interacting and speaking uh, with computer scientists. I've learned from the graduate students that I co-supervised with computer scientists. And I think... Uh, it involves some degree of, you know, whenever you're doing research, you have to have a certain degree of humility, you know, like, so yeah, you, you have to continue learning because it's uh, a question of uh, everyone learning together uh, and right. uh, developing the, these algorithms together. So they obviously have the content expertise, uh, which we don't have. I mean, I have a bioinformatics background, but I did not do machine learning, uh, say I didn't take courses in machine learning specifically to develop the computational skills required. But uh, I would say that through this ongoing dialogue, I've really come to understand, you know, uh, what are the different types of tools that can be applied for specific cl clinical questions. And I think, you know, my clinical questions are really inspired by interactions with patients, interactions, discussions with colleagues, um, you know, and uh, your clinical experience itself just can provide you with that creativity. Um, so obviously the computer scientists don't have that experience, you know, so they don't see uh, the patient in front of them. They, they won't have that awareness that this is a very important clinical question that must be studied to improve and personalize uh, patient care. So I think it involves different parties and everyone being, you know, willing everyone being willing to learn from each other. So that kind of ecosystem is required and, and the basic- For sure, the I think, you know, and I think, you know, the other thing for me, I've found that say having an academic environment has been uh, very helpful. Like say if I were to collaborate with uh, a company, that would be quite different from say, because uh, say a company has their own interests in mind in terms of developing algorithms. Whereas it, if you're interacting with an academic they have, uh, you know, more maybe interests that are going to be more in line with your interests in terms of improving patient care, because they're ultimately interested in generating knowledge that will help uh, rather than looking at uh, the economic aspect of it. So I think, uh, you know, that's that's also important to keep in mind. Uh, and I know that, you know, say for your uh, for you, uh, for example, you've uh, had that opportunity to collaborate with academics and I think you have that kind of you know environment uh, so I would say that is the appropriate approach uh, you know to working on uh, clinical problems in the end right so that's that's really motivating and uh, I think there was one question in the chat box uh, so how how should you prevent data leakage problem in a time series data so it was a technical question. Um, uh, maybe uh, if you you can answer that or uh, in data speaker. leakage in a time data series. Leakage. Yeah. So so I think the question by the speaker was uh, probably asking that sometimes the data which is 
used for training purposes is is far beyond <clears throat> the uh, expected outcome so let's okay. let's say for example in time series data let's say you are predicting mortality at the end of uh, like let's say 7 days yeah. and you are trying to take data of patient till 6 days of admission so uh, it it is kind of at the 6th day when uh, or the starting of 7th day the patient is going to die so you are yeah. trying to capture that data and actually trying to predict the mortality based using that data so it is kind of a reflective process and uh, what do you think that uh, this is in technical terms they use this term as a data leakage so should we be using such type of data for uh, predictions uh, i think that that was a question yeah i i think you know when we um one one important point is whenever you're working with patient data uh, clearly it must be uh de-identified and uh you know you um assign uh say uh random codes uh to different uh say uh patients within a population uh so that's and there are various say practices within each institution to um allow for data privacy uh that are quite critical to adopt uh so um one needs to have such uh, rigorous um say guidelines uh, and guidance from the institution to uh, prevent uh, such uh data leakage um now in terms of say predicting um and and developing these algorithms uh you know say in our example what we used was a very large training set uh that was not from our institution we used um say the US scientific registry of transplant recipients which actually um is uh publicly available so one needs to purchase access to it but it involves a large data set of uh, de-identified uh patients and uh, this wealth of data on that patient population so we use that as the training set and then ultimately our institutional data set as the test set so um basically the computer science uh, student who worked on this problem uh was able to seamlessly uh, say train and then test on the in- institutional data set but in terms of uh, say preventing uh data leakage i would say coming back to that question i i'm not a technically like i i i don't know what sort of strategies one would use uh to prevent that beyond uh what i've said so uh i welcome any comments from any other individuals who have expertise in that like say a computer scientist or or someone or maybe you may uh bring up that question later during the day when uh, you have yeah. other speakers who are able to address that better than i can so so thank you very much dr mamta it was really an uh, eye opener presentation for all of us and uh, motivation for all the students and fellows who are listening to this presentation that we can also work in this area and uh, for sure yeah and uh, really thankful for you know it's quite late at your place and uh, <laughs> i am really thankful that you it's uh, 155 am now i know and uh, <laughs> no problem really thank- really thankful but, but you know the the nice thing is uh with this virtual world uh you can connect with so many people without having to travel without the problem of jet lag and this and that right so yeah. it's it's all but, good but, i enjoyed it thank you thank you very much so for the would, opportunity thank you and we would like you to be present physically in uh, subsequent workshops which we will be planning in in few months we will we will share the details thank sure. you very much okay. thank you very thank you much. okay bye bye so now we have a, a break for 10 minutes uh, and then we will come back again with the data preparation techniques by dr devadoot and uh, have a tea for some time
So welcome back after tea. So now next session will be taken by Dr. Dev Dutt. Uh, he is assistant professor at Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Kharagpur. He is focused on developing machine learning algorithms with deep neural networks and graphical models for visual computing, including medical image analysis and surgical informatics. He is recipient of multiple awards. His research areas include machine learning, computer vision, biomedical systems, medical informatics, and medical imaging. So, Dr. Debadut will talk on uh, data preparation techniques for machine learning for structured, unstructured, and imaging data. So, over to you, Dr. Debadut. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome all. And uh, I just wanted to keep it a bit more in the storytelling narratives. So, I, I did do a bit of modification on the title compared to the theme. So it's, it's still around the theme of uh, data preparation. Uh, but I will be telling you the story around how we understand structured and unstructured data, imaging data versus non-imaging data and clinical data all in together. And uh, then accordingly, what we have been doing in the time of COVID right at its uh, most important uh, phase in, in research in, in order to deliver a certain uh, important point. So I hope my slides are visible and I'm audible to all of you. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. You're audible and slides are visible. So right over there, when we started around this whole time of COVID, one of the major asks, which came down to us uh, working in the field of image analysis was that can we make diagnostic means? And when we mean to what we did, the need was something like this. I find that there is a chest x ray which uh, is taken of a, of, of a possible patient of COVID. Can I have this X-ray being in one AI model? These neural networks, these can be classical machine learning models. This can be based on computer vision followed by a machine learning. And then out comes some sort of able diagnosis over there. So not just that we expect that these are just a minute. So not just that we are expecting that these models will actually be providing us a binary or a binary decision over there, but we are also expecting that they actually provide us some sort of a natural language equivalent reporting, which is getting done along with an explainability, which is where did it actually see any of uh, uh, these facts? Findings which this model is report. This, that this makes it sort of like the holy grail of what we anticipate to be able to achieve. However, in a general purpose scenario, this is not so easy to do. Uh, a major part of the uh, operation of this model, the AI model, actually depends on uh, how good is uh, the data which is actually supplied to that. And getting hold of this data is not so easy to do over here. So the primary challenge on this is what I'm looking at, what I'm interested in doing. But uh, there are certain questions which come down on one is more. My use in order to come to your try to do a point of care ultrasound or with chest X-rays or with CT. So choosing out one of them out of these possible available options is going to be the first part because I need to collect on the data for training my model specific to that particular modality. And along with that, I also need to have the uh, uh, this this particular model modality at the point where the so 
uh, although it was Uh, most of the U.S. China moved on by virtue of the fact that they were very well equipped with the problem that we which it could to really deploy. In terms of excess, next is we together lists, and these tables are taken. It has to be annotated for observations, not just. But you will also need to uh, access to fine granular annotations needed in order. Now, the only thing, this whole part, it might sound a bit sadistic, was that there were a lot of people who were conformed with COVID. And basically, most people emerged with ICD or X ray, some of them with both CT, X ray, some of them even had an ultrasound adjunct uh, come, coming in over there. So, the scarcity of data was not the challenge facing. It was actually pretty abundant. I mean, a million samples getting down for from which for you think is actually a healthy uh, scenario. It will uh, really be the most comfortable zone in order to solve these problems. The challenge was that less than percent these images are actually labeled. Following some sort of common standard, the, the absence of a reporting and data is something which plaguing the viable use of these samples. Which images. they were um, sort of reported, but they were reported following a lengthy protocol. So one uh, particular uh, attributes that would be uh, reported out over there and then also the major problem is that not just this will have this challenge of having this variation this would also have the additional that will two of them into a computer readable format so these two problems needed to be solved out together so that essentially came to a point where almost so now within this challenge which was seemingly unsolvable we need to Tracking for, for, for you guys, or is it clear? Hello. Uh, we're not able to hear anything. Uh, no, Dr. No. Devdu, uh, you are not audible. Sir. To... Yeah. Your bandwidth is low, probably.
डॉक्टर देवदूत यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल You can join again, Doctor Devdoot, if 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 it is not connecting. We are calling him uh, so that he can call him. him. ये जॉइनिंग फ्रॉम डिफरेंट नेटवर्क
Dr. Devadut, are you there? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible, Dr. Sam. Yeah, it's much better. Yep, I guess I'm audible clear now. Uh, should not have a disruption. Yes, you are audible, sir. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I thought our Wi Fi was stable enough to get down on a WebEx and then as usual with Wi Fi. Okay, so I think uh, till this part on uh, trying to automate diagnosis, that was pretty clear. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So now when I was telling about the challenge, the primary part of that is that you need to choose out on modality. So either, uh, and, and there were multiple options, like you can have CT or you can have X-rays or you can have point of care ultrasound. And there are these different options which has to be chosen. Now, one part of the problem is that the Modality has to be very carefully chosen in terms of where the final diagnosis has to work out. And also this has to be looked into the fact that the data has to be coherently collected from this particular modality. Otherwise, it's not going to work out. The next is that the labels of the data have to be collected properly. So there would be point of care ultrasound or there is CXR or CT. Each of them has their own lexical labels which need to be used um, and that has to be standardized in some way. Otherwise, uh, there won't be any effective use which we can do despite having that million number of samples over there. The next point is that you have a million samples which are okay. The only challenge is that less than 1% of them are actually uh, imaged and reported using a common standard protocol. So some of them are reported uh, imaged with only CT, some of them have only X-ray, some of them have a good combination of CTs and X-rays, both of them taken together. Some of them uh, have only the point of care ultrasound, some of them might have all three of them. But until and unless that everything follows down the same kind of a protocol, it's not going to work out. So this essentially sets the big challenge that the whole task is now unsolvable. There is no way that we can solve out this task. So that's where we actually went ahead and created this pro bono initiative called as COVID-19 Action Group on AI and Radiology. And the whole task of COVID-19 Action Radiology was that we get uh, a common standard protocol 
laid out for collecting all the data and essentially have a rads established so a reporting and data system is what we were looking into but there were bigger challenges over here and, and even even before that bigger challenges what we needed to understand is as to why should we really need to do it and today i'm going to speak about that why purely from a mathematical perspective and where engineering was employed in order to really accelerate the whole data collection and curation process itself so we had a team of uh, different people including image analysts like me and there were several others like uruna go uh, rashna and others who were who are also image analysts we had uh, people from public health we had people from uh, radiology working together along with a lot of undergrad and master students over here and we really partnered with several uh, other agencies as well so we were fortunate to work along with the focus atlas the rsna iria and uh, other pro bono initiatives like the covid-19 challenge in eu uh, where they were also facing a similar problem that despite they sitting on top of a lot of scans they did not have access to uh, a proper label which was uh, a proper reporting label following which it was done and then uh, there were hospitals like apollo in kolkata and valdesita from uh, spain which actually contributed in a big way in uh, providing us with a lot of data which comes down from the actual field as well as sharing experiences on taking back our uh, uh, our rats protocol and and how it really performs over there so what we need to so what essentially we were doing at that point of time is uh, something like this so the problem which uh, we looked up is is what can be uh, sort of summarized as clinicians you might not uh, find it really interesting but then uh, we as people from the background and backdrop on analysis found it really intriguing in order to understand this and uh, actually have a mathematical framework laid out for it so the problem is that uh, there can be several hospitals which can have different number of beds available now say we are considering hospital a which has a few number of beds and let's look into this condition of what happens so over the days when covid was incident so you would see a steady state increase in the number of cases which go by the day and uh, to a certain possibility you can actually have these people admitted into your hospital so somewhere around day 20 you would find out that all 20 beds in your hospital are full now if on the 21st day you have one patient who has cured and is exiting out of the hospital you would see that now you can actually keep on having a steady state condition and eventually you would see that the uh, number of beds in the hospital is no more occupied because you you are curing people where as there are no new people who are uh, getting affected so this is typically that wave which all of us experience and uh, this is a very simple uh, illustration around how that wave actually come, comes and and has an onset now if we consider another hospital over here hospital b and uh, let's look into the scenario of what happens over there we would see that the number of case loads initially are increasing as it is uh, in the in the earlier case also it was similar to what was happening in hospital a but then on the 21st day if i am unable to actually cure a particular patient and exit them then i would not be able to take in a new uh, patient into the hospital so there would definitely be a lot of these untreated uh, yet confirmed cases which are out in the public and they are the ones which would now be my major worry because those cases can since they are not within the cure system they are not within a hospital system where they are administered medicine under a close observation so then these people would start spreading all of this uh, tremendously and then then as a result of which uh, more and more people are getting affected and then this is going to aggravate the whole problem so let's look into this scenario as to what this was happening and what could have been a way out 
So one of the reasons what we believe is that hospital A actually found out that most optimal way of treatment. So in, in terms of an optimal way of treatment, it is basically hospital A knows how to really treat people so that they have an exit time at that period. Whereas hospital B does not actually know how to do that. So if there is some sort of a working group created with these physicians who can share the knowledge across each other, then hospital B would be able to benefit from the knowledge of hospital A and uh, really complete this treatment over here. Now, if we look over here, then let's, let's see what kind of things they were observing. So say I am looking at two different groups of patients and I am looking at two different factors, which is their age and weight. And I'm seeing whether uh, what is their response or likelihood of response to a certain kind of treatment given. So we put down three different kinds of treatment and then we have these different age groups. So in the patient group one, you would see that uh, treatment B is something which is found to be more successful. Whereas in patient group A, treatment uh, patient group two, treatment A is found to be more successful. Now, this typically is what uh, a physician typically does within the whole purview of evidence-based medicine. So you essentially group them based on symptoms and then prescribe a medicine. Now, this whole thing also has a mathematical outcome associated with it. So it's typically called as the posterior probability of a treatment's outcome uh, provided a certain patient group or a cohort which is uh, marked over here. So that again is something which we solve traditionally within what we call as the Bayes theorem. So the probability of success of a certain treatment for a given symptom can be said to be equal to the ratio of the probability of uh, the, the particular symptom um, given that I have grouped out their symptoms based on a treatment, the probability of administering that treatment divided by the probability of encountering a certain symptom. So let's, let's try to uh, demystify each of them over here. So they have certain names. One is called as a posterior probability, another is a likelihood, there is a prior probability, and there is a evidence. So if you want to demystify and give down a simple illustration, then let's look at this one. So in case of hospital A, in the first three days, we see a certain number of patients who are there in the hospital. And what we do is we break them into two different categories. So we categorize them based on age, and then we also categorize them based on weight. As a result of which, there would be four possible combinations which can come down over here. Now, on the fourth day, what I do is I get a patient, and now looking back into what happened in the last three days, we want to see whether what kind of a treatment we need to administer to that patient. This is the problem which we'll have to solve. Okay. So now what I see is that in the last three days, the I got down three patients. These three patients, uh, each of these three patients were in the age group of 20 to 40 and in the weight group of 50 to 60 and in nowhere else. So this is what I see. So now if I get a patient on the fourth day, who is in the age group of 20 to 40 and in the weight group of 60 to 80. The problem is that in this particular age group, we had never encountered any patient in the past. As a result of which, my evidence is zero. And now that my evidence is zero, I will actually not be able to find out what is my probability of treatment. And this is the major problem, what, what hospital B was actually facing. So they could not really narrow it down because they did not have a cohort, a, a very uh, sort of like structured and similar in nature cohort of patients coming down to them. They would see a lot of variability over there. Now, typically, this is what we call as statistical insufficiency and the theorem based on which we came up to all of this uh, final outcome is what is called as the Bayes theorem. So let's look into what we could have done. So what they, they could have done is like one is you could be grouping based on your symptoms and treatments together. 
So one of the possible ways of symptoms was like whether there is fever and there is cough or cough. So there can be four possible groupings over here. But now, if I can take down some of these pre-existing conditions like hypertensive disorders or the a diabetic or not, then there can be another four possible options. Now, these four possible options clump with the earlier four possible options will give us this joint observation space over here of symptoms and pre-existing conditions taken together, which makes it 16 possible combinations. Now, from there, if I have, uh, say, two different drugs and two different devices which are administered in order to cure this patient, then I would have four possible treatment options which come down over here. Now, together, there are 16 and there are four possible treatment options. So, now you get down this kind of a matrix which has 64 possible entries of uh, looking into your symptoms, pre-existing conditions, and uh, your uh, outcome as well as treatments taken together over here. So, now that there are 64 possible combinations over here, we will have to fill it up appropriately. Now, in order to fill a particular matrix which has 64 possible entries, it would take you with one patient per day, it would take you minimum 64 number of days in order to solve it out. So, what that essentially means is that you will need to have this hospital open for 64 days or two months in order to be able to solve it. Now, imagine this scenario. So, for you wait for patients to come down for two months, you need to have that same number of beds and then you are experimenting and nominally you might have at least one, one such case available to you and not all the cases available over there. So, now here comes the problem. So, if that is the scenario, if this is the scenario on which we are looking over here, then any, then the rate at which treatment could be done is now be going to become very slow and there would be a lot of those untreated patients. In fact, in the early days of COVID, this is what exactly we were looking at. Now, the only other way of solving this is that if multiple hospitals who have access to this information actually share this information across with each other, then only they will be able to really uh, uh, benefit from each other by being able to complete this. Now, that brings us to the point as to why we need to have this kind of a common data format. So, if everybody starts recording their data in a different format, then even if they share it, they are just sharing a, what we call in very simple terms as data dump. And a data dump is, is something like a dump yard. So, you are dumping everything but nothing is of any tangible use to the other person. So what that means is that now we need to have some sort of a common protocol established, which is adopted by all hospitals, which want to share their information over there. And once they are able to do it, then you would see that even on a daily basis or, or just after two days or three days, you would have sufficient data to fill up this complete matrix. So this matrix and how you fill it up is essentially that reporting and data system which we want to build up around over here. So once you're able to do that, that solves it out. But the next problem is that still there are mixed reviews and a lot of things which go around over here. So there are journals out over there which have different kind of uh, contradictory reports. But, but the good thing is that there are a lot of clinical reports at that point of time. So even in the early days of COVID, there were several of those clinical reports which were very easily available. And then one could read through those and try to come up with any of this kind of a common photo. So then there were challenges that there were contradictory findings. And there was also this operational challenge that CT was more of for the developed world, X-ray was more of for the developing world, and then a point of care ultrasound was for the underdeveloped world. So, building up something which is common across all of them would be a big challenge to take it up. But then, once you are able to do that, so this is what we wanted to do essentially. So, what we did is like, let's bring this task and structure out a document where we said like, we are going to record symptoms, we will record observations, and we will have a triage. So, this is essentially what it should be, a, a one pager over there. Now, once you have that, so what what can be done is that you can actually aggregate all of these uh, from multiple clinical reports and case notes and essentially also have these as searchable 
solutions available for future clinicians to make use of. So tomorrow, if there is somebody who, who comes out and uh, with a certain kind of a symptom and an observation, so you as a clinician can actually go on a clickable searchable repository and just find out all other people. So now from there, it, it unfolds this whole world of evidence-based medicine because now you have all the other patients who had certain of these kind of symptoms who were now visible and what were the treatment given and what was the success over there. So that really helps a lot. So how we did, it was very simple. So we initially started with building a platform in order to enable this solution to work. So this platform contribute consisted of one block, which was to contribute. So that was essentially building up a data port where people can actually send in the data, but there's not a data dump. So when we say data, it's not pure images, but it's images with annotations, with clinical dispositions, all clinical notes and everything coming down to us. And there was a structured form for collecting all of this. The next part was that using all of this, we were building out AI models, which were not just churning in information from all the clinical reports in order to build up the reporting and data system, but it was also uh, creating models using the reporting and data system and annotated data in order to do AI based uh, some sort of a pre uh, screening available over there. Finally, when all of this gets over, what we have is a structured set of case reports, um, the COVID-19 rats completely workable and clinical notes. And finally, uh, we had this option to share these AI models and white papers out over there. Now, in order to solve it, this was a bigger problem. We divided it into three different levels of interventions with AI, which we wanted to do using low level AIs like crawling, tokenization, and then spotting of keywords. Then a mid level ones, which were more of on the vision side of it in order to spot uh, and then uh, identify certain uh, uh, images and uh, serial images within those X-rays or CT scans. And finally, going to the high level one, which had more of like explainers within decisions and trying to discover even for newer features and patterns in the data itself. So if you want to see an example, then uh, you can look into it that what, when we were building this whole thing over here, so during the build stage, we needed to really get a lot of this data working out. So the whole aspect of web crawling was where you had a search engine working. You get down the whole uh, uh, journal article coming down over there. Typically these were as web pages. Now once you have these coming out over there, you need to do a content spotting and a saliency analysis, which is mark down uh, what is the caption and whether that caption is relevant from a radiology reporting perspective to that particular figure and whether the figure is a radiology image or not in the first case, whether it has sufficient clarity in order to be used for further training of models or not. Now, when we were doing that, uh, we got this text out over there, which was the caption. Now on the caption, we employed standard common data elements for radiology in order to find out what are the terms which are known and uh, also isolated the terms which are not known. So after tokenization and sparsing, we ran and got down our first version of RATS, which is a simple A4 sheet document over there. It went through another level of uh, voting and aggregation, which is it went out to a lot of people for using. So radiologists would use report and then they would give us feedback and then they would. And then what we did is like we really wanted to see whether certain of them were very ambiguous, some of them were non-ambiguous at all. And whether they were really relating to the triage. So in the second version, we really had the whole triage also built up in this way. Uh, finally, if you look into it, then there was this reporting and data system, which we had built up. And uh, somewhat about nine months later, around in uh, end of October, uh, RSNA also came up with their own reporting system. And interestingly, there was almost a one is to one uh, relationship between them. So the priorities which we had as assigned over there for the lexicons and the descriptors and what was assigned by the RSAD was also same. The only difference which comes out is that we employed these AI tools and techniques of data curation in order to create this RAT system in just a matter of a month. So while the Indian version of RATS for COVID-19 was available in March 2019, it, March 2020 itself, the RSAD one did not come 
until of end of october 2020 and a major reason for this delay is because the the process which was followed down otherwise is the classical way of arranging working groups and and debating between them looking at uh, commonalities and then finding it out while that is a very stable one i mean i am not debating against it in any way the only only thing is that it's very time consuming and possibly this is a point where we need to get into this one where the initial rats can be made up with an automated process and and the secondary stage of it which is where you need a refinement and a confirmation you can have the working group really come together in order to do that so finally i come to an end where uh, my only concluding statement is that it took us about 40000 years to come out of the darkness of caves and go to civilized spaces and not be afraid of darkness in any way and then it took us only 3 months of covid 19 which pushed us back into our caves and then it's it's good that we are now opening up but still we are in modes of webinars we are not yet uh, willing to have a lot of these kind of bigger physical meetings uh, and one of the ways is like we can definitely use a lot of these knowledge uh, which maps directly to actionable insights in order to solve it out and that's what we did in the covid-19 action group fusing in ai and human intelligence together to solve low level problems with ai and have higher level problem solutions and actionable insights discovery with the human in the loop which actually got us to a point where we could accelerate this discovery process so that's all what i had to say for the day i'm open to taking questions uh, from the audience thank you dr devdut so now participants can ask question so dr devdu uh, i am dr nipun so from here pgi so uh, you tried to collate it i mean uh, i really appreciate uh, the kind of work which you have done and uh, it's really commendable uh, you tried to collate the evidence or the data sets from different modalities like say ultrasound ct and x ray so uh, and to diagnose covid uh, based on these imaging aspects so uh, what do you think the major challenge was in terms of uh, validation or deployment of this model so see the one primary challenge is what we were solving over here essentially you did not have rats so when we started in march you never had a reporting and data system available so while we had a bunch of images they were not properly reported following a common standard protocol so that is a missing thing so that is one major challenge which we had to solve otherwise what happens is that i have something annotated by one radiologist something annotated by another radiologist and because they are not on the common format so i cannot train any ai models over them so once we could solve this one so somewhere around in uh, september of 2020 we started making this effort to aggregate and have a common data set and now this aggregated and common data set which we had had uh images and they were reported using this common format so now it's a binary reporting which is typically what is used for training any of these ai models now once that was available then it made it very easy because now we could get one radiologist to annotate it generally like much younger people they would, or or they would be like junior radiology residents or somebody who would do this annotation we ran it through some other radiologist who is a much senior one from a different hospital or somebody in order to just do a validation a very quick verification whether everything is properly reported or not this was the first level which had to be but if the data structure is not available then running this is going to be very time consuming actually so data preparation uh, seems to be very important stuff and which yes. you have really highlighted in your presentation and data is the key uh, for making the good models so uh, regarding the uh, you know the deep learning models which you must have tried so in your experience what do you think uh, beyond uh, convolutional neural networks are there any better models for image analysis or cnn is the gold standard so and we have actually uh, we have actually uh, moved way ahead from cnn so the the other paper which we already had in last is b was a fusion of cnn and graph neural networks working together and the reason for that is that um, you would have certain sort of a uh, disease incidence uh, which is very much demographic so as in an example like you would find more of uh, silicosis in places of rajasthan which do 
marble mining because of the onset of uh, that mining dust and everything you would have more of tuberculosis uh, somewhat around in west bengal where it's very predominant so these have will have different kind of patterns which ex already pre exist in the lung so this would be a baseline pattern and the baseline pattern would vary from demography to demography you will also have that varying from country to country from genetic predisposition to genetic predisposition now here comes the interesting part so if that is the scenario and also you have a lot of pre existing conditions which also have a certain demographic centrality available over there then we need to decouple them so what i am saying is that i will use all the data coming from all the corners of india into a common pool but then they might have their own niche correlations happening over there so in order to decorrelate the local things we used a graph neural network in order to understand only the common minimal baseline features independent of any of these local shifts we were using these kind of cns so this was a grouping which we had done later on now we have a paper which is under review actually so i cannot disclose much about it but it makes use of something which we call as self attention or self guided attention learning within neural networks so these are still deep neural networks but not within the typical preview of a convolutional neural network on top of it it uses a different mathematical function which enables us to do something which we call as a self attention model so uh, thank you dr devdoot uh, there is one more uh, doubt which i had uh, while i was uh, going through different literature on deep learning is called uh, use of transfer learning approaches and using you know uh, google based google net or vs vg net yeah. or to to train uh, you know small data sets so do you think uh, there is a disadvantage or advantage of using such uh, uh, models in deep learning architecture so uh, you know sometimes you can have a data set in hundreds or 200s you may not have in thousands so what do you think uh, in your practice or in your experience uh, is it helpful or what yeah so typically if you do a radiology to radiology transformation at the similar scale then the domain adaptation and transfer learning will work uh, in a sense that uh, if you have uh, trained models which are there in order to do uh, say uh, analysis on x rays of the lung and uh, this was trained on a very large data set and then uh, uh, use this particular pre trained model and update it in order to do uh, say x rays of the hand or x ray of uh, the skull or or any of these bony structures it might work out good given that they are still x rays and they have the similar kind of a resolution so one say one pixel on the digital x ray to a millimeter mapping that is almost the same if it is of the same order then it works out pretty well if you have a model which is trained on cts of the brain and you want that well trained model to get quickly adapted in order to work on ct of the heart it might not work but a model which is trained on ct of the brain quickly adapted to work on mr of the brain that will work out pretty fast because the anatomical structure the scale the resolution is almost of the same order so this is this is a thing which we need to keep in mind if you are taking natural image trained models like google net vg net which are there for image net kind of problems and you want to immediately use it on radiology uh, it's risky if you want it to you if you want to use it on uh, retinal scans for ophthalmology you want to you use it on digital path it'll work out pretty good because they are also rgb standard natural images which we look into it so it's it's just these things which need to be kept in mind at the end of the day every model can be transformed to the other one you run it for a sufficient time you know what are the tricks we we have by now this common collective recipe which we are now putting down in terms of a book of what to do where and then there we really said about all of this what we learned in the last 7 years of working on the field so there are strategies at the end of the day every model can be transformed to any other model it's just that it's not uh, wise to do it because your energy cost of compute is going to be very high so your electricity bills will really shoot up in a very summary point of view yes 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 thanks very much and uh, last important point is uh, how are we ready for prime time i mean are these models deployable at, at present scenario because we, what we are looking at is basically the user friendliness and and the at the ease of uh, you know the patients uh, at the bedside so are these models ready for prime time so uh, in the field of surgery there is already a lot of this ai deployment which is there in machines so if you look into intuitive surgicals davinci kits 
uh, Davinci already has a lot of this AI which works in line. If you look into brain labs uh, for their uh, gamma radiation for brain tumor surgeries, they already have this one sitting for surgical navigation and guidance. What we are looking over here is possibly in terms of diagnosis, whether we have it or not. Yes, there are. I do believe that they are they they are actually usable. There is a company called as Credible uh, in Bangalore. Credible has this whole suite of things which they do more of uh, as a customized solution for their clients and uh, predominantly for pharma industries and these are still preclinical. But there I have seen that it, it, so these are deep learning models again I'm seeing. So deep learning models, biggest problem is that this whole field of doing medical image analysis with deep learning is so new, just being five, six years old. Uh, we don't even have proper regulatory frameworks of how to test it out. So we are still in that early phase, but definitely with the programs which Niti Aayog has put into place for uh, healthcare AI deployments in India, I know that PGH Chandigarh is also one of the cohorts which does it uh, for the ophthalmology, your ophthalmology unit actually does it. So these are where we are seeing the early uh, light of the day. And uh, in the next five years, I, I believe India would possibly be the first country which will have a very comprehensive regulatory framework and body, uh, which can actually get a lot of these models certified and out over there in order to really speed up how diagnosis can be delivered. We have one last question uh, yes. from Dr. Savitesh. Uh, how to deal with unbalanced data in binary and multi-class classification? If we can use augmentation, then at which st stage we should apply augmentation? So there are two ways of doing it. People used to traditionally do augmentation, uh, but the only problem is that if your model is augmentation invariant, I mean, how you are augmenting. So if you have a CNN and your augmentation is just translation on the left, right, top, down, then it will not be of any use. So if your augmentation is say some sort of a rotation by 20, 30 degree, what we call as a rotational jitter, um, it may not be of any use uh, if, if you're doing CTs or MRs because CT and MR is pretty much an anatomically calibrated data which is taken. So you always know your anatomical landmarks are exactly going to be at that point. You can do that kind of a thing for uh, say microscopy data where okay, I mean blood cells even if rotated are okay. But then uh, if we are working on uh, say rotation equivariant networks, uh, then they don't need any of those augmentation. Uh, it, it's anyways what is called as rotational invariant or rotational equivariant over there, which takes care of it. There was another way which was quite in a boom for a period of time, which was weighted loss functions. So those classes which have lesser samples, you penalize their mistakes much highly. So that way you can really compensate for it. But what has really got the community right now, and this is where we as a group uh, really made contributions where we could show that there was a factor improvement. So when I say a factor improvement, it's like you have an accuracy scale up by 10% just by doing this trick or 20% by doing this trick. And that was going into the whole way of adversarial machine learning. Um, that's really in its infancy, I would still say, given that you will have to figure out what should be the adversity you will have to incorporate into your model. How should the data flow over there? And then, then to on top of it, all of these neural networks which need to employ adversarial machine learning will be based on dynamic graphs, uh, which makes it a programming challenge in its way. But then it is solvable. I mean, adversarial learning is what I would say is the way to go ahead now, uh, which takes care of a lot of these uh, challenges at source. Thank you, Dr. Debu. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was an amazing presentation. Dr. Meenu, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Devluth, for an excellent presentation. I think you made some of the very difficult concepts uh, understandable to novices like us, especially to the medical field. Uh, we really look forward to interacting with you for further simplifying, you know, our algorithms and uh, like helping us make some for all of us. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Dr. Meenu, for inviting me. It was a pleasure as well. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. There's slight change in the program. Uh, Mr. Trish Nindu Das Gupta, um, due to some technical reason, he's not able to join now, and he'll present at 3.15. And for the next presentation, we have Dr. Nipun, Var Nipun Varma, he is associate professor at the Department of Hepatology, PGI-MER. 
and is and is the key person in coordinating this workshop. Dr. Verma has obtained MD in internal medicine and DM hepatology from PGI MER and has done a short term training in liver transplantation from Pittsburgh, USA and recently done diploma in machine learning. He has received many awards like the gold and silver medals in undergraduate and postgraduate uh, programs and uh, other awards like BMJ South Asia finalist award in the year 2018. Major Amir Chand Gold Medal Award in 2018, Award for Best Research uh, by PGI MER for two consecutive years, Best Researcher Award at the Ninth International Scientist Awards on Engineering, Science and Medicine in 2021. So he has been managing the liver clinic, uh, pancreas and biliary tract disorders, including endoscopic procedures, and has more than 90 publications and several chapters in book and has supervised more than 10 project, projects as a principal investigator and as co-principal investigator. His research areas include liver failure, multi-omics, big data, artificial intelligence, telemedicine, and evidence-based medicine. So uh, today he's going to share his thoughts on reporting criteria for AI models. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, and it's my privilege to present this topic, uh, which is very close to my heart, which is the reporting criteria for artificial intelligence based models in uh, healthcare or medicine. So briefly, I'll be discussing uh, what is the motivation of artificial intelligence in medicine? Why, and why should we be doing and why should we be knowing about this stuff? What is the need for reporting criteria? What is the difference between the reporting criteria and the risk of bias assessment tools? There are various reporting criteria, so I'll be mainly focusing on two widely followed criteria and finally the takeaway messages. So as you know that artificial intelligence, machine learning and the trajectory is increasing over the last two or three years and it is exponential. And if we look at the PubMed search, it is showing millions of results. So what to do with such a data if we don't know how to interpret them, how to analyze them, how to apply them into actually a healthcare really bed, at the bedside. For that, we need to understand that artificial intelligence in medicine is not a new concept. It's, it's an age old idea. And initially the experts used to make rule based algorithms. That is if condition one, or condition two or condition three is present in a given person, then this is the diagnosis. So this rule based learning was made by experts and uh, which has now been changed with the tremendous evolution of algorithms and computers. And then there is an exponential increase in data. And according to a study, approximately the data is doubling in approximately six months to one year now. And to deal with such data, keep up with that data, uh, and especially if the data is coming from various domains such as clinical uh, images, histopathology, genetics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, health records, how to analyze all such complex data, the artificial intelligence is probably the way forward. Then there are different ways of artificial intelligence and we know that different type of uh, algorithms amongst this uh, broad umbrella term of artificial intelligence uh, which means that making the machines mimic the human intelligence and machine learning per se uh, and means that uh, the algorithms which make these machines to understand what, what the data is. So basically the machine learning is broadly divided into supervised techniques, unsupervised techniques, reinforcement learning and the transfer learning. So basically my aim is to tell the physicians or clinicians who are novice broadly what are the different categories of machine learning there may be many and there will be in-depth algorithms so i'll be broadly focusing on the key concepts during my presentation and then there are different successful stories for using artificial intelligence in, in medicine 
uh, it has been used for data extraction, real time warning of adverse events, diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy, classification of pathological images from histopathology, and then the COVID prediction as as uh, last speaker Dr. Dave Tooth has del deliberated on. So basically. Machine learning can be employed in decision making at every aspect and every step of decision making in healthcare. So, uh, what are the different steps which we perform during uh, in, in in our healthcare? First and foremost is the acquisition of knowledge and experience by a physician or a clinician, which we which we tend to learn during our our training period. We get it from books, from journals. Then we look at the patient symptoms and signs, look at their investigations, make the diagnosis, look at different treatment options, what are the pros and cons for different treatments, look at the expected outcome of given patient using a different uh, given treatment, and then we take a shared decision with the patient, sitting with the patients, discussing all the pros and cons, uh, and whatever the response of a patient is, that adds to our basic knowledge and experience. And then we use the same cycle again to treat these patients during our uh, our healthcare uh, system. So artificial intelligence is applicable at each and every step. And what is the problem we are facing at each step which can tackle, which can be tackled by artificial intelligence or machine learning as, as we can see in these uh, call outs is that in the knowledge and experience, we know that the data is exponentially increasing. There is a lot of data and the time spent by a physician is too high that we, machine learning can solve this problem by automatically, systematically reviewing the literature. And now we have the artificial intelligence based models, which can actually systematically review the literature and give you the precise estimates of the, the things which you want to look at in the literature. And the time spent will be grossly reduced if we use such kind of models. Then there are different models which can be used for assessment of signs. Like in dermatology, we have image based analysis for uh, and diagnosis of dermatological conditions. We have plenty of diagnosis based algorithms. We have different algorithms which, which we can use in omic data sets to identify potential targets of therapy. Then you can have different algorithms for predicting the outcomes. Then you can have different treatment options and experience, which will be increased after using such algorithms, looking at the patient's response. So these algorithms can learn through various healthcare data and can assist in healthcare practice and can reduce diagnostic and therapeutic errors, reduce the high, highly repetitive work and manage the wait times. So basically we have a high motivation of using artificial intelligence in healthcare. There is a trade off while we are using machine learning models in, uh, in application in clinical in healthcare. So basically the algorithms are dependent on three basic characteristics. One is the characteristic of a model is a speed, how fastly it can deliver the prediction how accurately it can predict the prediction, which is accuracy means that what actual condition is and the machine the machine model is actually telling you the same thing is called the accuracy. And the third important key domain of machine learning model is the interpretability. By interpretability, we, we mean that what the model is made of, what are the key ingredients or the key variables or predictors which are defining the model. Is, is, mean, is meant by interpretability of a model. So whenever we try to build up a model, we have a trade-off between these three key domains. One model may be highly accurate, but may be consuming more, uh, less speed but, and may be less interpretable. And the examples of such models are like advanced deep learning models. They may be highly accurate and they may be ha uh, having high speed, but interpretability may be lost. Uh, and traditionally, these kind of models were looked at uh, into as a black box model. But you know, the field is moving, and as we move forward, we have a lot of techniques for increasing interpretation of these models as well. But there, generally, there is a trade-off between these three key domains in the machine learning models. 
so before i move forward i just wanted to share because we have residents and fellows who don't know what are the different models and different algorithms which we uh, classify and this is just for them that uh, the nomenclature of machine learning models start with uh, first and foremost you look at whether you want to use the machine learning model for dimension reduction dimension reduction means that you have rows which are quite far in number as compared to you if you have more number of columns as compared to number of rows meaning thereby if you have more number of predictor variables than your uh, samples then uh, it is difficult for a machine learning model to uh, to analyze that kind of data so such a problem can arise in uh, basically multi omics data sets where you have samples in tens or twenties and you have genes or proteins in like 10000 or 20000 so there you can have a uh, multi dimensional data so that data can be reduced using machine learning models and there there are different machine learning algorithms to reduce that dimension protein uh, principal component analysis is very well known and then there are other uh, algorithms if your data is not aimed at looking of looking if if your data is not aimed at reducing the dimension then you you want to look at whether your data is labeled or not that is if you want to predict a outcome which is uh, which is labeled or whether it is not labeled so if the data is not labeled it is unsupervised learning and if the data is labeled it is called the supervised learning if the data is not labeled uh, in the unsupervised learning there are different algorithms and depending upon the structure of your data like say if there is a hierarchy in the data then it, you could you could use hierarchical clustering techniques and if you don't have that hierarchical uh, data then you need to specify whether you want to cluster the data into n k number of clusters and then there are different type of algorithms if the variables are categorical it is called k modes clustering if the data is numerical it is k means clustering and then there are model based uh, clustering techniques you know data latent class models also so broadly these are unsupervised clustering techniques where your data is not labeled right when the data is labeled it is called supervised learning and in the supervised learning if your target variable which you are trying to predict is is a uh, is a binary thing or a multi class thing then it is a classification technique supervised classification technique and which is uh, in this uh, left lower box and if you have that uh, supervised model which is trying to predict a numerical outcome or that a number like say a stock price or like say a number of any things number of covid cases in a year uh, that can be a regression problem so in machine learning ter terminology it is called the regression problem and depending upon the type of model which you are using for uh, answering this question if if you are looking at speed and accuracy this if the speed is if you want a high speed then the decision tree or the linear regression models can be used and if you want a higher accuracy then the deep learning neural network based models random forest models gradient boost models can be used whereas if you are trying to classify from a data set then you can have depending upon the speed you want to use uh, different models such as random forest or gradient boost or neural network and if you want explainable which i was telling you that interpretability is an important uh, trade off so if you want a more explainable model then you can use decision trees and logistic regression based models and then if the data is very large you can use naive base uh, supervised learning technique this is just for these people who who wanted to understand that where, what are the different type of algorithms and where we can use and this is this is freely available and anyone can click that link so basically coming back to the topic where why do we need the reporting criteria for ai models i came across this systematic review just recently published in bmc where they looked at 62 publications on 152 machine learning models in oncology and they found that there were many problems with the existing literature on machine learning models there were no standardized way of reporting the sample size was rarely justified only 8% studies 
were justifying the sample size which they used. Continuous predictors, which should have been used as such, were categorized in 39% of the studies. Predictors which were used in the studies were unclear or performed before univariable tests. Univariable tests, which you know that for uh, numerical tests, we have t-tests and uh, categorical, we have chi-square tests. Uh, for, uh, for, so, predictor selection was done in only in 13, uh, uh, was unclear and performed before an univariable test in 39% uh, of the studies. 59% of the models for time to event analysis did not account for censoring, meaning thereby 40% uh, times the models were actually doing the correct methodology and uh, calibration was not reported in 82% of the studies. So these are the basic prerequisites of a good reporting criteria, which was uh, good reporting, which was not uh, there in the uh, existing literature and less than 50% of models were reported or made available ultimately. So basically at this time when the literature is evolving, we should have a standard common platform for reporting all the machine learning models. So why do we need? This is very important for interpretation so that we have a same level and we interpret at each step what all studies are there in a given condition so that we make use of these studies at, at bedside. Otherwise, if the, if the reporting is not structured, then we will not be able to interpret such kind of studies. It is also important to maintain transparency in the research. Repeatability and reliability is dependent upon the reporting and it is mandate for publication uh, to have such standard criteria. Quality of study and risk of bias assessment is dependent upon how the study is reported and the downstream utility at bedside when you are trying to help the patients uh, using such studies on machine learning is helpful only if we have a standard reporting criteria. And this is also this is helpful for everyone in the state in the healthcare, including scientists, readers, editors, reviewers, and as well as repository managers to have a standard common platform. So there is a difference between a reporting criteria and risk of bias tool. These are closely related terms. So one has to understand that reporting criteria is a guidance on how to report a machine learning based model in a study. Whereas risk of bias is something which is a guidance on how to critically appraise the methodological conduct of the study, which is actually a part of quality assessment of a given study. How good the study was, right? The how, 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 how much was the risk of bias in that study? And bias, we all know it is a, uh, it's, it's a systematic error which takes you away from the truth. So if any study is not giving you the correct answer and taking you away from the truth is a bias study. So to assess that kind of bias and the checklist and tools available for that is called risk of bias assessment tools. And the reporting criteria is something which is which you require to report a given study for, for easy and interpretability and the reliability. So there are two different guidelines. One came out in 2016 and one in 2021. Each have its own merits. The first uh, reporting guidelines uh, which which came out was uh, by Luo et al. And this guideline nicely laid out how to report a machine learning based study. First and foremost, they they uh, they, they said that data, uh, what was the one, the study should clearly make uh, a point on what was, what is the study design you are using. Whether the data is collected before initiation of study, that is called retrospective study, and if the data is collected prospectively. That should be very, very clear because retrospective study designs have their own demerits. There can be recall bias, there can be reporting bias, there can be coding errors, there can be n number of factors confounding in, uh, uh, in, in, in retrospective studies. Whereas you can control for all these factors while we, we are doing a prospective study and we can make use of protocols and uh, variables which we are going to collect in prospectively. So prospective studies are always better for any analysis. Because if you try to build up a machine learning model based on retrospective study, it may not fit that 
better best on the prospectively collected data because there can be inherent biases which can be exaggerated while uh, making a machine learning model uh, in on a retrospective study so one has to be very careful second most important thing one has to see is whether you are trying to predict so all our predictive analytics are all our predictive models whether you are trying to predict event which is happening over the time in future that is called the prognostic model or whether you are trying to predict something which is there at the given time point which is called the diagnostic model and in the clinical practice the example is if you are trying to diagnose covid using an x-ray at a given point of time in a given cross section it is called a diagnostic model whereas if you try, trying to predict mortality of these patients using looking at the x-ray of a given patient at a given time but you are trying to predict a mortality after the end of 30 days of that that kind of a patient it is called a prognostic model so that is the typical example then you have to see whether you are trying to uh, use the predictor variable uh, uh, whether your target variable is is a is a classification problem or a regression problem which i showed you in cheat sheet also that if you are trying to classify into patients into groups or anything into groups it is a called a classification problem and there are different type of models for that and if you are trying to predict a numerical outcome or a numerical target variable then it is a regression problem these are the items which are given in that study in a checklist and we all know that in title we should be using uh, a term called predictive model and in the abstract one should go by the standard uh, objectives data sources performance matrices and the conclusion in the rationale of the study one should report uh, what is the clinical goal of a given study what, what you are trying to do review the current practice give the objective clearly and study the nature of the study well, whether you are trying to make a prediction or uh, whether you are trying to make a prognostic model or a diagnostic model what the kind of predictors are what the kind of uh, target variable are then describe the setting what kind of setting you are trying to make a predictive model whether you are trying to make a model in a community or in a hospital setup because your model if made in a hospital setup will not be generalizable to your community setup your model should should see all sorts of data and if that data is uh, uh, is not applicable or not generalizable then the model generalizability will be limited so if the model is trained or tuned on a given data set in a given setup the setup is uh, and, and the context of model is very very important because that type of model will only be applicable on the type of data on which it was trained then uh, in the setting one has to identify what type of data what uh, what volume of data and what duration of data was actually collected define the prediction problem i mean prediction problem i have already told what kind of target uh, uh, variable is 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 it numerical or is it a classification describe study being retrospective or prognostic identify the problem to be prognostic or diagnostic determine the kind of model which you are trying to make whether it is for classification or is for regression or is it for survival time to event explain the cost of misclassifications that is very very important one has to understand that uh, when, when we are reporting any machine learning model one should make a clear implications of of that model's outcome if you are trying to predict mortality the false positives may not be that problematic as compared to false negatives so false negatives would have more grave implications uh, in making such models defining the quality metrics and what type of metrics you are using for assessment then there are different techniques for model building you try try to identify what kind of data you are using what kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria did you use Describe the time span of the data and the cohort size. Define the observational unit. Each and every predictor, predictor variable should be defined and the definition should be clearly laid out in the protocol before uh, uh, you know, uh, reporting that kind of uh, and collecting that kind of data. 
which may be difficult at the times in uh, retrospective analysis, but in a prospective, it is a must thing. Describe the data processing techniques which we have used for cleaning and transformation. Because before cleaning, because, because this phase is very, very important in the model building uh, phase, data cleaning and transformation, because the model performance is highly dependent upon the type of data and the cleanliness of data which you have used. Describe how you have, uh, you know, taken care of missing values. Define the basic statistics which you have used, like basic univariable and multivariable statistical test which you have used. Then define what model strategies, validation strategies you have used. And model validation is one of the steps which is mandate to check for the performance of uh, how good a model is behaving in predictive, in, in making predictions. And there are different kind of validations broadly, internal validation and external validation. Internal validation, we mean that if we, we are making a model in a given data set, and we are trying to use the performance matrices and looking at the performance of that model in the same data set by different techniques, it is called the internal validation, right? Training in the same data set and making use of its performance in the same data set is internal validation. Whereas if you are making the uh, perform, if you are making predictions in a new data set, which is not seen by the model at all, it is called the external validation. Specify the strategy internal validation and we have different strategies. Commonly used, described is uh, cross validation, K fold cross validation where data is split into different folds and like say K folds and then the model is built upon K minus one folds and uh, validated on the last fold which is uh, not used for uh, model development. Then what are the different matrices for uh, performances which you are using? Sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive, negative predictive value, ROC curve, area under ROC curve, each has got different meaning. And there is a whole lecture series on how to use such uh, performance matrices. What does it mean? And describe the calibration as well. For retrospective studies, people generally tend to divide the data set into derivation and validation set and some people divide it to derivation test uh, derivation validation and test set so i'll be coming upon that also then after uh, describing the steps of model building one should define how the model was built whether the uh, independent variables or predictor variables uh, were used in Toto or you selected a given set of predictors using feature engineering or feature selection, whether you used independent variables, which, which had a single value, which was, uh, which was, uh, which was unique. And sometimes what happens, uh, if, if, if a predictor variable has a small number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, values, like, like say, if you have hundred observations, and out of those hundred observations, you have only three or four being positive and uh, for a given predictor. And if that three or four positive uh, finding is there in a, an, in, a, in a given set of classification, like say you wanted to predict mortality. And if you are trying to see, let's say, uh, platelet count of less than, you know, 10,000. And let's say the platelet count of let less than 10,000 is there in only four or five patients out of 100 patients. These less than uh, 10,000 platelet count in four or five patients and all these four or five patients can be all non-survivors or, or dead patients. So this type of predictor is sometime uh, uh, given highest importance in machine learning model. This is called a perfect in separation problem. But this is, this is a kind of problem which can happen and there are different ways to handle such type of problems. Identify redundant uh, independent variables. What type of technique which you followed for removing the independent variables which are redundant or highly correlated, you should mention all those steps. Identify the independent variables that, that suffer from perfect separation problem. Report the number of independent variables, how many were them, how how did you excluded 
some of them you have to explain all the stuff assess whether the sufficient data is available for a uh, good fit of the model how good the model is for classifying the patients define the performance matrices specify the model selection strategy and uh, after model selection report the final final model performance in the validation set define the clinical implications of that model what was the limitations of the model what was the uh, uh, potential pit, pitfalls which could happen during interpretation of model all those steps you, you should uh, you should report in a given study and un unexpected results if uh, come out of a machine learning model you should make guess of them and report it into your discussion part in in your uh, paper report uh, uh, collinearity between the predictor variables as well as the uh, target variables uh, i would like you to go to this paper for going in depth about perfect separation problem and what is the k4 cross validation as i have told perfect separation problem i have given you one uh, one example where uh, low platelet count and prediction of mortality uh, i gave you one example uh, we can discuss in panel discussion later on and then there is a new criteria which has come up in 2020 which is an improvement on this previous uh, reporting criteria and again their aim was uh, first to direct direct to give a platform uh, or a reporting criteria so that direct assessment of clinical impact of machine learning models can be made uh, and uh, making the data more fair and bias free and uh, second was to make uh, use of such kind of reporting platforms for rapid replication of technical design of uh, of any uh, ai based study so basically uh, these criteria are important and this is really helpful and if you can see in this uh, flow chart they did they said the pipeline for model development and deployment should be given in a given publication in these format in the part one one should describe what is the study design then how the study uh, the data set was segregated into train or the test set how the models were built on the train set and validated on the validation set or whether validation set was absent only cross validation or internal validation using bootstrapping etc was done that one one should report how the model was optimized using different hyperparameters that one should report and after that they they should report in part 3 and 4 the uh, performance of that model on the test set how uh, good the model performance was and the performance can be checked into various domains as i have told one and first and foremost is the discrimination which actually tells you how good the model is at segregating patient, uh, the sample whole sample into uh, a positive case and a negative case if if we are trying to look at a classification problem after discrimination and this discrimination can be measured using c indices and uh, area under the curve and uh, apart from this kind of performance assessment there are different other assessments which includes uh, calibration which in, which which is measured by with various ways one of them is uh, calibration plots where one could see in a bar graph in a, in a in a line diagram uh, between predictive risk and the observed risk one can make a a, a a line diagram or a scatter plot or there are more sophisticated and uh, you know uh, statistical tests which you can report one of them is hosmer lemshaw test or uh, one is another is uh, a briar score which one can use so this is called uh, calibration and after calibration then there are different easy to use matrices which uh, performance matrices which one understands uh, everyone understands in medical language is the sensitivity specificity positive predictive negative predictive values and uh, then there are advanced machine learning performances which which include uh, dice coefficient right and uh, many others but these are commonly used performance matrices and one should report um, um, at least uh, three of them and then uh, one should report model explanation which is defined by the model interpretability 
and model interpretability explanation means that what are the key predictor variables which are making the machine learning model and then there are different techniques of uh, using the, uh, of uh, explaining a given machine learning model variable importance is one of the basic key uh, criteria and the other ones include shapely additive explanations uh, so broadly there are these can be uh, uh, global or uh, uh, localized and global may they, then there are uh, these techniques such as uh, variable importance, shapely additive explanations, and uh, local uh, uh, explanations can be sought whether a given predictor or a given case is describing the positive or the negative uh, outcome. Then in the explanation phase, one can also uh, describe the model sensitivity in, in different subgroups of uh, participants. Models prediction can be given in different tertiles or different quartiles and model explanation can be sought in uh, what are the two best predictions made by the model, what are the worst predictions made by the model. Everything has to be described at least in two different uh, ways. Uh, and finally, end-to-end -end pipeline completion should be given uh, by you giving uh, either the whole code or uh, a machine, virtual machine, which, where one can actually uh, make use of that machine and make the predictions in real time. So there are different uh, in-depth uh, reporting criteria, which which will be there in uh, next slide, which I'll be coming upon. So again, in this criteria, they they have given a checklist based on the study design, what type of data optimization was used, what was the performance matrices which was used model examination at least two different techniques should be shown as i told you and uh, there should be a discussion on the uh, what type of explanation uh, uh, and the relevation relevance of explanation used and uh, how robust is a model is is given by this uh, model explanation phase only like say uh, uh, we built up uh, recently developed a machine learning uh, model on a uh, you know a data set of uh, liver failure patients across 50 Asian medical centers, and uh, we tried to use model explanation in that using different techniques. Uh, one of them is the shapely additive explanations, variable importance, and uh, there we showed that uh, the top 10 performing uh, variables, when refitted again into a, a, a ARC AI model, which we developed as a web-based application it was highly uh, you know uh, hi highly uh, well performing model and it was able to classify patient 90 percent of the times so though the accuracy was close to 92 percent and uh, you know the OROC or the c index was 96 percent in the external validation set so that was highly rewarding and uh, we used this explanation part of a machine learning model and the machine learning model used in that study which we, we made was the extreme gradient boost model uh, and apart from that we also made 10 different models but extreme gradient boost was the best performing and this model explanation actually told us what kind of predictors are actually making uh, the uh, machine learning model and we leveraged that kind of predictors to make a new uh, easily deployable web-based application for machine learning models. So model explanation is a highly relevant topic for physicians. So what, uh, you know, to come, to bring the machine learning models out of black box, that's what uh, the machine learning models explanation part is very, very important. And it is also there for deep learning models. Some people feel that it is a black box, but now there are techniques uh, uh, and grad cam is one of them. And there are many other techniques which we can use for model interpretation in deep learning models as well. And finally, choose the appropriate uh, tire of transparency. One could share whole complete code, but oftentimes it is a trade secret and people don't share it. And there are often ethical and uh, legal implications for that. One could uh, uh, opt for tier two, where a third party can evaluate for the code accuracy, fairness, and uh, whether the, uh, the code can be shared with in a 
with the whole community in a GitHub repository or somewhere. One can uh, release a virtual machine, which which we made as a web-based application, where one can just put in the you know the uh, the variables and uh, get the outcomes or the predictions in the real time. And one may choose no sharing with give, giving the uh, you know the justification why the people are not sharing the uh, data sets or their codes. And finally, uh, I'll just briefly touch upon uh, that the risk of bias is different from, you know, the reporting criteria and risk of bias can be assessed using this ProBAS tool, which was given in annals of medicine. And this is for all kind of prediction models, not only for uh, machine learning models. And uh, there are different questions in that and uh, the questions are pertinent to how good the participants were, whether the predictors which were used were correct, what was the quality of predictors used, what was the kind of model which was outcome which was uh, predicted whether it was uh, appropriate or uh, not the kind of set of analysis which which people used whether it was uh, appropriate or not and then there are signaling questions and one can assess what is the risk of bias and uh, not only that after the uh, risk of bias one one has to look for the applicability of that model and whether that uh, model is uh, applicable in all three domains uh, of participants, predictors and outcomes in a given study and make a overall assessment of risk of bias of, 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 of machine learning or a prediction model based study. That kind of uh, risk of bias assessment tools are also available and they are different from reporting criteria. That's what my aim of uh, showing this slide is. And finally, the take home messages of my talk in, are uh, that standardized reporting criteria is critical for publication and legitimate use of artificial intelligence based models in healthcare. Transparency, reliability, repeatability, scientific rigor, and unbiased, clearly justified reporting. Unbiased, clearly justified reporting are the key elements of standard reporting. Key stakeholders must be in, involved in the healthcare for developing and disseminating the results of AI models. It is not just the physicians, it is a collaborative effort as we previously mentioned by Dr. Dutta, that it is, it is the collaborative effort by physicians, computer scientists, programmers, statisticians, as well as our colleagues and the patients. We have to involve patients also because you know, the ultimately we are kind and we are using these models in uh, on patients. So, their perspective should also be looked at and reporting criteria must be differentiating from differentiated from risk of bias or quality assessment criteria. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Nipun for a very crisp and clear presentation. Let's see the chat box if we have any questions. So thank you, Dr. Nipun, for relating to us what is going to be the shape of things to come or what is going to be the shape of data to come and uh, how we will have to treat data and analyze it and then synthesize it into, a, a, you know, a interpretable form uh, using uh, machine tools and artificial intelligence. I think uh, now things have started becoming a little clear. Could you just uh, uh, elaborate how can artificial intelligence be applied to the process of systematic reviews? So, uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for this question. So, artificial intelligence has been employed, already been employed, and there is already uh, uh, some companies have come up with the solutions at different steps of uh, systematic review. First and foremost is the data screening and uh, extraction of the data. So mm. people have come up with the systematic, you know, screen, uh, systematic literature search and as well as the extraction of data. Both the mm. things are there and it is there uh, freely available uh, on, on Google. Then after that, for the meta-analysis aspect also, people have used the meta, uh, machine learning algorithms and we also used it in one, two of our studies where we have used, uh, uh, you know, the clustering techniques, unsupervised clustering techniques to 
uh, identify outliers in a given meta analysis and there we showed that uh, in one of the studies which we were doing at uh, is in the uh, you know the relative risk of mortality due to fungal infections in patients with cirrhosis we find, found out that the uh, you know heterogeneity quotient i square was 95% and when we tried to use this machine learning algorithm in that and we identified only three studies which were potential outliers which was causing this heterogeneity uh, based on uh, algorithm techniques these the, the names i will tell you later but these three techniques we we found three studies and after removing these three studies the I, the heterogeneity was totally abolished to 0% and we found out that the three, these three studies were actually uh, indirect evidence so uh, uh, indirectness was there in those studies so actually machine learning is helping in meta analysis and mm. identifying the heterogeneous studies as well so in uh, systematic reviews it's also making a huge uh, impact uh, i think this will be uh, this particular point will be very very useful so we can pull the data from different studies so provided the, they are not very heterogeneous so ma'am uh, i just wanted to share this with you last week because you know they are open for collaborations and they are testing their software for uh, automatic data extraction so matlab we can also collaborate with these people and uh, you know make a differential strategy we can do the traditional way of systematic review and we can do using machine learning and see how much time did it take for uh, both the steps and what was the accuracy of each step that that's the way forward i think i think uh... uh you've given a very important uh, very important techniques and messages and procedures to all our group who is dealing with evidence based medicine and uh, we also now can uh, you know things will become much clearer later on when whatever artificial intelligence work we've done on our patients of asthma which will be discussed in the afternoon session in the practical session where dr anil johan will be presenting his data Uh, so i think uh, it's it's something which should always be discussed and we should start looking at our research data as well as clinical data from the angle of uh, using it for you know for predicting future uh, occurrences or having uh, predictive models as you've said so thank you very much it was an excellent talk and uh, we really uh, really it's really nice that you are here today with us So uh, I think now we'll be breaking for lunch. I think uh, Pinakshi, you can make the. Yes, ma'am. We'll break for lunch now, and uh, I request all the participants to join back at two p.m. sharp. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Testing up there. Testing up. The message I think like a button. Hello. Is it? Tick. Okay. Is it? Is it? Hello. Hello. I think I'm good. So, Yes, you are audible. Okay, perfect. All right, then we are all set. I think I have already shared my screen. I will not move from. I'm I'm sitting at. I'm sorry. I am in. Um, I'm not in my office right now. I was in in a meeting in ICMR, so I'm just uh, taking this from a different setting. So if there's any issues, we can uh, we can try sorting it out right now. So okay, if you can hear me uh, and if you can see in my slides, I think we should be set. Uh, sorry, we uh, I stopped the, uh, your presentation because uh, we have to introduce you. Uh, no, no problem. I'll, uh, the only thing is, I will then have to move uh, back. That's okay. I mean, so yeah, as I said, I'll have to move uh, to to uh, make my presentation in the full screen mode. That's completely fine. Sure, what are going to do? Share I think one key side said we setting over here. I'm good. Hello. 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 Hello.
Hello, good, good afternoon, Dr. Tarpritesh. Very nice to have you on our workshop. Uh, Dr. Nipun will introduce you. I think we can start, Nipun, now. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, I welcome uh, Professor uh, Tavpatesh Sethi, who is an associate professor, founding head and center of excellence in healthcare, uh, IIIT Delhi. And uh, he is focused on bridging human physiology and computation for next generation medicine. He is working on big data for clinical decision supports, machine learning for critical care and community medicine, human physiology, teaching interests include uh, statistical and complex networks. He is a visiting faculty at uh, Stanford University School of Medicine between 2017 to 19. He specializes in uh, improving outcomes in neonatal, child, and maternal health by bridging medicine and artificial intelligence. He has authored over 20 research articles and has been a recipient of MIT uh, India Innovators Under 35 Award. And uh, he's a Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Early Career Award awardee. He is an uh, editorial board member of uh, PLOS One Systems Medicine and various other uh, journals. And Dr. Sethi is a member of European Associations of Systems Medicine. And uh, over to you, Dr. Tav. And uh, really uh, interesting to see your presentation. And uh, Dr. Thank Tav. you, thank you, Dr. Nipun, and thank you, Dr. Dr. Minu Singh, so for having me here. I'll just quickly um, go in the uh, presentation mode on my presentation. Um, stop share. Kar stop share. Kar share. Share. Google Chrome. Wala. Nee, upar wala. Yeah. Upar wala. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I, I actually am uh, outside and uh, taking this uh, from a different. Uh, thank you so much. Taking this from a. Uh, uh, a different institutions. So, uh, sorry for some of the glitches that uh, I'm so being um, uh, clunky about it. But uh, I'm looking forward to a very interactive session. Please feel free to stop me anywhere. Um, so, I will be talking about learning AI models from heterogeneous real world data. And Essentially, my talk is going to be focused around some case studies. More recently, we have been working in the COVID space. My previous work has been in the neonatal and uh, pediatric uh, space. That continues to be a strong focus, but over the last couple of years, I think our focus has been more on the public health um, space in which we have published numerous uh, uh, new uh, findings. So I'll speak about some case studies and what were our learnings from working with these heterogeneous data sets in, um, in clinical and public health settings. So our group at IIIT Delhi is basically focused on addressing these three gaps. On the bottom left, you can see there's a data gap. Essentially, we don't have the right mechanisms for uh, recording and uh, warehousing data sets which are routinely generated in healthcare. And we do have a lot of data which gets uh, generated, but also routinely lost. Also, it's a time consuming process, which means clinicians do not have the time and we need to have better technology mechanisms to, um, to essentially enable some of this. And our work has been around some of that. I'll speak about our work at AIMS and for COVID. Then we also work towards knowledge gap and bridging the challenges um, and skill sets that uh, we, we lack, not just in India, but I believe across the globe across uh, these two very different uh, areas of medicine and, uh, and and machine learning or medicine or computer science. So we do train people at this interface in our, um, in our institute center uh, through various programs at undergrad, masters and postgrad levels. Thirdly, uh, we also address this gap of what do we do with this machine learning models once they're actually made? How does it make it, how do these make their way to um, actually designing some interventions that can then change or influence outcomes. So making decision platforms, predictive models, evaluation strategies is also what we, uh, what we specialize in, but all from the standpoint of uh, digital and AI ML uh, in, in the healthcare settings. Uh, 
So with that background, I will start with one of the projects that we basically I would talk about where heterogeneous data sets was the biggest challenge. And this was in COVID and in March 2020, we basically when we got hit by COVID in India, we started everybody started asking this question that um, how can we mitigate this problem and the pandemic by modeling, right? And by by building data science and AI ML solutions, the challenge was there were no really uh, homogeneous sources of data <clears throat> that were available at that point of time. And also the data are all scattered. Multiple institutions would collect this data, multiple clinical institutions uh, like PGI, AIMS, uh, and other institutions collect these data, but there's no mechanism how to use and share these data for collective uh, understanding and building models. So that's where I think I'm sorry about, I think the link for the platform was below the screenshot, which has got hidden, but it is called Federated Health Platform and it is live and hosted on our uh, server at Triplity Delhi. I'll be happy to share the link later. But the goal, goal here was to integrate heterogeneous data sets and learnings from there to create uh, models, which can then uh, guide our policies and strategies. Here I'm just showing these three solutions on the platform. If you go and look at the model zoo page, so under research tab, there are community data sets and uh, and research uh, and model zoo. So uh, the model zoo has some of these models that we have put out: strain flow, evidence flow, vaccine, and more are coming. But these are peer-reviewed, published papers and models that we have made publicly available for addressing COVID. And I'll speak about some of these. For example, the strain flow model reads the COVID genome sequences using language models and like transformers, and basically then predicts what strains uh, may be coming up and, and how may the caseloads look like. Similarly, evidence flow uses language models to synthesize evidence from the high volumes of text data that gets uh, generated as uh, peer-reviewed articles. And, and maintained by WHO as a resource. Vaxim is a reinforcement learning simulation platform for, for learning how to optimize resource allocation. Like, how do we distribute COVID vaccines? Now, this may not be a big problem, but when we were actually designing and thinking about this platform way back in August 2020, at that time, there were no uh, clear mechanisms or uh, um, uh, thinking available around this. Under the research tab, you can also look at community data sets, which are heterogeneous data sets, may include language data, text data, um, sorry, language data, imaging data, signals data, and these are public, and we are, we, are, we are integrating them to create uh, solutions. So this is what we have there. COVID-19 Data Commons Toolkit is what we are currently uh, working on. It is not published yet. It is early stages, but we already created some uh, AIML based uh, functionalities, which you can find uh, when you click on the COVID-19 Data Commons Toolkit. Essentially, this is about 6,000 heterogeneous data sets where we are trying to uh, synthesize evidence from using AIML. And this uses uh, transformer models. As you can see, the BioBert embeddings are the transformer embeddings that, that learn to understand what these data sets are and then to guide the process of uh, data merging and synthesis too. So along these lines, and this project uh, is essentially a project that was supported by the Principal Scientific Advisors Office as a part of the Delhi Science and Technology Cluster, where IIIT Delhi, uh, we are leading the AIML for Healthcare Vertical, along with other uh, uh, collaborating institutions like CSIRI, GIB, AIMS, IIT Delhi, Ashoka University, JNU, et cetera. So the goal here was in this Delhi Science and Technology cluster, uh, the research data sets are fine, which are posted publicly by other researchers, but can we also build mechanisms for exchanging data? For example, if AIMS wants to exchange some COVID related data set with let's say Max Hospital. And at, I mean, now this may sound not that important, but if we go back to April 2020, this was the biggest question that, how do we collectively solve this problem? And how do we have these mechanisms that are smooth and not paper based? Can be uh, digitally uh, uh, exchanged and the governance mechanisms are in place. So we created on the Federated Health Platform frameworks, which are NDHM compliant. 
and dhm as many of you may know is a national digital health mission now it is also called abdm the ayushman bharat digital mission and the ndhm sandbox has a lot of uh, uh, i mean the, we can use the functionalities to say for example if if a patient clinical data needs to be exchanged uh, there is a two level consent framework that we can then call using our platform and it will provide a functionality a front end essentially to say that okay if this clinical data needs to be exchanged the hospitals need to consent and the patient also needs to consent because that is what is the consent manager framework uh, uh, that that basically uh, is is kicks in uh, when when these data are exchanged so we demonstrated that this is possible across different sites now we are building upon this to actually see if this is uh, if if this can be used in some of these clinical settings we'll be honest about it essentially uh building this is easy but getting the hospitals to exchange data as you would understand especially covid data is extremely tough so but we are working towards this with the help of uh, uh, the psa's office and and multiple organizations where we can we have we, we, our frameworks are in place and we are we are trying to look for collaborators where this exchange can can be seamlessly built one quick uh, piece is that <clears throat> as a platform although this is hosted and uh hosted at triple id delhi servers we do not we do not have i mean we do not store any data so if pgi uh decides to exchange a set of patients data with aims uh, we do not host any data at, on our on our platform we just enable a handshake mechanism but what just comes is then basically the summary of what gets exchanged for example uh, the the aggregate aggregate statistics of what got exchanged so we do not we are not a data uh, sort of a, a repository for clinical data sets just to be i mean uh, have clean governance over our platform um sorry so going back so this was the integrated federated health platform which we built as a part of the covid-19 uh, initiative but then we started building the artificial intelligence uh, solutions towards it and then I'll, the first case study i would like to present with heterogeneous data makes use of language data and that's as heterogeneous as it would get as you would see now this is called washkaro and the goal of this project was to de deliver the right information to the right people in the right format at the right time this project happened before covid it was an outcome of uh, what we were doing in the pediatric icu at aims and our goal was to actually target that a lot of readmissions in the icus happen let's say from the walled part of delhi where socio economic education all of that is low so how do we get the relevant information to the relevant people who are living there in the right format and when covid struck this washkaro project actually became very important and we repositioned it for covid and the goal here was to combine two very different heterogeneous data sources one was the who reports or the ministry of health and family welfare guidelines later for covid and um, i think so i think i'm missing a slide here but i'll talk about it right now and then essentially to create a learning system where we say that we use language models to match um uh, uh what who is saying and what was what was happening in the news so there was a lot of misinformation in the news about covid so we used ai models to actually do summarization uh build metrics for matching their humans actually uh, evaluated the metrics and with the final models we developed an application an android application that provided that information to people in hindi and english so i'll have some uh, findings later uh, but this was using language models we also used language models to to address the genomic surveillance of covid-19 variants with language models and machine learning as the title says this is recently published in frontiers in frontiers in genetics and essentially what we say here is that just as language models can learn to read language we know that our genomic sequences also have codons and words and these words have a grammar because there is sharing of uh, there's correlations between how dif different codons actually mutate because when the protein folds there has to be certain coordinated set of mutations that have to happen we've seen that in the spike region where most of these mutations are coaxial which means it is not a random phenomena 
but current models do not exploit this. So he said, can we use language models like the word to work model and the transformer models to learn the grammar of these codons and, and be able to actually understand the genomic sequences better. And this, these models were trained on more than 1.7 million uh, sequences from the GSAID resource from 17 different countries and uh, including India. And then essentially uh, started with, with 0.9 million and then basically the validation sets are, are ongoing and currently we have one, more than 1.7 million. And these data sets are added every, every day. So we did a phylogenetic analysis with our uh, underlying as, 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 as we can find distances, right? We can say as documents, we can say, how is this document similar to that document on the base of the grammar and the word usage, right? Similarly, we said, how is this sequence as a document different from that sequence? And using that, we were able to replicate the lineage in a completely de novo fashion and were able to reconstruct the phylogenetic tree and also reconstruct how the spatial uh, patterns are. And the paper has actually much better uh, findings which got updated after the reviews and you can uh, uh, refer to that. So essentially we, we, we show how the, uh, how, the, how the findings were captured in a de novo way without experts having to label the lineages. And then we ask the next question. Now we have learned the grammar. Do some patterns of the grammar predict the future development of strains and maybe their uh, uh, impact in terms of number of cases. So we developed a causal model where we said that um, I will look at a certain grammatical dimension of the COVID-19 sequences and see if that dimension was leading the number of cases in that country ahead of time. It could be two months, three months, four months ahead of time. And we found that there were certain dimensions. For example, I'll show a dimension which does that, the entropy of which actually changed two months before the number of cases started rising. So that is what you can see on the right hand side. And this is actually logical because when a strain is evolving, the entropy, the, the changes that happen, it actually goes in an explore exploit cycle. So it explores the mutation space. And then basically you can see the entropy, the red line goes up once it once it reaches a certain level, it starts exploiting and essentially gets established as a dominant strain. That's what happened in Delta. That's what happened in, is happening in Omicron. And that's what our models were able to capture way ahead of time uh, in a completely data-driven manner. That certain dimensions, the entropy of those were able to have the exact pattern, as you can see on the right-hand side, for, uh, uh, for going up and down two months ahead of time before the cases rose. And these are the models. Uh, the top right is the entropy of dimension 32, which you can see is a, is a very uh, nice uh, capture of the number of cases ahead of time, validated across multiple countries. And on the bottom left, you can see the machine learning, the analysis of what dimensions actually contributed. So entropy of dimension 32, 27, 28, et cetera. And this is a lead lag analysis, so it is causal in nature. It is not just a correlation. This is uh, available as a dashboard, which is called strain flow dashboard. It actually got quite, uh, quite highlighted. Um, and through the PSA's office, we, we, uh, we presented this at NSACOG and uh, essentially we, are, um, uh, we have been able to capture the Delta Omicron, and, and I think in March we said that cases will, will cases will go up in, uh, in February we said that cases will go up in March and April. So if you go and visit our current dashboard, you'll see that our predictions say that cases are going up, and the ground reality is that cases are indeed going up in, in India. And then it is true for other countries as well, Germany, Japan, etc. On the right-hand side, you see a heat map of, uh, you can look at each of these dimensions and say what codons actually contributed to this. So it gives more interpretability to our analysis. This is the transformer model that we built after that. I'll not have time to go into this, but what we are doing now is uh, the previous work does not allow us to say where, because ATC may occur at multiple locations, but where does ATC change happen that leads to the downstream? So we are using transformer-based embeddings to actually look at the locations as well, which is very evident in this uh, image, as you can see. Uh, this is unpublished, but uh, we are submitting this paper uh, 
uh, soon and hopefully the preprint will be available soon as well. So uh, on the left hand side, you can see that there is a sentence called the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Right now, how do these models know that the word it was refer referring to the animal and not to street? There is uh, uh, it, if I change the sentence to the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide, then the it word refers to white, uh, the street, right? So, uh, so, so these kind of models are now become very, becoming very popular mainstream. These are transformer architectures, GPT-3, uh, BERT, all these embeddings are based on these. But on the right hand side, you can see that we use this approach to see what in COVID spike region sequence, what attention mechanisms, what are those uh, places where the model is paying attention to? to understand uh, other places to look at, just like the sentence on the left. And we have created an attention map, which will, which, which actually is giving us sort of a molecular, uh, an in silico molecular scissors to say that if I change this location, what happens at other locations? As I said, this paper uh, is, uh, um, it will, 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 be, will be available as a preprint online soon, but um, uh, is not published yet. So, but already we see that on the right hand side, you can see our previous strain flow embeddings are in are in turquoise and the covert embeddings are in red. So we are already seeing much better resolution with such kind of language models, which can learn these positional influences also. So I think I'll speed up a little bit um, and uh, talk about some other things as well. So I already talked about Washkaro uh, initially where I think the slide was misplaced, but uh, where we where we use language models to summarize WHO and news articles and generate similarity scores, but this is a slide uh, uh, that that I was referring to, and 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 the, and and in the app essentially the users were uh, were were allowed to give feedback like thumbs up or thumbs down. So imagine yourself in April 2020, and you are searching of searching for information. Does COVID-19 spread by fomites, right? And uh, the app will give you some uh, matched articles. Uh, and then essentially, if you find that useful, thumbs up, otherwise thumbs down. So we saw that this was, ve this was very intuitive, but over the period of three months, on the left-hand side, we show that our thresholds for model evaluation and model selection actually got better. And our model actually became much better when, when people were giving feedback, thumbs up and thumbs down. So our relevance scores increased over time for the time period which we were online. So we were online with the app for three months. After that, Google's policies changed and Google did not, I mean, they did not allow any uh, non-government apps to spread COVID information. So our app was also taken down. But then we were reinstated as a tuberculosis app because we were actually existing before COVID. So, um, so essentially what we found here was that we found some very interesting insights on how to create AI enabled public health messaging systems and build this feedback into them and actually learn with them. On the right hand side, we also saw some very interesting patterns, more females engaged with the app in Hindi than males. And more males in generally, uh, in general, uh, 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 interacted with the app. So there were about 11,000 users in those three months. And uh, this is published in scientific reports and uh, uh, now, is, uh, now is being carried out for tuberculosis in a small pilot study. We also built AI models for understanding how to create better messaging systems from, from heterogeneous data such as um, uh, bulletins, COVID bulletins and uh, Twitter, right? So we created these two data sets, Corona India data set in the wave one and in the Delta wave two. And then we analyze these data sets for lexical patterns. These are not sentiment. These are lexical patterns which are more nuanced. And these lexical patterns, for example, anger, sadness, fear, health, confusion, war, fight, etc. We found how do these interacted with what the government was saying versus what people were talking about on Twitter just to help us design better public health information systems. This was published in Frontiers in Communication. Uh, and we saw some very interesting patterns across different states of India uh, and lead lag analysis to, to talk about in which state, what was leading what, was, 
was anger, for example, more prevalent in a certain state? And was it being contributed by Twitter or was it being contributed by government bulletins? Those kind of questions. Um, we also use similar language models, as I said, to build something called evidence flow. This is published in uh, 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 GMIR. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, it talks about how to build models that will read the literature to predict emerging trends. And essentially, I'll not spend a lot of time on it, but you can see those uh, each of the each of the nodes in the network is a word. These words come together to form modules, clusters, and these clusters change over time. So you can imagine hydroxychloroquine forming a cluster early on, right? But then going away. That's exactly what we did in this paper. And, uh, and this is how it looks like, right? So early on in August 2020, we were able to actually say that COVID has a lot of systemic complications like thromboembolism, uh, acute kidney injury, coagulopathy, et cetera, uh, just by looking at literature evidence and being able to synthesize. And the heavier the uh, importance, the, the, the more it will sink towards the bottom. And this is an ongoing, uh, this is published, but the dashboard is on uh, online, evidenceflow.tavlab.triplitd.edu.in. Uh, and essentially, uh, we found very interesting insights about vaccines, insights about uh, neuropsychiatric complications and so on, which you'll find on the dashboard. I'll briefly talk about other kind of heterogeneous data sets, which we don't have in the public health settings, but we have in the ICUs. And this is a data set that we have we have uh, uh, catalyzed at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in the Department of Pediatrics over the last uh, uh, six years now, and this is a project uh, uh, essentially that was supported by the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance uh, with Professor uh, Rakesh Loda and myself as the lead investigators, and so we asked this question: Can we actually create and create a data uh, rich ICU? because we know that ICUs generate more than a gigabyte of data per day. I mean, depending upon the size, our 8 petted ICU generates uh, about this size, but it is also routinely lost. So there's a window of opportunity, which we need to uh, essentially leverage to be able to make predictions about how are babies or children doing in time using these data. So over the last uh, uh, five years, six years, we have actually warehoused more than 1.8 million patient hours of continuously monitored data. This number is slightly old and it is ongoing. And now we are actually working towards making these data sets uh, public over the next two years, which is a huge amount of work, but uh, uh, we are working towards that, which will be the largest uh, pediatric publicly available data set for, uh, for, 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 I think, global settings. Um, we started really lean. We did not employ any commercially available uh, products, Philips, or I mean, we had monitors which are mind ray monitors, but, but we wrote our own pipelines and we wrote, wrote our own software, essentially uh, for which a company like Philips charges about $3,000 per bed uh, per year in a place like Stanford. And essentially, we built these data pipelines to record every second of data for these uh, children in the ICU. And since we were able to do that, we were able to actually build in the quality metrics that you can see on the top right, there's a sensor came off. So we got a mobile phone alert that this bed data is not flowing. Right, and, and all of that. So essentially, we then built very simple uh, sort of uh, dashboards for the for the ICU. And this, this dashboard is for NICU to just tell which data, which beds are giving the right quality data. How is the antibiotic usage like? Is the baby in the right oxygen saturation range or not? Because 88 to 95 is the is right range. Beyond that or below that, there are complications. And uh, uh, this was uh, published as a quality initiative study, I think, way back in 2017. And uh, 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 and and essentially, we 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 uh, we then moved on to develop models which are more predictive in nature than just dashboarding. So these predictive models are based on time series, vital time, vitals time series, which look at uh, range of data and then basically predict what is going to happen six hours down the line, eight hours, 12 hours down the line. 
So this is one example that we uh, published, and a couple of them are in pipeline, I think in advanced stage of peer review, actually three that are in advanced stage of peer review and hopefully they'll be out soon. But uh, uh, but I'll talk about this, which is based upon thermal imaging. We said that as clinicians, we know that um, shock uh, is, a, is a common complication that kills uh, uh, patients in the ICU, especially hemodynamic shock. It is also, uh, shock index is also a predictor of many other outcomes, not just uh, uh, hemodynamic shock. Uh, um, and, and, and we said that can we monitor shock index and then can we build systems that can actually predict early onset of uh, shock, shock index actually being in the uh, in, in going in the wrong range? So uh, we built thermal imaging models, which said that uh, is, what is the difference of temperature between center and the periphery of the body? Because as clinicians, we know very simple clinical hypothesis that center is warmer, peripheries are cooler in shock. Can we just capture that using computer vision and using the vital data sets. So we did just that and our AUCs for capturing these different in very noisy images like this was about 98% uh, for capturing of the body parts and then for building models for 0, 3, 6 and 12 hours. We were able to actually, I think I'm, uh, yeah, so we were able to actually uh, predict with 75% PPV uh, the onset of shock up to 12 hours ahead of time. I'm missing the slide here, but you know, the paper talks about more about that. Now, this paper uh, is an extension of this. As I said, a couple further three studies are actually in the pipeline, which make use of videos, which, which make use of vitals. And this is a special study that I always like to cite because then we took this um, vitals-based analysis to a very large uh, ICU uh, database, which is more than 200 uh, ICUs across the US. And we built models on that. And then we asked the question, what can generalize across different settings? It should not just work at AIMS. It should work at multiple heterogeneous ICUs. So we, in this paper, we have learnings about uh, how to build such models and what works and what does not. Uh, here are some of the findings. We, you can see cardiac, cardiothoracic, cardio, uh, 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 the, the medical ICU, medical surgical, neuro, uh, surgical ICU, etc. And then uh, we talk about what actually, what are the uh, learnings for us for generalization of such models across different ICUs for the prediction of shock index worsening in the ICUs. Now we are actually also building models which which address a variety of conditions using transformer models, but that's in process. Um, finally, I'll I, I know I have only four for five minutes, so I'll just talk about uh, uh, a simulation based study that we did. And this study made use of models that you may have heard about, which are called uh, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is the same kind of model which is used to train computers to play Mario games. And for example, used by uh, Google Alpha Fold 2 to predict fold, uh, I mean, protein folding. And this is the CASP challenge where the uh, Google uh, Alpha Fold 2 actually achieved the best uh, uh, in the best state of the art, which was order of magnitude higher than, than convention, which actually experts said that the protein folding is now a solved challenge, which was a grand challenge in biology. But we asked a different question. We said, uh, can we use heterogeneous data sets to simulate and, and create reinforcement learning models to simulate how should vaccines be distributed across different states of India? And this is... Uh, 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 recently published in Intelligence Based Medicine, a preprint, uh, and the dashboard were available since uh, September of 2020. And then we didn't even have vaccines at that point of time. But we thought that when vaccines come, there'll be a scarce resource. So how will we actually learn how to, how to actually distribute them? So the rider is we did not have any information in this model on how many doses of vaccine, what is the kind of the vaccine, is it a, a chick embryo, based vaccine or is it a uh, is it a RNA, mRNA vaccine, whatever, right? But we had some very basic thought that can we make use of the context of that state where we need to distribute the vaccine, like how many cases, death rate, recovery rate, what is the population size of that state? How many susceptible people at a given point of time in that state? What is the overall hospital beds in that state? Overall ICU beds in that state, ventilators, and age distribution. So these were very generic context parameters that we fed into our 
uh, deep Q learning model as context. As you can see, it is as heterogeneous as it can get. And then we started seeing, and our, our optimization was, can we now say that, how do we how do we distribute the vaccine so that we mitigate the pandemic overall in the country in the fastest possible manner? That was our objective function. As you can see on the bottom middle, you can see that our models were learning. On the bottom right, we always saw a positive number of cases prevented. Beyond a naive strategy, naive strategy being that wherever there is more cases, send more vaccines, right? And we also compared this with the distribution uh, allocation uh, with, with how the vaccines were actually distributed. But in, in 2020, we, we, we formed a naive strategy and said that uh, we, we showed that we will always prevent a positive number of cases if we actually uh, took an AI-based approach. These positive number may be in thousands or maybe in lakhs or maybe in tens, depending upon what phase of the pandemic we are in. So the dashboard is online. It's called Vaccine and hosted on our labs web server. And you can see we used reinforcement learning, genetic algorithms, hill climbing, simulated annealing, and this is now published in intelligence based medicine. So I'll just summarize. I know I'm running out of time. So essentially, heterogeneous data sets. I just presented some case studies that how heterogeneous data sets led us to create models, which can which can look at these very different kinds of data, such as so, uh, such as the language data. So the structured data, images data, and different kind of models can be actually combined together to make predictions, as we showed in the ICU-based studies, right? And most of most of times, what we have is structured, unstructured, and reinforcement learning scenarios. But what I presented was a different viewpoint to how to integrate heterogeneous data sets using uh, models, which are more uh, on the lines of. Uh, combining embeddings and pre-trained embeddings with supervised kind of scenarios. So, so essentially those are important to create multi-pronged uh, models. And finally, structured data are very important for clinical decision-making for pandemic or any other uh, scenario as well. So I'll stop here. This is my team, I think only partly, but, uh, uh, and the funders who have supported through this, uh, and I'll be happy to take questions. And I think uh, apologies for running slightly over time. Dr. Tav, it was really an amazing presentation and uh, it actually opens avenues for physicians and uh, computer scientists as well as computational biologists and you yourself being a doctor, you are working in this area. It's, it's so encouraging to see, uh, you know, the people and as residents, uh, whosoever are listening, they can pick up this area also as a as a future prospect. Thank you very much, Dr. Tav. And, uh, it was really uh, eye opening presentation. So, uh, do we have any questions uh, on the chat box? Okay. So, Dr. Tav, there was one uh, question earlier during the day of, uh, how to prevent data leakage uh, as a problem in uh, time series models. Uh, uh, can you elaborate on that aspect? Absolutely. I think that's a very important question. When you are having time series, you need to make sure that the same patient is not the, a part of the uh, of the development and the validation cohorts, even at different time points. So we ensure that because what I mean that actually it's a very simple problem. We we do a uh, we do an ID based. Uh, it, it's just like a stratified random sampling that we do, right? So essentially, we have patient IDs. And then we say that the same patient cannot be a part of the uh, validation cohort at any point of time in the cohort. So it's actually a very uh, straightforward question. If you are cognizant of this problem, uh, that um, the same uh, person's data may actually make its way into the system, uh, training system and the validation system at a later point of time, which also points out that the need for having some sort of identifiers, even if the data are pseudonymized, in longitudinal studies, we must have uh, some sort of identifiers. And I think they, with initiatives like NDHM, where we have patient IDs and consent frameworks, I think that's a strong push. Otherwise, we will see that uh, if we don't maintain that distinction, public health models or the clinical models will be, will be over optimistic. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Meenu uh, Singh, please. 
Dr. Neenu, are you there? Meeting me. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Tav, it was uh, nice to have your presentation, and it it was really helpful for every one of us. And and we are looking forward for collaborations, and we have certain projects going on. So, looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nipun, for having me here, and I look forward to collaborating with you as well and PGI colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let's proceed to our next speaker. For the introduction of next speaker, we have our chairperson, none other than Dr. KK Talwar. He needs no introduction all, uh, as well, but uh, we have to formally introduce to our participants. Dr. KK Talwar is the chairman uh, and the PSRI Heart Institute, New Delhi. He is the Hon Honorable Advisor, Government of Punjab, Haryana, Medical, Coun uh, Medical Council of Education. He is the former director of PGIMER, Chandigarh. He is the former professor and head of the Department of Cardiology, All India Ames, uh, All India Medical Institute of Sciences, New Delhi. He has published more than 231 papers and 236 abstracts in the international and the national journals. He is also a recipient of the Padam Bhushan in 2006 and he is also a recipient of the many, uh, many other international and the national awards like Arya Bhatt Award, BC Roy Award. He is the Lifetime Achievement Awardee by the Cardiology, uh, Cardiological Society of India. And uh, other special achievements of his, uh, he has initiated the evidence medicine uh, in the country and the established its, its utility in some other parts uh, of the country. He is the prime cardiologist of, for the first heart translate, uh, transplant in India. He is the first to implant ICD uh, and for that he, uh, he has been listed in, in the Limca book of record in the country and also Southeast Asia and the first to introduce CRT implant in 2000 in the country. A very warm welcome to Dr. KK Talwar. I would like to uh, invite you on the behalf of telemedicine. Over to you, sir. So much, uh, for this very kind introduction. Um, but I think we have a very important session and uh, a distinguished speaker, Professor Amandeep Singh Gill. And uh, I think uh, as I have been given, uh, I just share with you what is his uh, kind of has been involvement. He has been. Uh, ambassador permanent mission of India to the CD Geneva full time since July 2018. He was earlier joint secretary disarmament and international security. He is uh, also has been the minister disarmament. So I have a very distinguished kind of a position that he has occupied. And uh, I learn he's a uh, BTEC from Punjab Engineering College, which is very adjacent to the PGI. And uh, of course, then he had uh, his PhD from King's College. I'm told, I think, very, you're all privileged to have you, Dr. Amandeep. And I think you are talking on a subject, uh, the digital innovation in health sciences. I think these are to some of our, uh, those who are in the medicine for a long time, these are you know, areas which are new to us. And I think uh, probably this is the, uh, we talk of artificial intelligence in medicine or digital innovation. I think these are the subject of the day, and we all look forward to hear from you as, uh, regarding this particular aspect. And thank you, Dr. Amandi, for this uh, uh, privilege to all of us. Over to you, Dr. Amandi, please. Dr. Amandeep, is he there? Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I work with Dr. Amandeep, so I think uh, he may be a, a minute or two late. So I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. I'll just reach out to him. Okay, ma'am. And do we wait? Yes, sir. Yes. 
is Doctor is Doctor Amandi visible? Is he on the network? Ma'am, he is going to join within five minutes. One of her, his colleague confirmed his participation. Jayshyam, uh, do you have any uh, information about Dr. Amandi's? Uh, Yes, I've just reached out to him and uh, he'll be joining in a couple of minutes. So we'll have to keep you waiting for a little while. For two minutes or so. Looking forward to sort of hear this. Uh, I hope it will be over by 2.15, no? No, 3.15. 3.15, yes, sir. Okay. 3.15. It was supposed to be over by 3.15. He's joining in the next 30 seconds. Oh, there he is. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Apologies for this technical hitch. Took me a while. Thank you, sir, for joining. You've already been introduced by Professor KK Talwar. He is their uh, former director of PGI and uh, currently chairman of cardiology in uh, PSRI Institute in Delhi. And he has several uh, uh, things to his credit. He's been former chairman of Board of Governors Medical Council of India and also head of cardiology in AIMS. So he already introduced you. Uh, anyway, Dr. Minu, I think uh, welcome, Dr. Amandeep. We all look forward to uh, listen to you, as I mentioned before you joined us. This is one subject which is the subject of the day. Of course, many of us don't understand the ABC of this particular subject, and we are trying, trying to now learn about it. So I think whether it is a digital innovations or artificial intelligence, we all look forward to uh, look forward to hear your uh, sort of expert input on this. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandir, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Talwar, and thank you, Dr. Meenu Singh, for this opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, first of all, uh, happy Vesakhi to everyone. Uh, it's um, it's a pleasure to address this forum. I come from Chandigarh, and uh, actually I was born at PGI Chandigarh uh, okay. many many springs ago. Uh, so it's um, it's a personal uh, privilege to to address uh, this uh, this forum today. 
Dr. Talwar, yes, you know, this field appears very complicated. Um, and uh, I think one of our aims uh, in IDARE, the institution that I represent today, is to demystify data science and AI and make it easier for those who are clinicians who come from a health background uh, to get access to it without having to do another degree in computer science. Uh, so what I will share today is essentially about what is this beast that we are dealing with, uh, what is needed uh, to make it work for everyone, because it shouldn't just work for one type of people. It has to work for health workers. It has to work for our communities, for our citizens, and it has to work for the policymakers who have to consider what to invest and how to go about this. Let me start by first talking about what this beast is. Uh, so back in the 1980s, uh, when I was studying engineering at uh, PEC Chandigarh, uh, we did coding uh, and some of it was uh, uh, fairly advanced uh, and not so well known outside of uh, the charmed circle of computer scientists. But this was essentially uh, software combined with data that was giving some outputs. Uh, there was AI already at that time, but it was considered very esoteric. What has happened in the last 20 years is that what was esoteric in the 1980s has become commonplace. And the shift really compared with the earlier generation of software is that instead of the software or the code being an input alongside data, you have a desired output that becomes the input along with the data and gives you the code, a model, if you will, an AI model, which you can use later on uh, with data uh, to predict uh, the outcomes. So in cooking, you know, when we make uh, bread, uh, we always start with some starter. Uh, same thing for setting uh, dahi, uh, yogurt, uh, curd at home. Uh, you need a, a small, uh, let's say, taste of the output to be mixed with data or inputs to get what you want. So this is essentially the nature of this uh, beast. And uh, I have simplified a lot and my apologies to the many experts, uh, uh, Tav and uh, uh, Krish and others who are listening in. Um, so this is simplified AI, but this is what it is. Uh, now, it also tells you right away that this is not uh, sorry there is uh there is... So thank, thank, thank you so much. Uh, so le le let's get back to our understanding of AI. So this is not uh, superhuman intelligence. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, Hollywood fantasy, uh, but it's simply augmentation of human capability. Uh, and therefore, we should not get deluded about uh, the nature of AI. Uh, we should look at it as uh, simply a way to perform some human tasks uh, which are difficult for our cognitive systems uh, uh, to, to do. Uh, for example, if you look at any modern hospital today, the data that's being generated across the various departments, uh, it is very hard for uh, people to, uh, to comprehend that. Uh, again, to give you a very current example, if you look at um, the um, uh, COVID variants, uh, so for an advanced uh, expert in uh, genomics uh, to have these thousands of variants in the head at the same time, it's very difficult. Uh, and whereas AI uh, can do that, 
uh, can lo look for patterns and then present those patterns to this expert so that the expert can take better decisions. So this is what I mean by augmentation. So this is not replacement. And as the you know saying goes, uh, AI will not replace radiologists, but radiologists with AI will replace radi radiologists. So this is the essential nature of AI. Uh, now with this understanding, let's look at what can make it work. Um, and uh, in our work at IDARE, we've been uh, looking at several pioneers. Uh, last week, I was in Finland uh, at their biggest hospital called Hoos. Um, and uh, there they have for the past six years taken a very strategic approach uh, to AI. Uh, something very similar um, we've seen in our travels to Israel. Uh, and also we see uh, that strategy now being unrolled uh, rolled out uh, across India. And so what is this strategic approach to AI? I think the first step in this uh, is preparing uh, the uh, foundations around data. Uh, data is the food of AI. Uh, without data, there is no pattern recognition. There's no smart AI. Uh, and this data has to be cultivated almost like uh, uh, a field, like, you know, a farmer cultivates the field. Uh, uh, there is uh, irrigation, uh, there is uh, uh, fertilizer, uh, there is uh, harvesting, and there is then uh, the separation of the chaff from uh, the grain. So there are several steps to getting to where we can say this is now food ready to be consumed by the AI. Uh, and any uh, health setting, whether it's a public health setting where policymakers are interested in population level um, uh, trends. Uh, and again, you know, uh, we have uh, several experts, including Dr. Thakur in this audience who, who do this. Um, uh, then in a hospital setting, you could have uh, banks of images. Uh, coming from the oncology department, uh, data coming from the path labs. So this data uh, foundation has to be prepared well. There has to be um, some standards for data, quality standards. Uh, there has to be encouragement of data sharing if departments within a hospital do not collaborate with each other uh, to put together uh, data banks, which all of them can eventually use then the power of AI is going to be limited. Uh, so there needs to be a deliberate strategy to prepare the data uh, foundations. And when I say farming, you know, and fertilizing, then, you know, there have to be some ways to trigger the data flows. And today, uh, you have diagnostic machines uh, that lock up data. So these are proprietary machines, so they lock up data. That's why in our work at IDEA, we are looking at open hardware uh, so that data flows can be more open. Uh, openness uh, and flow comes at a cost. Uh, and we have to be mindful of that trade-off. And that cost is often the privacy um, of uh, citizens, uh, patients. Uh, it is also uh, the um, uh, protection of IP that certain researchers may have spent years developing something and if their data leaks without and is used by someone else without proper acknowledgement, uh, then we have a problem there as well. So data flows, yes, but well-governed data flows, secure data flows, data flows that are used in accordance with the regulation. I mean, we have an act in parliament that uh, should happen soon. Uh, similarly, in the EU, you have the GDPR and other pieces of legislation that, is on, uh, that are on the table. So this has to conform to that. The next step in a strategic approach to AI uh, is uh, what I would term as transdisciplinary collaboration. Now, if you have only one kind of experts doing AI, uh, then that is not going to result in powerful, impactful solutions. Uh, as in an actual uh, healthcare encounter uh, where different kinds of expertise come together. Uh, there is the cardinal role of the physician or the surgeon, but there is also 
um, the nurses, uh, the uh, uh, the administrative staff, uh, the uh, various uh, experts who look at uh, biomarkers. Uh, and then there are, there are the social scientists and the behavioral scientists. There are the public health experts. So a transdisciplinary approach to AI is essential if we are going to get to good results. The next step uh, is benchmarking and evaluation. Uh, there is a lot of snake oil out there. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a study that has looked at AI models used during the COVID pandemic. And uh, the unfortunate reality is that most of them were not properly benchmarked. So it's uh, above 90% were not properly benchmarked. They were not evaluated in the field. They had uh, performance indicators which were too technical in terms of data science and AI. So they worked on paper, but they actually did not perform well in the field. So whatever comes out has to be properly benchmarked, properly evaluated. Uh, and the process itself has to be defensible uh, from the problem definition in context to uh, the data farming to then the model development and then it's testing and uh, evaluation. The last enabler that I would uh, like to emphasize today is governance. Uh, now, AI is a very powerful technology. Uh, it is a general purpose technology. Uh, so like we regulate all technologies today, whether it's civil aviation, so um, baggage belts, uh, security at airports, uh, how many hours can a pilot sit behind uh, the console, etc. So there is a host of regulations that has come into being. Uh, some of it is national, uh, parts of it are international, managed by ICAO in Montreal. And then a lot of it is at the industry level. The industry manages, you know, when should we change the tires? What kind of uh, rhythm for inspection of engines, etc. So these three levels of governance kind of come together nicely to make sure that we have a safe and comfortable flying experience. Similarly with AI, governance would be essential uh, for us to have a safe and fruitful experience uh, with AI. And this governance cannot be just top down. It has to be at the institutional level. So a hospital like the PGI has, uh, in terms of research, its own IRB and other uh, um, uh, processes to ensure that research is carried out in an ethical uh, uh, scientific manner. So similarly for AI, there will have to be institutional governance mechanisms uh, combined with national mechanisms and some areas where there is ambiguity, where no one really knows what uh, happens, there would be a role for international uh, norms, uh, principles and approaches coming from the WHO or the OECD, which is very engaged on uh, AI uh, uh, principles. So this is a thoughtful way to uh, to develop uh, AI uh, applications. Let me just um, focus for a few minutes on what can AI do? What should we focus on? So if we understand AI, if we are uh, in agreement about a thoughtful strategic uh, approach, uh, and we are in agreement that a country like India um, uh, needs to embark on this, um, uh, not to be left behind, uh, but also to leapfrog as well. There are some areas where AI offers the potential for leapfrogging. Then what are the areas we should uh, focus our uh, AI efforts on? I think if you consider the public health situation in India, we have a tremendous problem uh, with human resource. So there is a shortage uh, and I've heard different figures, but let's say up to a million doctors are missing in India. We need a million more. And if you look at the, um, the support staff uh, from physiotherapists to nurses, uh, probably we are short of uh, uh, eight to 10 million more. Uh, so how do we provide quality healthcare uh, to the masses when we have such a massive human resource shortage? And this shortage is particularly acute in the rural areas. 
you know, I'm from a family in which we had doctors. Uh, so there was always, you know, when you were a young doctor and you have children going to school, you know, how long can you serve in a, uh, in a rural setting without affecting the education of your children? You know, those kind of questions come up naturally. So we have an, a, a more acute problem in the rural areas. And I think AI can help us uh, bridge that transition. Obviously, we are ramping up our capacity. Um, you know, uh, in my earlier role at the MEA, we often used to say that uh, we are not uh, constrained by availability of uh, technology. We are capacity constrained. You know, we need so much and we are only able to do so much every year. So I think we need a bridge and the uh, AI applications can offer us a bridge to, uh, to that stage when we are more comfortable with uh, human resource. So more assessments that can be done by ancillary staff so that you don't have to have uh, the in-presence uh, uh, requirement of an expert. Uh, that is something that can be done. And this is an augmentation on top of the existing telemedicine efforts. And Dr. Minu Singh is well aware of those. You know, the e-Sanjeevni platform, it's uh, seen a lot of growth during the COVID time. So these are capabilities we can add on uh, there. The second area, uh, is uh, the um, the arena of what in the West is often called personalized medicine, uh, uh, but in India it takes on other forms. Uh, so if you look at rare diseases uh, and uh, having spent time with uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Anurag Agarwal, you know, he's thought a lot about the 7 crore, 70 million odd people who suffer from rare diseases in India. If we can speed up the diagnosis uh, from the average of six to seven years that it takes today uh, to six to seven months by bringing in uh, genomics data in particular into the diagnosis early on, uh, earlier on using AI, then that's uh, a really a transformative um, uh, outcome for the Indian setting. Similarly, blindness, leprosy. So there are these many areas where we can bring about more diagnostics equity and uh, uh, bring more productivity into the lives of our, our people. Uh, you know, if you just aggregate the productive years of life that are lost because of late diagnosis, late treatment, you know, from TB, which has been uh, seen a tragic resurgence of sorts during COVID-19 to these rare diseases, you know, that's something that's crying for attention uh, today. Uh, the third area where I think there is tremendous scope uh, for AI uh, is in public health and public health related decision making. Uh, we lack uh, data uh, that is aggregated, that is high quality, uh, that is also uh, in line with the uh, the reality on the ground and reaches policymakers in real time. There's no point having good data two years later. If it cannot uh, squeeze into your policy cycle, into your decision-making cycle, uh, that uh, is often quarterly or even monthly, uh, then that data is of little use. Uh, so uh, there is a way in which we can shorten that pipeline between the reality on the ground where different programs have been rolled out, whether it's nutrition for children or wash infrastructure, etc. Evaluate the results and then bring the feedback back to uh, the policymakers so that they can tune their policies in real time and they can also affect some cost savings. Uh, because traditional methods uh, result in a lot of expenditure. Preventive health measures in particular um, are, um, uh, are not prominent enough. Uh, so if we can use data, and if we, you can use AI uh, to analyze the data and present the right insights, uh, develop the right dashboards for policymakers, we can really transform our public health uh, policy making, policy implementation, and policy evaluation. Uh, so those were uh, the um, uh, the thoughts I wanted to share with uh, you today, and I'm happy to um, receive any comments, feedback, uh, questions. 
Uh, I did not go into what we, we are doing um, in India. Um, uh, so that would have been an abuse of this forum. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, we are very, very invest invested in IDEA in democratizing the digital health and AI opportunity, particularly for uh, low and middle income countries uh, such as India. And we are doing this through strong partnerships on the ground. So it's not a top down, you know, Geneva thinks, Geneva decides, Geneva funds type of an approach, uh, but through these hubs and uh, very proud to have a hub co-hosted by Triple IT Daily and CSIR IGIB in Delhi. Very proud to have partnerships with CMC Bellore, and very, very proud of our partnership uh, that's coming together nicely with the government of Punjab around uh, uh, an exploratory project uh, called Open Health, which uh, seeks to think beyond the current telemedicine uh, paradigm. So thank you very much, Dr. Talwar, and thank you, Dr. Minu Singh. So much, uh, Dr. Amandeep, for this excellent uh, present. I mean, talk and as far as making us understand to some of us the, what is this uh, new field that I think is emerging, and of course it has a potential in the health services. And you have tried to focus on a couple of areas where I think they can be more. I mean, the beginning uh, it can be the most stressed upon or worked on. I think, uh, Dr. Mino, I think we can have some questions. We have time. Do we have some questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can we go to the chat box if there is a? Yes, sir. We have a couple of questions. Uh, yes. Dr. Minakshi Sachdeva wants to ask how far our country is utilizing AI in various fields, particularly the healthcare. Sir, would you like to take up this question? Yes, yes of course. Uh, so uh, there are some AI pioneers in India. Uh, like uh, close to Chandigarh, uh, there's been uh, an effort to develop uh, an AI for, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy. So using, uh, uh, you you know that, I mean, the ophthalmologists in this audience know that fundus cameras are very expensive. Uh, so using a simple camera uh, with a feature phone or a smartphone and uh, an AI, uh, you can detect early signs uh, and then uh, direct uh, treatment. So that's been one example in in this region. Um, then in in um, uh, in South India, there's been a very good result with uh, cervical cancer. Uh, uh, so uh, that is something that um, uh, affects a lot of uh, women in India. So that's a, a publicly um, uh, beneficial uh, use of AI. Uh, overall, I would say uh, there are these kind of islands of excellence. Uh, you know, Dav Sethi and his group in Triple IT Daily have done a lot of work around uh, the infodemic, um, how to uh, counter the use of misinformation and disinformation about vaccines and other uh, uh, measures, uh, non pharmaceutical interventions for COVID. But I think what we are lacking is uh, the kind of gold standard data sets. Uh, that can power uh, more uh, effective AI interventions, which is where ICMR is uh, uh, taking the, the right approach by um, uh, building these gold standard data sets. So starting off with leprosy, some other conditions, so different institutions can take the lead on building those uh, data sets. And eventually once the uh, Aishman um, Bharat Yojana that gets going. We have a thin layer today uh, with these wellness clinics, with the uh, Prime Minister's insurance scheme. But in four to five years, you would have sufficient data, and then you can put public health relevant AI on top of that. So these kind of niche, um, uh, let's say, solutions would also have the counterpart in these kind of. Uh, public health type of uh, AI solutions. Thank you, sir. The next question is how we can centralize our AI uh, or machine learning data, especially in the healthcare sector. But that's the billion trillion dollar question. Um, how do you put data together? 
Um, I think centralization has its pros and cons. The cons are the data becomes very susceptible to hacking, uh, to leaks and all kinds of uh, misuse. Um, and uh, in India, you know, uh, sometimes there is a free for all, you know, with telemedicine platforms, you see a bit of a free for all. So it's very important to avoid a free for all in terms of data. And we also have a fragmented health system as the public sector, private sector, and there is an unregulator, you know, no name sector. Uh, so uh, there is uh, um, there's a need for strong governance. There's a need for uh, best practices, uh, and there's a need for clarifying what kind of data sets are um, you know, uh, are the responsibility of uh, publicly funded institutions. Uh, so these are more sensitive, these are harder to access, uh, etc. And what are the kinds of data that the private sector can freely use uh, to uh, refine its own uh, offerings, uh, improve uh, patient care, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so um, uh, I think we are in a kind of an experimentation stage uh, at this point, and uh, institutions such as the PGI would have a role in kind of guiding others like, you know, this is how we do um, data curation, data centralization in uh, our um, uh, in our hospital. Uh, and they would have to be, let's say, um, and I'm just, you know, throwing this out um, in these advanced research institutions, uh, let's say 10 to 12 um, data banks. Uh, and then some kind of horizontality. Uh, there should be a way for different departments to access uh, the data that's with the pathology department. And there has been a tool that's been used for ages. This is the electronic health record. Uh, but then in, in India, uh, uh, we I mean, in the US, there is a heavy commercial uh, focus uh, uh, for this. In India, we would have to develop our own ways. There is, I mean, there's already uh, work going on at uh, the national level in terms of registries, in terms of patient records. Uh, but how do you ensure interoperability across different departments? How do you ensure that these gold standard data sets and particularly these horizontal data sets um, are put together? There's a lot of experimentation required, and these lead institutions would have to play a role. Just a word on this horizontal stacking of data. Uh, you can do some very interesting things uh, with it. Uh, the Israelis have uh, uh, used uh, data over 40 years uh, to uh, start predicting renal failure for diabetic patients uh, six, seven years in advance. Uh, you can make drastic lifestyle changes. You can also plan the uh, kidney transplants well in uh, in advance and probably you end up saving fifteen twenty thousand dollars if you don't have to do that uh, so those are the kind of things you can do if you prepare the foundation well and start stacking up uh, data uh, maybe i should be more explicit i think we should avoid a free for all there has to be some method in the madness otherwise you know we'll end up in a us type of a situation where you have now these uh, uh, data brokers. Uh, so these companies that even buy up uh, bank hospitals for their data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amanjit, for such an interesting talk and uh, your excellent ideas about uh, how we can operationalize artificial intelligence in uh, different uh, spheres of medicine. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I would like to thank uh, Professor K.K. Dalwar for joining us for this very interesting talk. Sir, would you like to make any concluding remarks? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meenu, for this opportunity. It has been very interesting to hear to Dr. Ramandeep, and I think uh, this is one field which is uh, probably so much coming that we all have to learn more about it. And I think uh, the potentials of it no doubt, Aaron, but we are still not very sure about what are going to be the limitation. Anyway, uh, I hope uh, that you, know, you keep on continuing to have some of these kind of discussions to educate uh, the medical professional on this particular new knowledge which is coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Binu and Dr. Amandik. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much.
Okay, Rathmin. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker for today's uh, session is Mr. Krishnendu Das Gupta. Pankaj, can you just have the slides? Hello. Hello, I'm audible. Hello. Hi, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just introduce you. After that, over to you. Uh, doc Mr. Kishnendu Das Gupta is a computer science engineer and graduate with a decade of experience in building solutions and platforms on applied machine learnings. He is working towards applied AI research in medical imaging and decentralized privacy preserving machine learning in healthcare. He is an alumnus of Entrepreneurship and Innovation Bootcamp. He devotes his free time to work with various research NGOs across the world and focused on the public health care as a research volunteer. A very warm welcome to you. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, sir, on the behalf of PGI Amir Chandigarh. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Please let me know if my screen is visible. Background noise. Is my screen visible? Yes. A lot of background noise, uh, Doctor Mr. Krishnan. Just a minute. Uh, is it better now? Now it's better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, my screen is visible, right, to everybody? Thank you. Um, hi, Are you welcome. Logged in? I'm sorry. Uh, please come again. Have you logged in from devices because there is some difference in? I have logged in with the credentials that has been provided. Uh, okay, fine, fine, fine. Find the you voice of sir. Is it better now? Yes. Okay, fine. Um, welcome. Uh, today's topic that we'll be discussing right now is applied machine learning in healthcare uh, with a focus on medical data, interpretability, uh, models, and evaluation. Before I start, I want to uh, put my note of thanks to PGIMER for enhancing the application of AI in healthcare and medicine, uh, Department of Telemedicine for pioneering the AI initiative, which is very much required. Dr. Minu Singh for driving this initiative, Dr. Anil Johan for coordination guidance, and Dr. Nipun Verma for motivation and direction throughout. So why exactly um, are we having these sessions, right? And if you're looking from a clinical perspective, if you're looking from a perspective of uh, data science and applied AI in healthcare, why do we need it? So let's address it, right, before jumping into the technicality of it, let's address that what is a real-time problem that we do, right? Uh, being a startup founder, it, it was very evident for me to go and interview as many, uh, you know, hospitals, doctors out there. So today, if you look into the need, if you're looking, what is the effectiveness of an ongoing treatment? 
this really comes in on a time to time with doctors or with patients as well. What are the chances of getting infected with a communicable disease, for example, COVID-19, right? So was there a way how we can understand there is a risk in a certain area? What are the most important driving factor for the disease? For any disease, what are the most important driving factor? What are the driving factors for the disease which can be looked into and which can be controlled? What should be a recommendation plan for a fitness regime and a diet? How long would be the hospitalization for the illness? That's where a different metric do come in place. And another thing is how to detect if a person is suffering from tuberculosis and from medical images, like you know, if you have to understand from just imaging, how do we do that? So when we look into these kind of questions, it comes to us, and when we say us, it's the entire community of healthcare ecosystem, starting with the doctors, researchers, medical researchers, computer science engineers, every professional. So they, we all come together and we see that, how can we create a process that can fasten everything? That takes us to the data, the world of data. And if you look into it, we have different kind of data together and we have different kind of data today. And that's where we are looking at multimodality when it comes to any kind of diagnosis or prognosis in machine learning in healthcare. We have epidemiology data, we have clinical standardized data, we have triage data, prognosis, crowdsource, ECG. If you look into it, there are certain kind of data which is out there. For example, if I just take with images, we have x-rays, CT scans, and then we also have digital pathology slides, which are used for histopathology or identification of carcinoma or any of that. What is applied usage of it? And if you look into this table, this actually gives us an overview that what each of the data type are getting used in and how are these data type being interpreted today in the healthcare ecosystem. If you look into text, we have, everybody gets an EHR. When you get your blood samples, report, everything, you see a lot of text uh, data out there. What can be done over there? What could be an applied usage over there? We have numerical, that's where your clinical reports comes in, and obviously with the EHR as well. And what is the applied usage? Normally we do a lot of classification clustering, but let's say one example is classification. Categorical, medical triage, for example, like you know, I'm suffering from uh, if I'm if I'm having categorical variables like you know if I'm having diabetes if I'm uh, overweighted if do I smoke or not smoke all these question based ecosystem they provide a kind of a stratification for an outcome which is part of the medical triage speech and voice for example cuff samples which was again a brilliant application today if you look uh, remember that. Uh, researchers across the world, they started to work around cough samples and say that if a person coughs, can it predict that, you know, uh, what is the symptoms are, are the, the person is having any kind of COVID symptoms or not. Video, as we said, MRI, ultrasound. Signals, EEG and ECG, these are very, like, you know, brilliant examples of it. And then we have graph. Graph is something which is coming very, um, Right now, the graph data types or graph database, uh, this is very new in the ecosystem on an applied research. One of the areas which is actually driving graph is drug discovery. So when you define or when you want to design molecular stability in drug discovery, you use graph neural nets and graph structures. The same way, if you want to understand the disease spread predictability, you need to find relations between the people, between different points, and that's where graphs are coming into picture. So as I said, like in the world of healthcare data is just huge and it's multimodal, and that's why we are surrounded with the homogeneity and the heterogeneity of data. Let's talk about supervised learning. What is supervised learning? We know that, you know, supervised learning is basically with labeled data prior knowledge of outcomes. For example, like, you know, there are thousand samples of, like, you know, data which is out there, and we say that, okay, these thousand samples of data which are predicting that, or which knows the outcome, where you are having uh, a kind of response system, like your patient is diagnosed with asthma, or it has to 
predict continuous response, for instance, change in cholesterol level, right? So that's where you look into supervised learning, which is just add some label data. And how do you do it? You build a model to make prediction based on evidence in the presence of uncertainty. Obviously, like, you know, machine learning comes in when you have to um, understand there's an uncertain output of it. So at that point of time, you need to uh, create a prediction based on evidence in the presence of uncertainty. When you look into it, um, I have put out some references as well as we go through. So over here, the supervised learning, if we look into input raw data and we have a training set and a desired output, that's where we say that this is our desired, this is our Y variable, Y hat, and X is the variable. So we are going to predict Y, right? So on that, what algorithm are we using? What processing? And it will start to give us an output. That's a very brief of supervised learning. As we go deeper into the slides, we'll get to know more about it. Talking about unsupervised learning, unlabeled data, no prior knowledge of outcome, finding patterns, and draw inference without labeled responses. One of the side part of it is like, you know, one of the part is like, you know, how we understand clustering. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, clustering method on Alzheimer's disease data set to get more insight into disease nature, diagnosis, and progression. And what is it about it? Like, you know, in this, you are interpreting the data. You don't have a prior knowledge of the outcome, but you're interpreting the data. There is no training data set. You interpret the data, then you feed it into the algorithm, then you process it, and then you get an output. Uh, output of it. This is more like um, a mind map. And we don't use all these algorithms today, right? Like, you know, there are many algorithms out there, but this is again a mind map which it comes to define, like, you know, what kind of algorithms work, what kind of data, what kind of algorithms should you be using. For example, like you know, you have deep learning, you have ensemble neural nets, regularization, rule system, regression, Bayesian uh, decision tree, dimension reduction, instance space, clustering. Now, each of these algorithms, as you see, uh, based on the data, based on the data size, based on the features that you want to extract, based on the outcome that you want to desire, whether it is a clustering problem, whether it's a classification problem, whether it is a time series forecasting problem, we go ahead and look into available algorithms, we look into the kind of um, study that we want to do on the data, and then we go ahead and work with a specific algorithm. Reinforcement learning is something which is picking up and which is there, which has been applied in a lot of places in the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, if you recall, right now, Professor Tav, um, in his lab, he has worked uh, extensively on using reinforcement learning. For example, like, you know, what really happens in this? So on our video, very um, overview side of it, let's talk about sequential decision making in healthcare. You have a patient, right, and uh, the patient's status S, right, with a, a reward signal R. So every time they're at a, at a given time stamp, if you're looking at the patient and if you want to understand that the state of the patient for a selected treatment, what will be the next state of it? And whether they should uh, use better methodologies, whether they should continue with the medication, whether they should continue with the process of it, all that comes in, in picture. And that's where reinforcement learning as a sequential decision making comes into it. This also uh, accounts to immediate consequences of the applied treatment. Now, for this, there has to be a lot of data. There has to be a lot of understanding because this works on a reward mechanism. This should work if it is not working, then what should work either? And we should try some other way around it. So before we jump in algorithms, right, one of the most important part is why pre-processing is needed. Now, I was listening to Professor Thurs, um, uh, uh, Professor Thurs uh, session and somebody asked about time series data, that how do we maintain the variability of the data. The thing is why you should maintain that. Right, the question was brilliant, but why? 
There has been research where we have found, and not only yes, like you know, uh, it has been a global research, and people have found and research. There are data sets which are out there which says that 20% of the raw data sometimes are unusable due to incorrect facts. They are not usable. They are missing. They are wrong. Their entry is wrong. If you have a categorical data, and if your data input methodology is wrong, you end up ending a wrong thing. If I'm a binary class, I, I need my solution of the value to be binary class or binary data. It has to be the zero one. If I end up writing a number like 15 or 20, that is not usable. Now, what really happens in that is some of the features which are extremely important as we get through a clinically um, validated process prior to actually building it, we understand from doctors, we understand, like, you know, doctors, clinicians, uh, they sit and they work with computer scientists or data scientists, say that, oh, these are the important factors. Sometimes we try them, sometimes we find the future importance. But if the data is not there, those particular columns of the data of the features will be dropped. Now, let's say for a time series data, what really happens? For any given time, let's say patient A and a patient B, right? You have a fixed input and a fixed target. Your input is X, your target variable is Y, you get it. But let's say you have a dynamic input and a dynamic target where you are looking for follow-ups, you're looking for prognosis. Now, if you have missing data in any one of them, it not only creates a problem in the analysis phase of it, but it also creates a problem for that patient's data. So at any given point of time, if you are looking at dynamic input, dynamic target, we need to understand whether the data is properly processed. So at any given point, if patient A is not having complete information, it will not be useful if the same patient A is interviewed or the data of the same patient is again and again after a certain time step. For example, if you look into um, the pre-processing predictive modeling for frailty syndrome, which has been taken, there are some features which are there. And if you look into the percentage of missing data, that's huge, right? And these are important features as, as you see. Now, when we look into um, missing data, right, it's, and we talk about imputation, we talk about missing data, the first thing is to understand that what are these missing data and when we say what is the reason for that right because when you find the reason then you get to know whether you can actually impute it or not that's where it comes around the three uh, missing qualification or the three missing ways that we look into missing data missing completely at random which is mcar um, missing at random which is mar missing not at random MNER. So if you look into it, like, you know, if I'm building a risk stratification model, and in that, my entire scope of calculating the risk is based on a feature, which is daily wine consumption or times uh, for stopped smoking. If I don't have that, then it doesn't make any sense. So as you see, if I'm just dropping most of the features like that, which cannot be imputed, the analysis is not useful. So it is said that a lot of data is useful. But again, a lot of data is useful only when that data is correct. So for clinically, it has to be better data and better understanding for that. Future engineering. From our hospital medical data, right, what actually happens when I talk about or when we want to understand about feature extraction? You have demography. Now, when you talk about multimodal data, when you have data like images, when you have data like reports, when you have clinical reports, you have each reports. You you combine if, if each and every one of them, and then when you look into it, you have a demography, you have primary care, and then you have an entity event mapping out of it. Now, when you look into it, how your entity schema works, in, like you know, you create data sets based on emergency visits, admission, diagnosis with your ICD codes, comorbidities, your conditions, your uh, interventions, which are basically for your follow-ups, whether there was an appointment, there are procedures, uh, the therapy, oncology visit, what kind of medication are being taken into accounting, 
the risk assessment and the social contact. So social contact is again based on if you're talking about communicable diseases. All these go together, create filters which get into a feature vector for a patient team. So what you see over here is a framework for feature extraction for one single patient. It's not a, a, a simple step that for one patient you have multiple data points or multiple data sets. So how are you going to engulf every single point of together and then put it into a machine learning algorithm and then we look into prediction, clustering, factor analysis and visualization. Why? Prediction to help that what could be predicted. Clustering as in like you know how do we cluster the disease if they are there. Factor analysis as we said right in this particular thing if you look into time stopping time stop smoking daily wine consumption kind of drinker any age alcohol consumption depression insulin hdl ldl everything and then comes the visualization quotes like you know how do you want to visualize the data these all are part of um, a way how you analyze your data prior to the model as well so feature engineering is not just about pre-processing. The feature engineering is a complete set of steps which starts from pre-processing, processing, post-processing post as well. Because when you are actually selecting the best model, you use feature importance. Which brings us uh, to the point of feature selection methodology. Now this is very extensive. And I'm more than happy to, um, to answer all the questions um, uh, after, after the session, or you can reach out to me. But let's say feature selection method, I will try to uh, make sure that I'm in time. Uh, filter method, wrapper method, embedded method. Now each of it, when you look into it, you have to understand what kind of feature selection method would you apply to. Now, this is the structure that any data scientist, any clinician or regardless or doctor, they have to come together, sit together, understand and then proceed for it. There are multiple libraries, be in Python language, R programming, starter programming, but those are not required. The first thing is to understand that what are the evaluation criteria algorithm used for the strategy for feature selection. For example, if I'm looking into uh, on the intrinsic characteristics of data or the relevance of the feature subset, I would prefer to have a filter method. If I'm looking for the best subset of feature considering the learning algorithm or the estimated accuracy of learning algorithm for each feature, I might use a wrapper method. If I want to aggregate the benefits of filter and wrapper method, I will use an embedded method. So there is a complete framework which actually sits in before you come and design uh, a, even a simple predictive model for healthcare use case. But when I look into it, each of these methods have their benefits and limitation. So the way how we always look into it is obviously benefit, but the way how we should look into when you're looking into these data is through going through limitation. What is a limitation and can that limitation will be a showstopper for the model to perform? Or that limitation can be taken up by other feature selection methods. Once you look into it, then you start proceeding with the feature selection method. Dr. Amandi Gill mentioned about the performance metric and I was so happy when I was listening to him that, yes, these, these are measures in visualization, but these are not just the metric. There are other metrics which are there. But when we look into it, performance metric, or let's say benchmarking, because benchmarking is very important. And for the benchmarking, when you have a benchmark, you have a benchmark metric, but you also have to understand that there are performance metrics which are uh, supposedly to be taken care of. For example, if I'm looking into an overall performance, I might take uh, R squared by score, which is better with lower distance between the Y and the Y hat, right? Y is your actual, Y hat is your predicted. It captures the calibration and distribution aspects of it. When we talk about discrimination, we see statistics. We talk about calibration, slope, reclassification, HL test, reclassification table, NRI, clinical usefulness, net benefit, cross table, decision curve. Now, each of these metrics have their own measure as well as their own visualization. But this is not like one table. This is 
for one particular uh, reference for one particular use case. But when we look into it and we say that we have to go ahead and build better models, we have to go ahead and produce better models. So what really happens in that? At that point of time, we're looking into either the accuracy or we look into either the interpretability of a model. That's where the interpretable machine learning comes into picture. And if you look into it, if I have to look into, and when I say the accuracy and interpretational map, which you look into on the left hand side, at times these um, points are valid, only you have enough data to qualify for each of the model or the modeling techniques that is mentioned over here. For linear models, the interpretation could be high, but the accuracy could be low. But for neural nets, at time, it's high and the interpretation is low, but that doesn't hold valid for always. Sometimes neural nets do not work the same way or they do not predict in the same way unless and until you have data validating or data supporting the arguments. So what really happens in the interpretation, uh, interpretable machine learning? So you have transparent model or a black box model. And Dr. Nippon was uh, in fact talking about interpretable machine learning at an in session. The transparent model is where you can understand and understand that how the data is really working, how the data is moving, how each of your agents, how each of your model parameters, how they are working out. A complex black box model are the models where you don't know what's happening inside. For example, a neural lens, there are hidden layers. You don't know how hidden layers are. Interpreting a neural lens is fine, but can you really understand that how neural nets hidden layers are working, what data is going from each layer to each layer? At that point of time, it actually becomes a post hoc and moves to agnostic. For example, like for if I'm looking into from a uh, transparent ML model, I can be an intrinsic complexity and it could be a specific model that did and not agnostic. And when I look into it, I look into the interpretation methodology, right? For complex or for agnostic, we have line, shaft values, mu's, PDP, right? Out of which few of the scope are related global, few of the scope are related local. Now the outcome could be your feature summary, the outcome could be your feature base, uh, anything on rule-based data or anything. At the same time, when your interpretation methods are coming from specific, then you can look into uh, scoring system, you can look into LRP, GradCamp, uh, GenSim, efficient score, weight plot. But when you look into data today, there is a gap of data. And everywhere, be it any imaging data, the biggest problem comes in when there are a lot of data sets. And even if we say that we have tons of data, an accuracy or sensitivity or specificity of an algorithm cannot be determined unless and until it has been trained on multiple data sets, multiple data points. The problem comes in when you have shortage of data. And that's where the synthetic data is coming in. Now, what is synthetic data? Synthetic data are basically which are images interpreted and created for to be fed into a machine learning system. You have real images and you create synthetic images out of it. For example, on the right hand side, if you look into it, you see real images and synthetic images. And you also see the AUC for both of them. At the same time, you look into skin lesions, uh, x-rays or histopathology, slides or anything, you find that there are different data sets which have been created. Now, how are they being done, synthetic data? Through use of GAN, Generative Adversarial Neural Networks. Now, GAN is a methodology which is used to generate these kind of data which do not exist. Now, when you look into and say that with, which has been trained with 10,000 images and it's subtype and compare the performance of the model with another model with real and synthetic, it mimics the characteristics of the real images and it also improves the accuracy of the classification. But it really imposes a problem that it does it mean that synthetic data is the future of in healthcare data? No, not really. But however, um, 
this minimizes what we were referring to before as transfer learning. So transfer learning had its own limitation at one point of time because as Tuff said and also Professor Debdul mentioned about transfer learning, right? There was a question around it that can we use transfer learning on that? Yes, we can, but at the same time, it's also important that you cannot take a model or data which has been trained on certain kind of images and try to put it into a different kind of images. At that point of time, you need to generate more data which are around the same ecosystem or the same data types. Uh, I'll quickly uh, go through, given the time that we have, limited time. So, um, the risk stratification is one of the things that we are uh, kind of looking into. So, what is risk stratification? So, this is a simple um, tool that was developed by a team of individuals that was involved into it at MIT, and uh, we won it and we actually deployed it in one of the hospitals in Latin America and, 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 and also in Mexico. So, what it was, we wanted to, they wanted to create, they understand the safety score before entering the care facilities. Now, if you look into it, the outcome was a risk mitigation score. Can we take serology screening data, if it was there, integrated care facilities database, and contact tracing? So, what could be a stratified data at that point of time? So, what we did is we looked into different uh, attributes, comorbidities, age, location of the person, where they are from, demography, infection score, RT, R naught, and also attributes like, you know, uh, where the person is going to visit. That really tells that if the person is more prone to the infection spread, right? So we build this and based on it, found the risk factors. So if you look into it, it was a very small data set and data size. Obviously, the accuracy and the outcome of it was not immediately uh, appreciated or understood at that point of time, the clinical setting, but during the time when it was deployed, it gave better results as we speak. And that's the power of a structured data, but the actual data has to be full, has to be correct, and there should not be any missing data. This is another thing that we uh, implemented, which was for hospital bed prediction in Latin America. It was to predict hospitalization and emergency beds in Latin America. Uh, which was clinically validated and deployed in Latin. Um, technology used, as you see, we, we used different technologies. The outcome was a risk prediction score, and we created a understood and hospitalization burden metric. Understanding a sample roadmap for clinical deployment of an AI solution. So for, this is again a reference sample roadmap. But you need to understand that when you design, when you develop, when you train, but how you deploy and understand the clinical side of it, like you know, when you are clinically deploying an AI model. Design and develop is one part of it, where you look into the data, when you look into understanding and developing of the models. And then you design and develop the initial product. But at the same time, when you create, you evaluate and validate. The evaluation and validation process happens in silico. Basically, it happens with a real-time validation with the hospital caregivers or doctors or radiologists, depending on what solution are you building. Your evaluation and validation will happen based on what, as a human being or a doctor is predicting, and what the actual AI is predicting. At that point of time, it takes and understands if there are any problem, it actually addresses it. If there are levels of error in the accuracy, then it goes back and a new data with new data it is again trained and developed, trained and developed, till a point where the accuracy or whatever the metric that you're using is at a stable release and a stable point. Once that is there, then comes the integration side of it, where we talk about three integration, the operational, clinical, and technical. For a data science project to go through, technical integration is something where you look into databases. For example, in US ecosystem, you have EHR systems, you have uh, different clinical settings which can directly take the data into your system, right? But the, in India, when you look into it, we are still working and uh, with government of India, we are creating an EHR system, which will be a global EHR system. That has to be integrated in the system.
The clinical integration is basically to understand the real point of source data. And at that point of time, what data is being fed in and how the data comes out. And then diffuse and scale. This is where you look into benchmarking, you look into scaling from one hospital to another hospital. At the same time, you'll also look into uh, continuing monitoring and maintenance. Based on what we do, we also look back and see that how each of these models can be monitored and how each model spawn can be maintained. If there are certain things, it will go back to the evaluation validation phase where you actually keep on doing it. And if at all in that phase, if there's a problem, it actually goes back to your design and develop phase where you re-initiate with your data, you rebuild your models to understand that where it went wrong. Few of the data points that we are for usage, which I would say that you know anybody can use out there is Mimic3. It's a massive data set of close to 124,000 records. Chexpert is around uh, 500,000 records, which are images, labeled images. Mimic is basically with the EHR, so you can do a lot with these uh, data points and with this data. Next tips and takeaway. This is something that um, uh, I have been in discussion with Dr. Anil, and this will be like one of the weekend sessions that we are trying to understand that if we can implement something like that, where we do hand on weekend session and reading group of applied ML research in healthcare, which can start from June. Um, and it could be like it's for all the doctors of PGI who can, whoever have time, they can just do it. Uh, publishing five notebooks, this is again, which will be out as we speak uh, through all the problem. I want to make sure that everybody who is attending today, their takeaway should be in another three months that they should be able to code, they should be able to understand, look into the data and understand that how these data point works. So there are five projects which are identified. Uh, which we will be publishing in July, June and Ju uh, July 2022, and um, it will be free to use with the data and everything as we speak. Um, privacy present methodologies. Why privacy? Because that's a point that will come into picture. If not now, it will be there, right? So how you have to make sure the privacy present methodologies for applied machine learning research and disease prediction, medical imaging to predict uh, to predict lung abnormality using transport learning. A risk stratification and how can we develop metric? A early warning for disease outbreak, and this is where we can use graph neural nets and graph. Uh, a recommendation engine for health diet and fitness review using a stratified data. Thank you. I, I hope that I didn't take too much of the time because uh, it was shut off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das Gupta, for such an informative and elaborated talk on machine learning models and application in the structural uh, medical data. Thank you very much. Any Thank questions? you. There are no questions for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Before proceeding ahead, we have uh, the link for the feedback. Please fill the link and submit it. Now, the next speaker for our talk is Dr. Neil Chohan. He is consultant in the evidence-based health informatics in HTA unit. He is working in Regional Resource Center Department of Telemedicine in PGI-MER Chandigarh. He has also worked as scientist C in the center, and he has received many awards like second prize in the COVID oral presentation. Uh, he has also received a travel award and also a co-investigator in Global Asthma Network. He is also a co-investigator in another project that uh, universal BCG vaccination and the risk of development of the COVID health workers. He has completed his seventh international fellowship in HTA. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, sir. Over to you.
Thanks, uh, Dr. Kusum, uh, for this nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, every, everyone. So uh, I will be talking about the vision for the future and the proposed existing resource model for AI and ML in PGMA at Chandigarh. Uh, from the previous lectures, we have heard about um, uh, much about the artificial intelligence and uh, about the models and the other uh, other things that we even need to conduct for the in the, in the artificial intelligence. But I won't be touching in the depth. But uh, I will be giving uh, you the what is the our vision of futures and what are there the existing resource models uh, in our PGA. So existing AI models at PGIMER Chandigarh, uh, as uh, in the COVID time, uh, PJ has uh, developed some some of the models uh, which were low low cost effective AI vehicles and were used by the COVID nineteen warriors, uh, which were such as the <coughs> Medi <coughs> Sarthi and the AI powered uh, trolley. So what what were these? Uh, Medi Sarthi it is an aerial system that eliminates the infection risk to the medical staff with. 100% secure success in protection, security, and the safeguard. And uh, it includes the, uh, uh, the remote access and the thermal RGB cameras for human body temperature and sensitization capability. And it was uh, used uh, uh, during the COVID time. And another is the AI powered trolley. Uh, it is a trolley uh, which is being uh, 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 attached with the artificial intelligence and it is being used autonomously in the high infection zone to deliver the essential supplies such as the drugs um, uh, and any equipments, uh, other things to the uh, ICUs. And uh, the critical feature of the trolley includes the detection of obstruction, medical personal movement, etc. So another was the AI uh, kiosk for the doctors, which, which is the uh, talking hospital at the PGI. Uh, uh, that is uh, being developed by one of the startups and were used in the uh, our Nehru Hospital block uh, in the uh, in the extension block of the Nehru Hospital PGI. <coughs> first, uh, first is you have to uh, the patient finding the AI uh, uh, chaos blocks. It looks like a passbook scanner with a big flat screen, and then the, uh, they have to press a button to choose a language, either a Punjabi, Hindi, or the uh, English. Then uh, 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 answer a few questions uh, that the machine asks, uh, then they have to respond. And the AI computer generates a 13 digit number for every users, and the patient's medical record and the histories they are generated as the QR code. And then this QR code is being uh, uh, sent to the uh, doctor who then scan and, and retrieve all the information about the patient, and then he can prescri uh, prescribe. Another initiative was. Uh, uh, that the uh, uh, there was a news that the Punjab joins the hand with the PGMA to promote the artificial intelligence in the health sectors. So uh, there was a one day symposium on application of uh, AI in biomedical instrumentation and certification of biomedical devices, which were uh, organized by the biomedical device instrumentation instrument hub at PGMA at Chandigarh, uh, where the principal secretary uh, of the science, technology, and the environment has uh, emphasized. The need of STEM uh, of uh, this uh, enter, uh, this AI hub uh, in the collaboration with the uh, this IIT Roper and uh, STPI Mohali, uh, which is in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, proposal phase. Then uh, this uh, in the ophthalmology, uh, Chandigarh uh, PGMA finds that AI uh, has the accuracy of eighty five percent in diagnosing the diabetic retinopathy. It was a central government fund, uh, funded pilot project, uh, and the ophthalmology department of uh, PGI found, found that in, uh, in diagnosing this uh, retinopathy, it, uh, the efficacy comes out to be 85% uh, without a minimal intervention of a physician. Then uh, uh, in the department of telemedicine, we are, we are having a project of uh, a machine learning approach for the prediction of asthma in children, which we have recently been uh, completed. Uh, what uh, uh, I will show you the, the, uh, the results of this uh, project. Uh, in uh, previous studies, the researchers they have used the telemonitoring and the EMR data with the patient and environment attributes for the prediction of exacerbation and physiological characteristics 
by developing the asthma progression model. <clears throat> so, which can predict the exacerbation of symptoms and physiological characteristics that lead to adverse outcomes such as the emergency department visits. So, in our study, we aim to diagnose the asthma through a, a machine learning approach using the retrospective data of our asthma clinics uh, in the APC. So, the study that included the retrospective data from the uh, uh, this uh, pediatric asthma clinic of APC and uh, the information we have taken from the uh, uh, from the patient record that were the, their demographic, their uh, medications, their procedures, and their other measurements such as the vital signs laboratory findings, uh, 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 which were being registered in the asthma clinics. And uh, the, the project has been cleared through the Institute Ethics Committee. So the inclusion criteria was uh, our uh, uh, children with age of two to, two to uh, twelve years, uh, which uh, come across to the asthma, uh, which were registered in the asthma clinic uh, from January first, twenty thirteen, to uh, December thirty one, uh, twenty twenty. And the diagnosis of the asthma was defined according to the uh, medical record according to the GINA guidelines. And our inclusion inclusion criteria yielded a data set with the eleven hundred children. So, the analysis that we were uh, performed that was the uh, first was the data cleaning, pre processing, and uh, EDA was done, then feature extraction uh, uh, was done, and then model, model training and the validation using the decision tree, random forest, multi nave base, and uh, this SVM, uh, then uh, stochastic gradient descent, and the SG boost. Then model evaluation uh, was done for the other uh, uh, ROC, accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity, and the Validation for by the K fold cross validation. So, uh, after cleaning, it was 1066 patients were as, uh, assessed on uh, 119 features for the diagnosis of asthma with the labels of uh, first is intermittent asthma, second, mild asthma, third, moderate, and fourth, the severe asthma. And based on the experiments conducted and the exp uh, expert knowledge, uh, we identified the 69 important features out of the 118 uh, features selected by uh, recursive feature selection method. So, as there was uh, 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 the data was not being balanced uh, among the all the groups, so uh, it was the class balancing was done by the uh, SMORE, that is the synthetic minority oversampling technique, and uh, resample data set was shaped. Then we, uh, we did the PCA. Uh, then uh, this is analysis is done to understand the, how the features are being clustered in the different classes, as you can see for all the four features. Uh, before it was being uh, spread all over, but uh, then we have uh, applied for the decision tree based feature selections. And after that, uh, uh, PCA was uh, uh, done and uh, selecting the best uh, uh, 50 features through the decision tree based feature selection. So, other feature selection we have also done that the, the, it was the recursive feature selection that uh, SFS, that is the sequential feature selection, and the Baruta feature selection. Then the final model training and the model uh, validation was done by combining the selected features from the RFE, Baruta, and the SFS feature selection algorithm. And we were finally left with the 84 features out of which we selected about 73 features based on the clinical knowledge as the model was not performing good uh, on any other the selections. On the final 73 features, we again apply the RFE and the Baruta feature selection algorithm. And based on the uh, model performance, we train the features on uh, the two models that were the random forest and the SVM, that is support uh, vector machine. And further, the validation was uh, done on the 104 data points, and we evaluated if the SVM model was predicting the class correctly. The validation accuracy was found to be 84% with a precision of 85%. So, concluding that uh, 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 for this study, that uh, uh, we found that features selected from our RFS methods trained on the SVM machine provided the best result with the 85% accuracy. So they are the, uh, these are the government some government uh, initiatives which are in the recent years has occurred in uh, for the this uh, strategy for the uh, uh, artificial intelligence in India, uh, uh, which has been given by the Niti Aayog in 2018. And uh, the government is also trying to create uh, this and uh, has created a national uh, digital health infrastructure where the most of the uh, uh, data is being uh, uh, generated through the e-Sanjeevani software uh, in the uh, uh, Ayushman Bharat uh, project. 
so this data uh, could be uh, in the future could be utilized uh, in uh, in the artificial intelligence uh, in this network then the vision for the future is that uh, th there is a uh, need of the collaboration between the medical and the technical institutions uh, which are being involved in uh, this uh, uh, doing the ai ml and uh, we have to stop working in the silos and remove the firewall of the clinical load and uh, the, these startups and the projects uh, uh, has to be looked for the funding. And the current status of the medical record, it is not uh, very good in our tertiary care hospital as most of the data is in, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the written format and, uh, and needs to be, and laboratory and the clinics needs to be collaborated to accelerate the implementation of the, these, uh, these electro electronic health records. And data need to be captured in the real time mode and institutions should promote their transformation uh, in, in the intelligent, intelligible process. And the new scientific and the cl clinical findings should be shared through open source and aggregated data must be uh, displayed for the open access by the physician and the scientist and made automatically available as point of care information. And the integration and the interoperability, uh, including the ethical, legal and the logistic concerns should be dealt. Uh, and EM, uh, electronic medical or the health records, these are some of the essential tools for the personalized medicines, which would be uh, uh, for the uh, specific diseases. And uh, we are uh, also in a process of creation of this center of excellence and the proposal has been sent to the ministry also. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we need to uh, do the research on the AI implementation in communicable and the NCD diseases and build a world-class uh, research infrastructure with the high compute and the patient-centric uh, discover, uh, disease discovery models to be built with the requisite partnership and the collaboration, publish and present the research papers the nationally and internationally in advancement of AI in healthcare and build an incubator-based research model to support medical researcher and the healthcare entrepreneur. So, uh, uh, giving more emphasis on the partnership and the collaborations, uh, focus research on the disease and its pre predictability by a combined study of the uh, privacy preserved patient data should be uh, done in the future and collaboration with the leading research university to create the model for the proposals submitted by their respective departments and uh, we uh, need to conduct the knowledge workshops for the faculty and the uh, students to implement the applied AI research in their respective domains. So uh, other than this, uh, uh, simultaneously, we have also developed an app uh, uh, for this uh, control of the asthma, which just I will run my slides, which was the our objective was development of mobile-based asthma monitoring app that we have uh, also uh, launched uh, in the COVID uh, in, uh, in last year, uh, that was the Whoosh app, and uh, it is also uh, giving uh, the asthma patients uh, more help in their control of asthma. So uh, it is uh, very simple to have a login, and uh, you have to create a, a login, and then the pa patient details are being uh, added here. Then further, uh, there are the four icons with the smileys. Uh, which are showing the awesome, good, low, and the unwell, and they have to just click that how their uh, control of asthma is on that day, and it is being recorded. And then uh, there, uh, there is some questionnaire that they have to click uh, the, uh, uh, on their da daily basis, and then uh, they have to uh, give their peak flow reading uh, uh, when they are doing with their peak flow meter, uh, which will give you uh, the monthly report. And this is the peak flow meter device. There are uh, other th three uh, uh, types of the reports in the asthma bush app, uh, which I will show uh, that is created. That is the monthly health report. And there's the PF PFR questionnaire report, and then is the PFR report. And then we have also created a library where we have the, some uh, guidelines for diagnosis and management of bronchial asthma and uh, how the videos for the peak flow meter. So this, uh, in, uh, we are in a phase of, uh, integrating it with this uh, AI model. And uh, we are also uh, left with the deployment of this model, which we are, will be doing soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anil Chauhan for giving us this overview 
uh, about the future and the uh, overview of the, all the projects which are going in the PJMER Chandigarh regarding AI models and machine learning. Uh, participants would like to ask anything from Dr. Neil Johan. They are welcome to ask. Okay, fine. I think we are running short of time also. The next speaker for the talk is Ms. Mehendi Goyal. Uh, she is a data analyst in Roche Pharma Private Limited. She has completed her MTech in biotechnology from Thapar University. She has uh, experience of five years in data analysis, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. She has published 15 national and international publications in the field of AI in healthcare. She has been experienced in working in Python, Squall, and Excel. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. And over to you also. Hello, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let me just share my screen. <clears throat> okay, so I believe uh, my, sc my screen is being shared and viewed by all. Yes, visible. Okay. So, uh, so today, um, uh, I'm Mehendi Goel. Hello, everybody. I'm Mehendi Goel, and uh, as uh, uh, my introduction has been done, so I am working as a data analyst in Roche Pharmaceuticals Private Limited, and I have been an ex-director, co-founder in Doc on with AI. So today, I would be presenting. Uh, my views on you know tools and softwares that are required to develop machine learning models so uh, when you see this um, uh, this image here so uh, we see a lot of names written here like aws jupyter tensorflow rapid miner sk learn so all these tools are actually very much required in machine learning in, in developing machine learning models and that is why i just uh, um, pasted like this here so that we could understand that, okay, how are we going forward with the presentation today? So I'll start my presentation with actually um, introducing what machine learning is. So if, like from morning, we are uh, listening about what exactly is machine learning. So machine learning is the subset of AI, which everybody knows that it gives the machine ability to use statistical and mathematical models to learn from the data. And we have learned a lot about data also, that how many types of data are there. So what exactly happens is that we have some input in the form of data, and then we input that data into a machine learning model. And this machine learning model is actually some processor, which is put it into the computer. And then the output of that processor, we, we represent that as an output and that is mostly predicted or it might be a statistical analysis of that data or something that we are demanding from the uh, from the computer so this is exactly the whole process very simplified process what exactly happens that we have an input and we demand an output and to get that output we need some processing and that processing we could either use some algorithms or we could use some um, some machine learning models or something else. So uh, there are different kinds of machine learning that we have already discussed. There are supervised machine learning, unsupervised, semi-supervised, uh, reinforcement learning. So supervised learning, we have understood that, okay, supervised learning is something that is, uh, we, we know the data, we know the output, we just uh, want to input more data and get the predicted output. In unsupervised machine learning, we are not sure of what kind of output we are looking for. We just want to look into the trends, into the data. We want to look into the uh, what exactly does data represent? What can we get out from the data? So here we do not have anything uh, like in particular an output uh, in super unsupervised machine learning. In, in semi-supervised machine learning, for example, we are getting uh, a, a third opinion from somebody. For example, we have some some tweets, and we want to understand. Okay, this tweet is uh, uh, is is positive tweet or negative tweet or neutral tweet. So we want to get an opinion from a third person, from an expert, that please give us some uh, some examples of what exactly is formed of positive tweet and negative tweet, and use that kind of information to train the other. Uh, uh, data that we have that is known as semi-supervised that we are 
creating a supervised system for uh, like identifying the trends out of uh, an unstructured data. Then we have a reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is also uh, something that we have understood now by now. That is, uh, it, it's like a feedback system for for the algorithm to learn more from the feedback. Like for example, I a, a system says that okay, this is the uh, result, and me being an expert, I say no, this is not the result, and this is the result. That this forms a feedback system for the algorithm, and this forms a reinforcement learning. So when we uh, think about what is supervised learning, we and we come across some of the problem statements that we are going in our uh, daily life. So we classify those problems into two different types of problems. One is classification and one is regression. So classification is something where we say that, OK, uh, we want to classify uh, the, the data into two or three different uh, categories. For example, we want to classify the data into diseased or non-diseased, or we want to classify into uh, like the the weather. Maybe it will be cold or hot tomorrow. So there will be multiple kinds of categorical outcomes outcomes that will be expected from the classification algorithm. From the regression algorithm, we would be predicting the continuous outcome. So continuous outcome would be like the temperature, or we want to uh like predict the edss score in in the neurological patients when we have uh, multiple sclerosis patients then we want to identify what is the edss score of those what would be the edss score of these patients based on the parameters that are given so that would be the regression algorithm then uh there there are differences in regression algorithm in terms of prediction evaluation there are multiple algorithms and applications so while while uh, predict, predicting the classification will be predicting more discrete class in regression we will be having continuous quantity in eval by, by by evaluation i mean that classification in classification we would be classifying like evaluating the algorithm by accuracy precision recall in regression we would be class uh, evaluating by these parameters like rmse r, r square score so when we choose these algorithms, we actually choose what kind of evaluation, what kind of uh, a problem we are solving, what kind of algorithm we might use. So these are different kinds of algorithms we would be uh, seeing in classification or regression. Most of the class uh, algorithms are similar in classification and regression, but still there are some differences. In in applications, of course, that I just uh, mentioned that in in while we are deciding what kind of algorithm should be used in a given kind of problem statement, then we need to understand that whether the outcome that we are being provided, is it a, a, a categorical variable that is yes, no kind of situation where we can just label the output into zero, one kind of thing, or we have a, a continuous uh, variable like we have multiple numbers that are non-categorical so this we need to identify before choosing whether we want to go for classification or regression then we have different kinds of algorithms so i'll just discuss three like decision th decision tree random forest and svm so moving forward with decision tree so decision tree is like a tree based structure where we have a root node and in root node we we tend to ask what is the main important question that we need to ask for the for the first time to to this algorithm so that based upon that answer we will be asking another question for example this is a very simple example for example we want to ask whether we want to do the work if we want to uh, if we if we say yes then this is the outcome if we say no then this is the outcome. And when we say no, then this is the outcome. And based upon that outcome, he uh, the, the algorithm would ask more questions that, OK, what do you want to do then? If if the weather is sunny, the weather is overcast, the weather is rainy. If the weather is sunny, then you, you, you need to do this. If the weather is overcast, then you need to do this. And if it, what if it is rainy? Then if it is rainy, then you might go for another option. So this is like a yes, no system. It's like a tree based system where we analyze what kind of root node is there and what are subsequent nodes are there and how to answer these questions. So this is like a top down approach where 
we understand what questions hold the most importance and based upon these questions we decide what kind of tree would be made so in in um in like reality when we actually perform the uh, machine learning model then this tree is like really really big where we are looking into how many questions are there and what is the probability of each question becoming a root node and in the cases where the probability of root node probability of that question is very high to be asked in the root node that question becomes the root node and this whole processing is done under the decision tree uh, modeling system but this tree is really really easy to explain that okay this question is the important question and based upon this question this question is asked and based upon this question this question is asked so that is why this this uh, tree based modelings are really really easy to understand then we have random forest so random forest is also a tree based system wherein we have different trees so what it does is that it actually uh, creates the subsets of features features by features i mean the um, the the columns that we have in the data and uh, i just want to remind that i am talking about the structured data here so by structured data i mean that the data would be very uh, well organized in either excel or or in in the form of tables in the form of tables it would be really really well organized so i will be talking about those kind of uh, data right now so here what happens is that um, the data the features would be uh, like clustered in a a uh, small sets so when we have small sets of uh, clusters then we uh, then this algorithm makes multiple trees like tree 1 tree 2 tree 3 3 and tree 4 and based upon these features that this particular algorithm has selected what is the outcome of the, uh, the the output class what is the outcome of the output class whether it's class a b c d depending upon what is the uh, categorical uh, uh, outcome that we have provided to the algorithm then based upon this uh, this all the trees that are being formed from this uh, mother data set the trees would be formed like different trees would be formed and the classes would be defined and based upon these classes what will happen then is the uh, voting algorithm or the bagging or boosting algorithm would be uh, done wherein the best mo uh, the the like uh, the voting would be done like uh, which tree is giving the best algorithm uh, best outcome and then we'll have the final class so the final class would be done by the ensemble learning mo uh, method so by ensemble learning method i mean that uh, like uh, like these models would be combined together and based upon what is giving the best outcome it is selected so random forest actually is the most common type of algorithm that is used in uh, healthcare systems because this does not take all the uh, features that are provided in the data set and because of a lot of correlations and different uh, um, like different inherent issues of the data healthcare data this model actually takes care about the um overfitting and underfitting so by using this kind of model the researcher might not be facing the issue of overfitting and underfitting because it takes care of that by making by creating multiple trees so this this uh, algorithm is really really uh, uh, like used in uh, uh, healthcare modeling data and then we have uh, another algorithm that is svm so svm is support vector machine so support vector machine is actually a very uh, different kind of approach it follows a very different kind of approach where it creates a hyperplane kind of structure between two different classes for example we have this class and this class so what this algorithm will do is that it will try to create a best hyperplane with, within these two graphs and this hyperplane would be created based upon the uh, a lot of mathematical modeling that is going behind this algorithm. So based upon all these things, it will select the best hyperplane uh, that 
actually separates the two classes and there would be a, a this line of uh, this zone wherein none of the class should exist like that that class will be given no class so uh, that like the, the in this actually uh, it the classes are separated based upon the hyperplane and not on the basis of tree based structures so yeah okay so now we have model evaluation so the first question that comes into our mind is that why do we need to create this evaluation thing why do we need model evaluation so what exactly happens is that for example these dots these are actually our data okay and when we spread that into graph we found that okay this data has exactly no um like it is not the uh, entirely it is not a straight line right but when we uh, create the model then we when we see what is the uh, model behavior then let's suppose that this kind of graph is being made so when we see this kind of graph we are seeing that the the line is straight so by this we are not considering that these points are nearby the line these points are nowhere near the line and these points are also nowhere near the line so by this modeling technique we could say that this model is underfitted that it might mean that lot of points that are coming uh, to this uh, model they might not be correctly predicted okay so this is this is like underfitting then is the overfitting so what let's suppose that the model is giving us this kind of curve in this kind of curve we see that the line is uh matching all the points on their points okay so here also the variability in the data will not be captured by the model okay so the variability would not be captured and the model would be termed as overfitted so here you will see that the training accuracy will come very very high but the when we when you do the validation and when you do the testing of the model the accuracy will drop down very very significantly so the good fit would be there would be a line that is nearby to all the points and it does not care about like it has to match all the points at in in the line but it has to get that line which is like very very uh similar to all the points so that it could also create uh, it could also capture the variability in the data and it could also capture the outliers that this point is an outlier for my data and uh like this is not giving the that is why it is not giving the correct uh prediction so this would be termed as the good fit and that is why we need to get the model evaluation so for model evaluation we have some metrics so for metrics uh like there are multiple metrics evaluation metrics uh but first is the confusion matrix so in confusion matrix we have we have to identify what are the number of correct and incorrect predictions then we have roc curve that we we understand whether the uh like whether the curve the probability curve is uh is correctly presented or not then we have auc curve auc curve is also is also known as the area under curve that is uh uh, that is the area under the roc curve so this is the auc curve that it should come above uh, like 90 so that to understand that okay the model is performing better then we have the f1 score and f1 score also means the harmonic mean of precision and recall so precision and recall is also the uh, the, the understanding of whether the how many correct and incorrect predictions are made by the model then we have some unsupervised learning algorithms so in supervised we understood that we have classification and regression but in unsupervised as we know that you know we do not have any output class in unsupervised uh, uh, learning so here what we can do is once one is clustering so in clustering what happens is that uh, the algorithm it clusters similar kind of classes in one cluster for example we have a cluster of uh, um, Uh, a points and cluster of b points and they are merged together so what this particular algorithm will do is that it will try to identify that which kind of cluster is uh, is is like at the at which area of the graph 
So that is how the clustering algorithm actually works. So there are multiple algorithms like k-means, hierarchical, and db scan. So there are multiple others also, but I'm just uh, uh, looking into these three. Then we have dimensionality reduction. Um, as uh, a lot of people have discussed about uh, dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm as well. So dimensionality reduction is that uh, when we create the data, we have multiple rows and multiple columns. So when we have multiple columns, so these columns represent one dimension to the algorithm. So <clears throat> when we have uh, the real data, then we have multiple columns out there. So it becomes very, very high dimensional and very complex for the um, algorithm. So to reduce that dimensions, to reduce the complexity for the server, for the for the algorithm, we need to <clears throat> go with the dimensionality reduction algorithms like PCA, that is principal component analysis, and uh, linear discriminant analysis or generalized discriminant analysis. So I'm not going into deep of every algorithm that is coming along because it will take a lot of time. So all these uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms actually reduces the complexity of the uh, algorithm. <clears throat> then after creating the model, after <clears throat> understanding which kind of model we want to use, after uh, applying that modeling techniques to our data, then what will happen is that we want to optimize the model. So why do we want to optimize the model? Actually, uh, when we optimize it, we actually tune the model using the set of hyperparameters. So for every uh, uh, algorithm, we have some parameters to regulate its uh, its working. Just just now, I told that in in um, in decision tree, we have a, a very important thing that we have to identify what is the root node question so for root node question for 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 to, to identify whether for how long the tree should go so these are some of the parameters that we need to uh, identify and we need to provide to the algorithm so that we could get the best tuned and optimized model so that uh, yeah uh, to get the best tuned and optimized model so the benefits are, of course, the, to control the behavior of ML model. We want to control whether, for how long, for, sorry, not for how long, uh, how should the ML model behave? Like what, what should be the first question that a decision tree should take? Or how many uh, levels this tree should have? What should be the pruning of this? Uh, how, how pruned this tree should be? So this kind of controlling behavior we want, what kind of parameters we should take. For every algorithm, we have different parameters that we can change to hyper-tune this algorithm. Then this tuning also improves the model performance. Then we also have the space of possible, we retrieve the space of hyper-parameters, and we save the time and effort by avoiding multiple uh, experimentations and using multiple algorithms. So this will help us in uh, creating a better model. Mm -hmm. Then th there are different kinds of uh, hyperparameter optimization. One is the manual search, then is the grid search, and then is random search. So there are multiple types of hyperparameter optimization techniques that, uh, that can be done to hyper-optimize the model. Then there is one very uh, important tool called PyCaret. So this PyCaret actually, it simplifies the machine learning tasks for all the novice uh, data scientists that are very new to the data science thing. Because to create a very optimized machine learning model, it takes a lot of practice and everything. But PyCaret is, uh, is, an, is an automated tool by which uh, like within a single or two, two, three lines of code, one can run the machine learning model and it includes data preparation, model training, hyper parameter tuning, interpretability, model, model selection you can do and experiment logging. It all does it by itself. So PyCaret is <clears throat> a very powerful tool that could be used by, that should be used actually by all data scientists, you know, in a very initial stages of, of, uh, uh, of learning machine learning models then we'll come to these steps
to develop the ml models so when we talk about the steps so these are some very initial and very uh, like uh, uh, these are the levels these are the steps which are required in the very simple machine learning for creating a very simple machine learning model so first of all we want to understand the data and do the initial data analysis that what kind of data is there with us and how do we uh, classify the data what kind of output we have so this kind of data understanding we need just to uh, identify what kind of next steps we will take then we have data processing and visualization in data pre-processing and, and uh, visualization we visualize the data and we see whether there are any null values any outlier values any any uh, disbalancing of the classes within the features or in the output classes. So what kind of data is it? Then we need to do the exploratory data analysis. In exploratory data analysis, what we do is that we understand the correlations between different features, what kind of uh, features are there and what is the correlation between one feature and another feature. Then what is the, what, what role does play uh, one, like the variance between the, the different features and every other aspect of, of data analysis, how how each class is, uh, is, uh, is there with, with respect to the output class, how, how, how different uh, class, how different features are behaving in corresponding to the output classes. So this we need to identify in exploratory data analysis. Then we have modeling hypertuning, testing, and model validation. In modeling, we, of course, model. Then we hypertune the model, we test the model, and then we validate the model with the new data classes. Then the last step would be the model deployment to be used for the machine, uh, for the user. Then in data understanding and initial data analysis, we need to identify the type of data. So type of data, we need to identify whether the data is structured data or it is unstructured data. If it is structured data, it could be the EMR, that is uh, um, electronic medical records in the form of a uh, organized table. Okay. Then we have hospital records, like what kind of um, um, services are provided by hospital. So these are the hospital records or insurance data, pharmacy inventory data. There are multiple kinds of data that could be uh, stored in the uh, in the form of structured data. Then we have unstructured data. So we have images, videos, text, speech, electrical signals in case of ECGs and everything. So we have these kind of unstructured data. So we need to identify what, what kind of data we have then we need to understand what is our problem statement so if we need to understand if with if the problem statement actually requires the implementation of machine learning whether or not we would be getting the solution by implementing machine learning all that problem statement so we need to very focusedly get into uh, what exactly is our problem statement okay then of course when we have identified the data then we need to identify whether what is the output class whether it's a regressive regression type uh, output or it is classification type output so that this is all just to uh, understand the future process so this is the very initial level data analysis that we need to do before starting any kind of um, machine learning then we have data processing and visualization. Then in this step, the data needs to be pre-processed and visualized depending upon the type of data. For example, if the data is structure type, then we'll need to look for null values, outlier values, any kind of labeling is there or anything else that we need to uh, do that. Then we need to visualize the data to identify any bias or, or to understand the relationship between one features or one and another feature. So, like this kind of visualization we need to do so that we could identify, we could actually understand the data and we could predict what could be the possible outcome of the analysis. So this is a saying actually that uh, when 
while doing this data processing, visualization, and this is all a part of actually EDA, the exploratory data analysis. So all this EDA, it takes like 80% of the time of modeling. And then when we are well versed with the data, when we are well understood of the data, then we go forward to create the models, to, to, to train the models. And most of the time we understand what kind of model should go in, which kind of data and what kind of uh, like what kind of pre-processing steps we need okay so if if there are unbalancing in the classes then we need to do the balancing algorithm by smart or any other thing like oversampling undersampling smarts so then we need to do that that if there is no unbalancing we do not have to do that if there is like unbalancing of the uh, output class then we need to use the uh, very advanced algorithms like generative adversarial networks to create a synthetic data of our own to to balance the da data and to uh, to remove the bias so these kind of steps they include in the process or they they are excluded from the process depending upon what kind of data we have that is why these processes like data analysis is really really required in any machine learning uh, uh project that you undertake anytime okay so then we have eda so eda is again the same uh, <clears throat> that we need to understand the data as a whole so for eda we have uh like the manual process that we uh go by code by we we write a code and then we understand what exactly is going in the uh, data or we have a pandas profiler uh, pandas profiler which is like an automatic version of eda so it does the eda in a very automatic fa fashion so it just gives you a very good bird's eye view to the data and then you can understand what exactly is going on in the data and then you can move forward with the data okay. so just like pycaret we also have pandas profiler to automate your process then we have modeling, hypertuning, and testing. So as I told that when uh, the parameters are decided, data is cleaned, we know the data, then we need to understand whether we need to go with the regression type of models or classification models. Then based upon the modeling decision, we need to opt for different kinds of models. Either we want tree-based models or we want neural networks or we want probabilistic models, which kind of models we want. So these models, the decision of these models come again from the data analysis. Then we need to divide the data into training and testing. For example, we have 10,000 rows of data. Then in 10,000 rows of data, we will divide that data into two parts. Either we could use the ratio of 80-20 or 70-30, depending upon what amount of data you have. For example, if you have 1,000 rows, then you will not go for 70-30. You might go, you might opt for 80-20 or even 90-10. But if you have like 20,000 or 50,000 rows of data, then you might go for uh, uh, maybe uh, like 70-30 or some people also go for 60-40. It depends upon the data quantity that you have. Then after training and testing the model that you have built, then it's a good practice to have a validation data that is coming from the real time source. If it is coming from the real time source, you will understand whether or not your data is performing well on the real time data. If it is not performing on the real time data, then you might hypertune it again or you might uh, see into different aspects of modeling, whether it is taking some more uh, some more parameters or we need to change the model or anything else, then that is why my validation is very, very important because any machine learning model has to be used by a user. So the user will use it on the real time actual data. And if it does not work on the actual data, the the, eval the, the the accuracy and the precision of the actual train model will go very down on the validated data. So we need to understand the importance of training, testing, and validation data. Then we have hypertuning. Hypertuning is again done to just uh, to to choose the set of optimal features to to make a very good learning model. <clears throat> 
Okay, so there are multiple ways to hypertune any algorithm. So the popular ways are grid search CV, Optuna, HyperOps. So these are some tools that are uh, used to hypertune any algorithm. So what these tools do is they they will tell us that these are the parameters that you will take. You, they they actually run the model on different probabilities of the data, different different. Uh, like uh, different kinds of different, uh, not kinds actually, uh, different probabilities, like how, like the data would be, uh, it would be separated into different parts and then it would apply all the probabilities on the data and then it will see which parameters are the best parameters that actually gives the highest performance for the model. So. So these are different uh, 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 hypertuning tools that help us in identifying those um, uh, like hyperparameters uh, hyper to hypertune our algorithm. Then we the last step would be the model deployment. So we want to deploy that model in an actual server so that the user could use the model and could test could verify our model or use the model for good then for for this deployment we have either we want to make it in the form of application a mobile app or we want to create it in a web application so for this we have different tools like streamlit is very uh, uh, is is a very simplest tool in creating a web application then we have django then we have flask um, so uh, we have uh, and different other uh, deployment tools as well. So in this, we create a, a web app, and then this that web app can be utilized by the user. Okay. Then uh, these are different the the tools that I told uh, uh, till now. They were the they were individual tools for individual practice so aws amazon web services they offer wide variety of tools for performing the different kinds of tasks so we need to they have a lot of tools over a thousand tools they have but they have tools for all of the uh, applications that exist in the world i believe so uh they have some tools for data analysis, some for machine learning, some for storing the data. So we need to identify what kinds of tools are there. For example, for, for storage of data, AWS provides us S3 or Glacier, depending upon what kind of storage we want. Then we have uh, SageMaker for, for creating our machine learning algorithms. Then we have Athena, SQL database server to, to perform simple analysis on the data to, to, to store the data and these kind of things. So we have multiple tools in AWS. So AWS is uh, have, have application tools and application services in computer networking, like EC2 is, is a very important tool for AWS. Then we have database tools, then we have deployment and management tools. So all these steps of machine learning could be completed using the tools of AWS. So, so there are, these are the tools actually, let me just, uh, so these are the tools. So these are all the products which are featured by AWS. So Amazon, EC2, Aurora. So all these tools like SageMaker we have. Then for analytics, we have Athena, EMR, so for all these stuff, Redshift we have. So all, for all the different kinds of uh, processes, analysis, we have different kinds of tools in AWS. And this is this service is being provided from a very, very long time. So, so uh, they have actually improved a lot on their services and it actually helps us in creating uh, a, a very nice machine learning model or perform analysis onto it. For example, for so we have a lot of tools under this for for AWS. I think we require uh, another session for this. 
then <clears throat> then moving forward uh, so okay i have prepared a case study to provide you a glimpse of what actually an ml model looks like so okay so this is a um, typical google collab uh, 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 not, so this is a, like a typical uh, google collab thing so when you type google collab here in google then you would be uh, reached to this so when this when you click on google collab you will be uh, directed towards this so here either you can create a new notebook or if you have some projects of your own then you can select from the projects that you want to uh, update or you want to share or something then you have a option of importing it from the google drive or you could use github or you could upload of your own if you have it on your personal machine okay there so i will go to the pga project that i've created so okay so in this pga project what i have done is so i've created a very simple machine learning uh, steps i have uh, listed out all the machine learning steps so for that let me just show you what kind of data i have taken so this is not a healthcare data this is a very uh, normal uh, weather forecast data because uh, medical data is really uh, confidential so in this data what uh, i have termed is date time like what kind of date is there and what is the time then what is the season then like is it summer fall spring then is it a holiday day either like zero one condition then is it a working day so if it if if it is not a holiday then it should be a working day then what is the weather whether it might be clear or few few clouds or it might be light snow or light rain so what kind of weather it is uh is there so it should like match with the season like it should not happen like light snow is there and season is summer so this doesn't make sense so we need to see whether these different columns actually make sense with each other or not so this a lot of times it happens in medical data as well so this kind of uh, thing we need to be very careful about then we have a temperature so this temperature is also um, very related thing like if it is summer then it can be 22 but if it is winter then it cannot be 22 or 32 it could be 13 or 12 or this then this is absolute temperature and this is humidity wind speed and this is now output so by this output what we understand is that this is not a classification algorithm the, oh, sorry this is not a classification type data this data is a regression type data because the variable is continuous okay so this variable is continuous that is why we would the, the first thing that came into my mind is that this is not a classification this is a regression type of model uh, <clears throat> then if the data would have like one zero one zero so then i would have considered it uh, a classification okay so the, similarly i have also created a test data so in this test data is also the similar data but the number of rows is uh, less like it's just 2000 rows but in train data we have about uh, 8000 9000 rows then <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll go to the pod so what we'll uh, firstly do is that we will import all the necessary libraries or packages so what libraries is that to to actually perform a lot of functions we need to import a lot of uh, libraries and packages from the uh, already available uh, libraries and packages so this in this we want to import numpy pandas so i'm sure everybody must have heard about these these packages so pandas matplotlib seaborn so these are all libraries that we need to import before starting our any kind of uh, 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 notebook uh, then after importing all these things then we need to get the data so how do we get the data when we click over here files then we can 
actually import the data by uploading here. So if I upload it here, then I could select my um, my database, my data, and then it would be automatically uh, come here. Okay, and uh, okay. So, so sorry. Before before actually uploading the data, we need to actually connect to the um, the host. So here, because it is already connected, I'm not being shown connect. But if I'm not connected, it will show uh, connect. And when I click on connect, it will be uh, connected and authenticated from the server, Google server. And after that, after it is connected, we, we are able to uh, upload our files into this particular folder. So I can also drag and drop these files. So for example, I have these files. So I can just drop these files here and this file would be dropped. Is it not coming? Let me just upload like this. So it's uploading. So it is uploaded. Okay. So then I can run this code and then I want to see what kind of data we have. So, um, so I, I like, I want to read what kind of data we have. Then we want to identify what is the shape of the data for shape. I mean that what are the number of rows and what are the number of columns that we have? So as we know from the data, we have 8708 col uh, uh, columns, uh, sorry, rows and 10 columns in this. So we can uh, also see we have 8708 rows and 10 columns. So 10 columns we have. So this is correct. Then we want to also uh, uh, load the test data and identify the shape. Then we want to create some new columns. Why did I create some new columns? Because this column actually is not understandable because it has date also, it has it has time also. So I was not able to understand what exactly this column represent. And I could not uh, create this uh, uh, anything out from that data. So what I did was I created a new column. So this kind of uh, problem also exists in the uh, um, uh, in the healthcare data where we suppose we have weight and we have height and we want to create a new, new column utilizing that two, that two columns and we want to create a new column named BMI. Okay, so this, this is how we create new columns. So here what I have done is that we ha I have created the column of date, hour, month, week, day and year from that one column that is this. That is this. So from this column, what I have done is I have created all these columns. Okay, so I have done it in um, test data, and I have... okay. So I have also done it in train data and in test data. So uh, then I do exploratory data analysis. For exploratory data analysis, what I did was that I uh, I first wanted to know what are the type of the data for example the season what kind of type is that data either it is an object data or integer data or float data so that we could perform different kind of operations or different types of databases then <clears throat> we want to know whether the types of the test and train are similar then we want to describe the data so so when we do the describe data then we uh, get the count, mean, standard deviation, minimum, 25%, like quartiles, and the maximum values. So by this, I could see that, okay, what, what exactly is the data formed of? What is the uh, average uh, of this data? And this kind of stuff, okay? Then what I want is I have encoded the data. So what I mean by encoded is that when I see this, so there are multiple classes in this. So if I filter this out, there are multiple classes in this. So there are like four classes that are given in this particular field. Okay, and here also I have three, four classes. So what I want is I want to simplify this data. So by simplifying the 
simplifying this data, what I have done is I've created multiple other columns as well. Like I have uh, encoded this in zero one format. So this would be easier for the uh, computer to understand, but it will increase the complexity. Remember I told you about the dimensionality reduction. So this approach is only done when we have less amount of columns. So here I have just 10 columns. That is why I did so much of uh, increase in columns just to simplify our approach. Okay. So if we have a lot of data, then we will not go for one hot encoding. We will either do label encoding or we will do different kind of approach for, for handling this kind of situations. Okay. So here also I've created it for weather. I've created for, uh, sorry, here. Okay, so here I have created for train data, here I have created for test data. So because we have different kinds of, uh, we have two different files. So we have created it for weather, we have created it for season. Okay, for both weather and season, it is encoded. So from the data, if, if we see only these are the two uh, uh, columns where we need to um, uh, uh, encode the data. Okay. Then we want to see what is the shape. Now you see the column number has increased to 20. Okay. So then what we did is. Okay. We need, we, we identified the value counts of each, uh, like year we have, right? Okay. So this is just an example. So we have, uh, from this column, we got the year, the 2012, 2011. So we got the year, we got the month, we got the week of the uh, of this particular date, and we got the time. So from that year column, what we did was that we found out how, for how many years the data is there. So the, the data is only for two two years, like 2012 and 2011. So this we can do for any any number of columns. For example, I've done it for months also. So we have all the 12 months and we have counts for different months that for one for january we have 693 records for for december we have 733 records okay so this kind of analysis we need to do and we can go into all the deepness we can we want to go to to understand the data okay then i try to do a pandas profiling but uh, pandas profiling was going through update yesterday so it was not running actually so for pandas profiling we just need to install the pandas profiling and we want to so we want to create a profiler report so this for profiler report what will happen is that it will create a report kind of structure where it will have all the graphs for for uh, 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 which says what kind of feature is in uh, what, what relationship what one feature has with one another so all the graphs would be presented in a very like a pdf format okay and you can download it from here on, only so this pdf would be would be here would be uh, would be would come here and then you can download it like this so you can download it from here okay so this we can do as well then so because the profiler was not working yesterday so i just uh, try to get some code onto this so what i've created is we have created a scatter plot for all the all the um, all these columns hour month week fall spring summer and winter so i want to see what is the uh, how all these things are corresponding to the output for example, I'm, I'm, I want to see how hour is, uh, how hour has relationship with output, how month has relationship with output, how week has. So this is just an example of what I'm doing. Then I want to do the box plot uh, uh, visualization. For box plot visualization, what I want to identify is that how many outliers are there. So if I see, I, I, I perform the analysis for the column temperature. So I want to understand whether in column temperature we have any outliers or not. So this is this graph is easier for understanding. Uh, like this is like a quartile graph where where this is like 25, 50, and 75 like this, and this bar is the highest uh, uh, highest possibility that we can take for a data. And anything, any data out, any data points outside this this bar 
would be uh, considered as the outliers okay so i've created it for different uh, columns like for a temp uh, absolute temperature and for humidity as well so for humidity you see we have one data point that is outside the um, outside this uh, this this bar so now this is the call of the expert whether whether this uh, this point holds any importance or not for example in in medical data what we have is that we have a very heterogeneous data so we cannot say that the population of india the data that is uh, coming from population of india will match with the data that is coming from the population of russia or from the population of usa so we need to identify that this outlier why this outlier is coming whether it is because of the data entry or this is because of the data heterogeneity or this is just a uh, like what is the exact reason we need to identify and if it is just a matter of um, uh, error manual error human error then we can either remove it or correct it but if it is the matter of heterogeneity if we want to identify the heterogeneity within, within the population we might not remove this particular uh, um uh, outlier okay so here we see that okay in wind speed there are again many outliers so here what i have done is that considering that these outliers might be the result of manual intervention so i remove the outliers by by dropping these uh these points which are either above or lower these bars then after doing that i want to create another graph like for wind speed i created again then the outliers are not there because i have removed those rows okay so here in the output also the, i was uh, getting a lot of uh, outliers but i didn't uh, remove these because because from output we should not remove this this is a good practice because we do not want to hamper the output that is uh, capturing the data variation okay so i didn't remove that but it is on the expert's call but if if the expert feels that in this kind of kind of project these these outputs should also not have any outliers so these outliers can also be removed in the similar fashion okay then we have the correlation analysis in the correlation analysis what we are doing is that we are identifying the correlation values within the different um classes Uh, not classes the the features like for holiday and working day this is the correlation for holiday and temperature this this we do on a regular basis i if we do statistics we do on a regular basis we identify the correlations within the different columns that we have and then we can also get a graph of course the heat map then we sometimes what happens is we want to remove the correlation features out of these things because when the correlation features are there in the database they just increase the dimensionality and they do not add value to the model performance that is why most in most of the uh, uh, most of the time what happens is we want to remove the um uh, correlation the correlated values the highly correlated values we want to remove that and we identify this by by some very uh, like two lines of code that what kind of features they have more correlation so here i um, added 0.8 so i want to identify the correlation uh, the features who have the correlation more than 0.8 that is 80% correlations so i found out five uh, features that are highly correlated and i understand like okay this uh, absolute temperature and temperature might be very much correlating that is why it uh, remove it it said that absolute temperature is highly correlating because it is coming later than temperature that is why it is telling a temp okay so this is how the uh, like we need to analyze the data first before actually going into the modeling okay then um so here i didn't uh, drop any correlated values because i felt not to okay then but it's an expert call of course every time it's an expert call that 
whether or not we should remove these correlated features or we should keep these correlated features to capture any point that might be captured in the data. But this, this fields, we need to also understand that why are we keeping these correlation features or why are we keeping these outlier values into our um, uh, uh, model or in our data to to understand that better okay then we have the uh, uh, the step of modeling so in modeling as i told that pi caret would be the easiest option for uh, for getting the initial level of results so first of all we need to install the pi caret uh, then after installing what we can do is we can just write these uh, three lines of codes these three line of codes when we write then all the uh, like all the models that are uh, that might be uh, um, useful in this particular data type would be um, would be uh, run in the backend and it would be very helpful for the new data scientists to understand what kind of data uh, models uh, what kind of models are actually uh, running on the given data so when you write these three line of codes and you want to compare the models, so this kind of uh, graph you get where you are, where the backend, it actually compares all the data models that is light gradient boosting machine, extra trees regressor, random forest regressor, decision tree, gradient boosting. A lot of uh, models are compared with each other and with the multiple uh, um, evaluation matrices so i told that uh, in in evaluation matrix of uh, regressor model, uh, models we use mae mse rmse root mean square error mean absolute error mean square error so all these kind of uh, matrices are being used for regressor type uh, algorithms and we also see that in this particular uh, data type we are getting a lot of regressor kind of models okay so that this kind of uh, this kind of approach actually helps us understand the overview, the bird's eye view of uh, what exactly is the uh, what is what exactly is happening, and we don't have to do anything actually. It all happens in the back end, but still, this is a initial level uh, uh, modeling, and we just need it. It could just help us to analyze it from very far. Okay, then. Now, after seeing all this, I could understand that, okay, light gradient boosting machine is getting me about 95% of accuracy. Extra trees is giving me 9.47 of accuracy. The random forest is giving us 94% of accuracy. So by knowing what exactly this models do, we could understand which kind of regressor we want to pursue with. So after seeing like top four kind, top four, then I understood that, okay, all these four are performing equally better. They are about 90% of accuracy they are giving us. So by knowing what kind of model works on which kind of approach, we could select this uh, uh, model. For example, here I, uh, I thought that I'll take random forest regressor. So what I did was that I individually fitted the model. And first of all, as I told that I will be defining the train test uh, uh, in the data. So first of all, I'll tell key, okay, this is the train data and this is the test data. And in the test data, we have these many columns that we want to um, identify as the input, uh, like input features. And this output feature would be the uh, feature that you have to, um, give the accuracy on so we need to identify uh, for the model this input features training uh, data set and the output data set the the output feature if we have training and testing in the same sheet then we'll have to define the uh, the ratio of split the test train split or like train test validation split so that we have to do if we have the uh, the whole data in the same uh, same sheet because here I had different uh, uh, sheets like train for training I had different sheet for testing I had different sheet so I took this as a uh, uh, I defined 
different sheets for different things for for training and testing then for modeling i need to install a package called scikit learn and from scikit learn i need to import sklearn okay then for model building i tried with linear regression <coughs> linear regression and in linear regression i fitted the uh, two mod uh, to like x train and y train i fitted it with training data okay and then i evaluated by calculating the score of the training and uh, testing data uh, training and testing data so here you see that the training accuracy is 39.5 and uh, the testing accuracy is 39.86 so what exactly is happening is it is neither underfitted neither overfitted so if it was overfitted then the training accuracy would have been very less compared to the testing accuracy and this is a good thing whether whether or not we are achieving high accuracy we should aim for the good model like it should not overfit or underfit for example if we have training accuracy of 90% and testing accuracy of 50% in one model and in second model if we have the training accuracy of like 85% and testing accuracy of 80% then we would we should probably go with the second model because it is it is a good model it is a good fit and it is not being overfitted so it will perform uh, like reasonably good on the real time data compared to the model which is showing us the 95% of training accuracy and 39 or 59% of testing accuracy okay so this uh, means that we are not overfitting uh, the model so model is not overfitting neither it is underfitting okay but but the accuracy is really really less so after uh, linear regression i move forward for a different kind of regressor that is ridge regressor then that was also not giving me the correct uh, good accuracy so i went on with decision tree regressor as per the pie caret sorry so as per the pie caret i went with the decision tree regressor first and by decision tree regressor i got about 89.8% uh, of accuracy when i uh, got the score for x test and y test so okay so here i got this accuracy so then i went on with support pattern regressor just to see whether different kinds of regressor are working equally well or not but also for for uh, support vector regressor it was showing minus 1 accuracy so it was also not good then i went to the random forest regressor and it was showing about 95% of accuracy so when i found out that okay this particular regressor is giving me the best accuracy as was also confirmed by the pie caret so i could also go with the light gradient uh, it, it's not a problem i could also go with the uh, light gradient and see that whether it is performing better than random forest or not okay then the step was to hyper tune the random forest regressor so i tried with grid search cv so in grid search cv what is happening is so i am giving the grid of uh, these features like so i want to give the grid where n estimators the n estimators mean the number of uh, um, estimators uh, i um, okay then there are maximum features then there are min max min sample split and there is bootstrap so all these these grid is actually to uh, capture the best model uh, within the uh, within the space that is that our data is lying in okay then after this uh, grid defining we can uh, actually fit the grid within our database okay and after this fit it will give us the best score and the best parameters so it will give us the best best parameters for us to use to get the best uh, fit in the model so i also tried with random search cv of course but it's the same thing we just need the different lines of code but it's the same thing then i used these uh, different uh, uh, parameters so this parameters that i got from the grid i used this uh, from just one second okay and then i got the score of the 
uh, model that is random forest and of course the accuracy was similar but uh, still just to demonstrate that we can do the hyperparameter tuning in this way i tried to get the best parameters from the two different kinds of uh, grid search uh, two different types of hyper tuning that is randomized search cv and grid search cv then after that our uh, main task that has remained is that is to deploy deploy the model that could be via streamlit via django or via flask so for streamlit we will again uh, download the streamlit and then we we'll, uh, this has different steps that we will have to create the model uh, the the model needs to be uh, uh like imported exported in the pickle file uh like now it is uh like ipynb file dot ipynb file like dot inb ipynb file but when we want to uh, deploy it via streamlet we want to convert it into pickle file pkl dot pkl file and then we want to use that model into streamlet and uh, by streamlet what we'll uh, see is that we will have to define the features into that like what kind of features do we want to see on the app just like uh, 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 dr anil were just showing us so we we will define what kind of features we want in the in the application and we will tell with what kind of uh, options are available for use in that particular uh, uh, table for example we want to get the input from the user in the form of yes or no or we want to get the input in the form of uh, numbers like if we want to get the height or we want to get the weight or we want to understand whether they have taken the medications or not so whether he will give us the uh, input of yes or no so that that kind of uh, things we will define in the code and then we will be uh directed towards a web page that will show exactly the similar things that was shown in the application that was shown by dr nil just uh, uh just now so this is uh this is all from my end i guess so any questions if if anybody have then they can ask thank you ma'am wonderful talk on then sharing your views on various tools and softwares to develop ai and ml models now participants can ask questions i hope i was clear that i was what what whatever i was telling yeah actually uh, we also thought that your talk should be on the first like first half uh, move before noon so that uh, Yeah, more and and you need more time for uh, for of course uh, yeah to show the modeling and all of course so no more questions so now i would like to invite dr amit agrawal he is assistant professor at department of telemedicine uh, for uh, welcome to ceremony and a word of thanks over to you sir so uh, 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 so thank you uh, uh, dr vivek for invite me for the word of thanks so on the behalf of department of telemedicine i extend a very hearty word of thanks to firstly for to the professor kk talwar and the professor yk chamla for blessing us with their presence we would like to express our deep sense of gratitude to the major journal dr rashmi datta for her views about artificial intelligence and machine learning we are extremely thankful to professor amandeep singh gill for taking out time from his busy schedule and uh, enlightening us for his views we wish to extend our heartfelt thanks to all the speakers and uh, for their vision and prospects about the current and future scenario of ai and ml finally we thank all the organizing team professor minu singh madam head of the department professor nusra safiq madam and dr biman sekha professor biman sekha sir for uh, conduction of a successful workshop 
last but not the least thanks to all the participants who continue to join from uh, full day for this workshop so thanks to all of you and uh, we will plan to uh, organize a seven day workshop on hands on workshops on ai and ml in near future and uh, so uh, till then we will meet uh, we hope that we will organize that uh, workshop very soon and uh, we will let you know about uh, uh, the timings and all so thanks to all of you for uh, for being here thank you so those who have not filled the form so link is available and questions are there so please fill the form it's in chat box